Welcome, everybody. Episode 101 of Heavy Metallurgy. Hope you're all having a great week and a good Friday, and we are glad you decided to spend it with us. Alan, good to see you, friend. Uh, how are you feeling? I know not well. So it's a loaded question, literally. <laughs> yeah. If, if the sick are blessed, I am doubly blessed this week. Uh, <laughs> I, I am none more blessed than me heading into Easter weekend. Uh, I've had hay fever all week, so uh, good to see you. Folks, filling up the chat. I will not be talking at night. My voice is still kind of shot. It's just hay fever, but it's been uh, kicking my butt for a few days now. But uh, other than that, okay. And uh, yeah, this is not only episode 101. This is also technically our second anniversary show. We did our oh, shit. First, uh, actual stream two years ago now. So wow. uh, we've been doing Yep, We've only missed three weeks in two years. Pretty good record, I'd say. It's pretty good. Plus all yep. the extracurricular shows we put throughout the week. We've been we've been busy little beavers here. Uh absolutely. Um yeah, we were gonna do something special and just poor planning, I guess. But we'll do something. We're gonna do a giveaway here coming up soon. So Yeah. We we thought about you know doing a greatest hits clips show, but uh you know, we really couldn't get the intern to go back through a hundred episodes worth of things and splice together rambles about green bean casserole and all of that. So yeah, and it, it didn't come to pass. And, yeah. If anybody wants to volunteer to do that, contact uh, Marty or myself and uh, you know, <laughs> we'll pay you in ramen noodles or something. Right on. Um, tonight we're talking about a very important band and we have a, a returning awesome guest, friend of mine, friend of ours, friend of the show, awesome guy all the way around. We have author, musician, writer, filmmaker, extraordinaire, S. Craig Zoller. Welcome back, my friend. Yay. Hey, back. Uh, it's, it's good to be here. Congrats on the on the uh, two-year anniversary. That's great. Um, uh, Thanks. I've, I've, watched a, I've watched a ton of the episodes, and... Uh, and enjoyed uh you know coming on and and uh and uh, participating on a couple of them well we're gonna have you a bunch more i i think i think the blue oyster cult stream broke me and alan just a little bit there was a little bit of a breakage we <laughs> could, we could, if you want to go back into more detail we could <laughs> we could we could we could do that we could <laughs> <into> the... <laughs> oh yeah. yeah but well, um if we ever get around to it to a thin lizzie one or a scorpions one yeah, you might, we might want to make it a two-parter. Yeah, those are super long discographies, yeah. and and there will be singing. Yes, <laughs> break it, stop. Um, so bef since last time, you've had a lot of stuff going on. What has been? I know you've got some publications coming along. What is what's happening in the world of Zala right now? So I uh, I'm shopping around a fantasy book I wrote, which if you're into like Clark Ashton Smith. Lord Dunsany stuff. It's it's definitely like archaic uh, fantasy. So I'm looking for a publisher for that. Uh, I uh, I'll just do a couple of quick plugs of things that are out. Uh, there is my uh, newest graphic novel that I wrote and drew, uh, Organisms from an Ancient Cosmos, uh, science fiction tale, and uh, that was a very fun read. I <laughs> still haven't read mine. I it's up in a pile of books right now. I, I got to get to it. Um, and then uh, the first graphic novel, Forbidden Surgeries of the Hideous Doctor Devinus. That was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the most recent of my books, The Slanted Gutter, and uh, and then I have uh, I I did a I a let's say a Power Electronics album that has a fair amount of music concrete and uh, harsh noise with Jeff Harriet. The name of our uh, of our project is Mind Scrubber and Chondritic Sound. Uh, is putting out the CD. So uh, the link isn't up yet. The, the artwork's not finalized. But if you check Chondritic Sound and you're into that sort of stuff, I mean, they put out two of my all-time favorite um, noise releases with uh, Shredded Nerve and uh, the Act of Betrayal and, and uh, Crawl of Time. Uh, what is this? Operation Black Widow too. So they put out a ton of stuff. Gray Holger, who... Um, uh, runs a label, has his own good projects, uh, uh, Black Sand uh, Desert, uh, and uh, and Hive Mind as well. So lots of cool stuff there, old and new uh, noise. So if you're into power electronics and, and that sort of stuff, I'd say just go to Chondritic Sound, and and my guess in the next uh, couple months there'll be a place where you can uh, where you can post it. 
Uh, thanks, Ben. Glad you uh, glad you enjoy the stuff. So I've got that going on. I am piecing together uh, the next movie. You never know which one is going to go. I mean, I was going around with Bone Tomahawk with some of the cast that wound up being in the movie and some other people who wound up not being in the movie uh, for a couple of years. So I've got one uh, that's that's on its way in terms of cast uh, and potential financing and a couple others that are further away. So nothing concrete to announce there. Um, but uh, that's going on. And I, I guess speaking of concrete, Dragged Across Concrete is suddenly on Netflix. I can't explain how that happened. It was um, number one for a while, too. So congratulations for that. Uh, thank, thanks. So a, a bunch of people who uh, who'd not heard of the movie or seen any of my work uh, have now seen it. So that's cool. And that's certainly helpful in, insofar as uh, showing potential financiers and uh uh, and performers and stuff like that, that like, oh, you know, my, my, there is an audience. And certainly I've never been, uh, I've never chased the biggest <laughs> audience, uh, but I am, you know, delivering what I want and, and hope to find an audience uh, that, that likes what I want to do. I mean, obviously we're, we're all listening to death metal. So that's, that cuts out the majority of people on this planet in terms of, uh, you know, like appeal. So, uh, like I'd say, that like applies a little bit to my movies. Like I'm not going for everybody, but I think I am delivering for those who uh, for those who are looking for a different sort of thing. Uh, Celtic Frosty, thank you. Uh, glad you enjoyed it. And uh, Storm Rider, we we've been we've mentioned the last couple times having Zoller do a question a Q and A, and maybe tonight, if this doesn't go for 12 hours, we'll. I, I think I think we should we. I'm up for doing that. Absolutely. I think when we're doing a discography and when Alan is under the weather, that's probably not the time to keep him. But in case, I mean, if Alan is just like, you know, I, I talk at length and, and try and do some terrible singing and sing some riffs and you, and you talk for not quite as long. And then Alan just does thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll, maybe we'll get there. <laughs> I think it's probably not going to be this evening, but I'm, I'm happy to do it at, at some point uh, for sure. Right on. And I, I did want to ask about the dragged across concrete thing. Is it this whole digital streaming thing is kind of like a new phenomenon. Well, it's not new at this point anymore, but I mean, you know, dragged across concrete, how many years old is that now? And all of a sudden it's getting a resurgence of um, right. interest and popularity. And does that indeed have some, does that help in the future? I mean, see what it did. Yes. It's kind yeah, of the, the studios do look at that. Yep. I, um, uh, yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I've been, I've been taking, I've taken a number of meetings since that has happened and, uh, and people have reached out cause they, they, they saw what happened. So that is helpful that way in terms of, um, financial stuff. I, I, I actually don't even know. This is some, there's a writer strike on the horizon that has something to do with streaming services, not really dealing with residuals, royalties kind of things, the same way like networks, uh, like basic cable and TV networks once did. So mm. in that way, I, I can't speak to it. I just don't know. And that and that actually might be changing in the next uh, in the next half year or so in, in, in terms of the strike. But it is definitely helpful for me uh, taking stuff out. And then there's just the additional thing like it's just nice for the stuff to get out there. Um, yeah. And uh, like it's it is it's just satisfying for the work to get out there and people to see it and see new articles and people who didn't know and then they start uh, they start digging into the other work. Um, I saw someone asking about a morbid angel catchphrase. I got many of those. <laughs> and the turmoil comes is definitely uh, that's that, that that's it. And the turmoil comes. That's definitely up there. <laughs> Right on. Well, congratulations on all that. That's awesome. And, you know, anybody that uh, willingly wants to enter into the realm of making movies is clearly sadistic and uh, <laughs> loves, <laughs> loves the turmoil and torment that goes into it. And cheers, cheers for that. I mean, to see something that massive with so many working parts and financial constraints and problems see through to the end is, you know, it's easy for us to sit here and say, oh, that was a great movie, or oh, that movie sucked, but they just don't know what goes behind the making of it. It's it's pretty painful. It's so painful. To Storm, to Storm Rider's question, Marty and I and Kellen are going to go uh, in-depth on the new the new Megaton sword. I absolutely like it. Tuesday, uh, the 25th of this yes. month. Yeah, so we're going to go we're going to go break that down in in, in detail. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, 
if if the album came out last year, it, it would have been it probably would have been my album of the year. Um, I, I yeah, I, I think I think they're the best traditional metal act uh, working. Awesome. Yeah, it's going to be a good time and um, lots to talk about about that record for sure. But um, we are here to talk about a little band from Florida. And I'm going to just throw a little bit of quick history out here. Thanks to our friends at Wikipedia. So take this with a grain of salt because it is editable. Uh, Morbid Angel was formed in 1983 in Tampa, Florida by guitarist Trey Azagthoth and drummer vocalist Mike Browning, who later went on to be a nocturnist, as we all know. Uh, the early stages of the career. Oops, I don't want to read that one. Sorry. Um, 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 um. Shit. Where was the thing I was going to read? Anyway, I'll just read this. Um, they were known in Florida for their grotesque. Uh, stage performance trey would always bite himself and bleed so that was it gained them a lot of notoriety in the scene uh they became highly influential in the formation of the florida death metal scene inspiring other highly influential acts as obituary uh they recorded their debut album abominations of desolation in 1986 uh but the band was unsatisfied with the final product and it remained unreleased until 1991 printing 10,000 copies in 1986, David Vinson joins the band, replacing Michael Manson and Sterling Von Scarborough as vocalist and bassist, respectively. Fellow Terrorizer member drummer Pete Sandoval soon followed. The band made their debut 87 in 1987 on New Renaissance Records, which I did not know. I don't know if that's right. It could be right. But um, I guess Mike Browning left the band because there was a altercation with Trey about something. And he left the band, but you know, they got a much better vocalist out of the deal than Mike Browning. But that's just my opinion. But um, that leads us to <laughs> what's that, that? That opinion is correct. That opinion is very correct. Um, that leads us to Craig. Let's start with you. Uh, first experience with Morbid Angel. So my first experience with them was uh, Blessed Are the Sick, and I at that point I was already a, a Carcass fan. And I tried some other death metal and hadn't really gotten into it. And I'd read some um, uh, kind of detailed breakdown of that album in particular. It might have been on that anus.com, which I wish the name was different, but there was some really interesting writing on that on that website. And it was talking about some of the harmonies and some of the stuff that that Trey and I think it's Attic Tote. And I think okay. it's I think that's how it's pronounced. But, um, you know, don't quote me on it. Probably we should ask H.P. Lovecraft. And uh, so that was that was the first album. And then I sort of went in sort of a back and forth manner, uh, getting getting the rest of the catalog. And that it is the second death metal band that I really got into because I tried some other stuff. And, and Carcass was the first. They were the uh, that was the gateway band for me into death metal. Uh, and then and then Morbid Angel was the band that that sh I mean, obviously, they're doing something very different. Uh, but they showed me like, oh, it's going to be more than just Carcass. It wasn't like Carcass wasn't going to be the lone death metal band I had interest in. All right. Uh, since Alan's talking a little less today, I'll, I'll go next. Uh, for me, I don't remember what year it was. It was either 89 or 90. I saw Morbid Angel at the, I've said, I talked about this before on this channel. Um, the first ever Michigan Death Fest. I was there to see Sacrifice. And I have heard of no other bands on this roster. There was uh, Fatal, Deceased, Nuclear Death, Sacrifice, uh, Baphomet, and uh, Morbid Angel were the headliner. And I was there to see Sacrifice, and it blew my, I was a thrash kid. I was just hearing about death metal and all this other stuff and actually wandering to my first show and seeing it live. It was a, a, an eye-opening experience, to say the least. And... Morbid Angel blew me away. I just couldn't believe how fast, uh, calculated, and perfect they were live. And they had the world's biggest smoke machine, which completely filled this uh, hockey arena. But um, <laughs> after that, I came home. I bought a few demos of shit at the show. I came home and was just rapidly trying to find anything remotely. Uh, Morbid Angel, which was Altars of Madness at the time, that, was, that had just come out and carcass of course and you know napalm and it was just that was the catalyst that pushed me into the the more extreme side and um 
I got to tell you, Sacrifice, as much as I like them, they really got their ass handed to them at that show. They were out of place. They were very out of place in a in a lineup of much heavier bands. But, Alan, how about you? Uh, really similar to Craig's experience. Carcass and <clears throat> Morbid Angel kind of showed up on my radar around the same time in high school. Yeah, Again, we were kind of out in the sticks, so we were always, you know, a year or two behind whatever was current. So Blessed Are the Sick was also the first one that started to circulate in my group of friends. Uh, we would have been the right age looking back for Altars of Madness when it came out, but it just never, you know, made it that far out into the countryside, I guess. Um, and yeah, the Blessed Are the Sick always struck me just, you know, off the bat as kind of an interesting album. You know, the other band that was starting to circulate around the same time was Cannibal Corpse. And so, you know, they, to me, they were very different. You know, Cannibal Corpse was obviously just kind of going for this shock value thing with the over-the-top art and lyrics and everything. And then over here, you had Morbid Angel doing this thing with kind of, you know, the, you know, classical painting on the cover and, you know, all these, you know, weird little, you know, instrumental, you know, parts worked into the music. Um, you know, one seemed to just, you know, be focusing on sheer brutality and the other was trying to do something you know, that was very quirky and different and interesting. So one of these bands got my attention a lot more than the other. And so it's like, this is, yeah, going to be, you know, sort of a different, and all these bands are not going to be the same. There's going to be some variation here. And I think I'm going to be more interested in that type than uh, the, the, the Cannibal Corpse camp so much. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, like them at first, you know, through the mid nineties, you know, especially by like, you know, late 93 into 94, where you're know, getting very tired of death metal, it completely saturated uh, the area I was living in at that time, having moved and just everybody was listening to the same kind of brutal death metal constantly. So, you know, kind of got out of death metal, uh, stopped paying attention for a while. When I started getting back interest again in the late 90s or early 2000s, it, Blessed Are the Sick was one of the first albums I went back to. So I was like, oh, yeah, I haven't heard this in forever. Let's pick up a copy. I didn't have a physical copy anymore. I was just like, oh, yeah, I kind of forgot how good this was. And so kind of went from there. But, yeah, always an interesting, you know, death metal band and, uh, you know, <clears throat> there's always been a reason they were, you know, considered one of the leaders on the scene. Not just that they were there first, but they, for a long time, were always kind of staying one step ahead of what a lot of other bands were trying to do. And I guess we should probably just start off by saying, um, I mean, I haven't spun Morbid Angel in a while. It's just one of those bands that I know is always on my shelf or, you know, just a click away on the phone. I've spent a lot of time with these albums over the years and you know, there's always new, 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 you're always consuming new stuff. And it's sometimes you forget to go back to visit some of the classics, but you know, in your head that it's there and you know how innovative it is. But after revisiting the catalog this week, I'm pleasantly reminded it a, how well 90% of this stuff holds up and be just exactly how innovative they were. I mean, you know, clinical speed, it's great, but they were very musical with it. And Trey's attention to um, detail when it comes to really obtuse guitar lines, it just, it, it really plays into the overall sound of Morbid Angel, which is often imitated, but never replicated authentically. I don't think, I mean, there's bands, oh, they kind of slung Morbid Angel a bit. There's never been a band that comes off sounding <laughs> as pure and authentic as, as Morbid Angel has for me anyway. Um, yeah, what do you guys think about, what do you guys think about the whole thing with Morbid Angel and their sound? Yeah, that, that's a good point, Marty. There's a million bands that cite them as an influence. Uh, may, maybe there's one or two bands that come close out there, but they've, you know, they're kind of like, you know, death and Chuck in a way. Everybody cites them, you know, wears the shirt and has the patch on the jacket. Nobody really comes that close to pulling off their sound, though. Not in my experience. Yeah. Greg, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I mean, in, 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 ter in terms of that, uh, it's it's a little bit like a, a like a merciful fate, uh, King Diamond sort of situation in that like they're landing a very specific thing and there are a lot of different elements. Like there are a couple songs in here I'm going to say, uh, like I'll point out and say like this one song led to Chrissy U. Like Chrissy U's entire catalog comes from them sort of exploiting this, and I like some Chrissy U stuff, so it's not a bag on them. But I could say like, well, this one simpler song became that. And then there are a couple of songs in here. I'm like, this is a progenitor for a bunch of funeral do. 
And so I think that they there's enough variety in their catalog uh, where I, there are individual songs where I can say, I think this begat a giant thing or an entire band or whatever. But in terms of uh, the different modes of attack that this band has and the different types of songs that they write and, uh, and, and, and Trey Attic Totes unique riffing style, uh, there isn't, there isn't another, there isn't another band there. I'll put an asterisk by that and say, obviously there's a point where Eric Rattan was really involved with this band and some of their songs would then go on to be sort of the foundation for hate eternal. So like, that's why I said, like it's, I, it, it isn't to me so cut and dried. Uh, I mean, morbid angel is, uh, one of my two favorite death metal bands of all time. And one of my favorite bands of all time. So it's something that I don't think is really matched with, with the other death metal band I'd rate at this level is Carcass, and similarly, there are a bunch of bands that like have replicated that sound a little bit more effectively. But how many have put out albums that are that are actually is 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 good as that? Like that that what what is it? Is it uh, is it Pathologist, the one the grinding opus of medical decomposition? That one out. There's like one Carcass bite album that I think is as good as a Carcass album, <laughs> and, that, and that, I think that's the one. It's I think it's Pathologist. But there, I know there's pathology. It's the Czech band that has grinding opus of medical decomposition, whatever that band is. In any case, with Morbid Angel, I think that there are bands that took elements of their of their sound or songs and then um, and and grew from that. But there's not another Morbid Angel. Yeah, and it, it you know the whole you know they helped spearhead the Florida scene, and you listen to the Florida scene compared to them. Yeah, there might be some similarities, but. Morbid Angel just has a lot more class and uh, weird. They're just, they come at it from a very strange perspective. The way they write the riffs, the way the riffs fit within um, the music and the time signatures. And um, of course, the solo work, obviously, Trey is very much, is stated, very influenced by Eddie Van Halen. And it makes sense. He's like, you know, uh eddie van halen put through a meat grinder it's just some of those solos sound like you know electrified water if that makes any sense it's right and they just they really shined a lot of, and i could see why they were one of the they were the first uh, i think covenant was the first uh, death metal album ever to be released on a major label they're the first and they, i think they're one of the highest selling uh death metal bands there are also but yeah. um Covenant's always like cited as the best selling death metal album of all time. Maybe that's changed and you know they measure those things with different metrics now, but you know. I, I did not know that. I would not have even known like I don't know what I mean, let's <clears throat> put quotation marks around death metal, but I don't know what in flame sells, like their best selling albums, but I know at some point they're playing giant places. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously Car Carcass is such a legacy band that that I think like the whole Arch Enemy thing probably like doubled their their all time sales. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I uh, yeah, like I, I I can't I can't speak to this. That's interesting to know. Like I'm it, I'm sure I'll learn some 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 statistics because that's the sort of stuff that I don't generally know. Um, before we jump into the catalog per se, we're just going to talk about this one real quick because we mentioned it. Recorded in 1986. Well, hold on, let me let me interrupt ahead. and back you up one. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I do not even have that. So. Um, this is this is the first thing they released. Uh, as far as I know, there might be some other demo. So this is Thy Kingdom Come. This is the the cassette. Uh, the lineup here. That is their fourth demo, actually. They've got Bleed for the Devil in '86, Total Hideous Death in '86, Scream Forth Blasphemies in '87, and then Thy Kingdom Come. Were those circulated? Because I've never actually seen. Any I don't know. Wild. Probably but, not. So this is, it's Trey Etzictote on lead guitar, uh, Richard Burnell, uh, David Vincent on bass and vocals. Um, so uh, so that, was after, that was after the Mike Browning blow up. I, I, I'm, it, it, you know, I, I suppose. And then Wayne Hartzell, who I don't know on drums. And uh, yeah, we're not going to go into great detail on these because we're, we're dealing with a lot of albums. And as, as people who've seen me talk about albums know, I'm probably going to talk in some detail on every song, um, but, I, but I will say of the early of the early releases of, of the two before Alters, I think this thing is really good. Partly because this drummer is so in the pocket and clobbering, and I like the sound of his kit. Like these these versions, I could argue are as good um, or better than the landed versions. 
The vocals are really creepy. Um, and I'll let Marty say what he's going to say about this. But for me, nothing here is actually is as good as the the landed version with maybe Hellspawn, but that's a song I don't even like. So it's like the slightly less good version of a song that I don't think should have been re-recorded. But um, of the non-studio, non-canon, whatever you want to say, like I think this is actually worth seeking out, partially because the drummer is so good at clobbering. And David Vincent is really creepy on this one. Like it's a really creepy, not thrash delivery. Like it's it's a different thing. So I'm, I'm I am a fan of this um, this thing. I, I spun it, um, you know, to, in, in kind of preparation of this, and it's as unremarkable as I thought. It's pretty much just I think weaker versions of every song that's on there. Yeah, and I, I just would add that the thing I listened to it last night after not listening to it in ages, and you know, it is. It's got Mike Browning from Nocturna singing on it. He played drums as well. One thing I the fact that it was recorded in 86 that kind of blows my mind because this is pretty heavy and extreme for thrash and that's kind of 86 what rules the roost is thrash metal and another interesting thing from this it was produced by david vincent he recorded this for them who also recorded terrorizers world downfall which i did not realize until on this show someone made that so he i mean i think world downfall sounds great so i mean obviously vincent has got a good ear for production and um but yeah like like zoller said it's just you know a handful of songs that end up making it to the first album and then um um yeah and a couple others here and there it's okay it's interesting it's it's cool from an archival standpoint and for completists but i never listen to it i, I don't care honestly and for, what, for whatever reason assuming this is right for um uh, thy kingdom come the copyright here is 87 so that's why I was a little puzzled why it was Vincent. Was it like Vincent and then they had Browning do the vocals and then it went back to Vincent? I'm I'm not sure. I don't know much of the personnel history. People feel free to chime in. I, I don't know that stuff about this band. Well, this was recorded according to the two things that I read, 86, produced by Vincent, but he wasn't in the band. He just produced it. Mike right. Browning was in the band, drums and yeah. vocals. Right, and Thy Kingdom Come, David Vincent was uh, was doing vocals. So yeah, that that must have came. That Thy Kingdom Come happened in eighty uh, seven. So it's the better. split the split must have happened after the fact. Right. Yeah. And and uh, I'm I'm, I'm going to get into a bunch of like kind of drum specific sort of all over their catalog, but that's that's a nice thing. Uh, that that drummer who I I don't even know who that guy is, but he's really clobbering in the pocket. Um, in, in a way sort of different than, than Sandoval. And, and I, I, I enjoy that. Like I, uh, uh, abominations, I would skip, but thy kingdom come, I think it's worth seeking out. Alan, did you have anything to say about abominations before? Yeah, kind of on the same page as y'all it's, you know, it's a nice historical artifact, but I'm with Craig. Most of the versions on here are not the best versions or not my personal favorite versions. You know, I will say I don't mind Mike Browning's vocals overall. He's a lot better than he went on to be. Yeah. He, he sounds, you know, fine here. Uh, You know, he is, and there's no detracting from that, but uh, overall, yeah, the songs, you know, it's not the tightest version of the tracks. So uh, it's okay. It also always bugs me on the CD versions. Yeah. It, they're, they're such piss poor quality you can't even read what the print is supposed to say here i mean i can sit here with a magnifying glass and not make out the words on that that's how what a crappy job uh the earache does with their cd reissues yeah that's not the last time that comment will be made <laughs> nope <laughs> no it is not all right well craig well, i think we're about to ready okay. to start into the real catalog so i have just one question for both yep. of you are you morbid <laughs> I'm a, I'm more hardcore radical, honestly. <laughs> oh man! Oh man! Don't With invoke that. the boiling shit jacuzzi. Just <laughs> <laughs> the shit hurts. The shit koozie. <laughs> <laughs> Too extreme, Craig. Too extreme. Okay. So we're, we're 1989, the year I graduated high school. This gift to mankind is born upon the world. So, um, yeah, and, and I'm going to rank these albums as, as we go. So we have Altars of Madness, uh, certainly for many people, the best death metal album of all time. I'm sure for many of our viewers and and, and many metalheads, uh, their, their finest moment. I will point out that Earache, so we'll get on the shitty reissues thing right away. They've done these reissues where um, 
They do the, um, the what is it, the dynamic range, the full dynamic range thing. And so what, like my thing that I've had since whatever, the 90s, um, now has the disc from the reissue because I don't want this thing with its shittied up art. And, you know, I want the original album art. And um, I, uh, Melanie, I... I like this art. There are a couple too many smiley faces for me in there. It's not, for me, by way of comparison, this album art is magnificent. Well, after um, you crush this, the holy priest, you smile. I mean, that's yeah, just the way it goes. Art, a couple of these look a little bit howdy doody for me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, so the full dynamic range. I, I, I'll say, like, I I bought all of the ones that are in existence. Um, for Carcass and, and Morbid Angel. The Morbid Angel ones, I'm not noticing a huge sonic difference. Like, they sound a little bit better. Symphonies of Sickness, man, that is a gigantic difference. That is the one of all these full dynamic range. Like, if you want to listen to it, partly because it's a longer album, like, it, it, it's, it's really good. Like, that one, you hear the upgrade in sound. So enough of that sort of stuff. Um, but that's, so I now have my old version with the new full dynamic range recording. So uh, Morbid Angel, start, start strong. I mean, I, I, um, uh, you have that tape reverse effect uh, intro, which is, which is really cool. Uh, and then that first of the, blah, blah, the, 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 like the first lick that they jump into, um, I think d defines a lot of what sort of early, the, what distinguished their sound. Because that riff, if the harmonies were normal, would be a cool thrash riff. Like, the, you know, like the way it's sliding around and with that hammer on, but that like that ugly that. Uh, and, I you know, I don't I'm not quite sure if it's just if it's Trey or if it's Trey and, and, and Richard Richard Brunel, they're doing different things. But there's an uneasiness with how that harmony sits that um, uh, like the that, like there's a there's there is it sits in sort of a sick place and like. Carcass has their own distinct sound that's somewhat like even when they're doing straight up melodic stuff, there's a queasiness to the melody. And I'd say the same thing with Morbid Angel, though with a different sound, uh, when they're doing those slides and the hammer ons and all that sort of stuff, there's an uneasiness that that happens. And then um, this song, I feel Immortal Rights is a really good song. I probably put this somewhere in their top 25. And uh, it feels like a little bit more complex, like a tech thrash song, but with like a little bit more in the way of like tremolo riffs that are that are sustained. And then the the thing that really gives it its character to me as um, death metal, uh, distinctly different from like oddly harmonized uh, tech thrash, is that bam, 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 ba -na -na, bam, bam, bam. And when you get that, and it lines up with the keyboards, there is a creepiness in that sound that to me oh, yeah. is one of the signature morbid angel sounds and unique to this band like there's not another death metal band that i knew at that like i, I know nocturnus at some point ha like had keyboards and stuff i never got into that band so i can't speak in any detail um uh, about their catalog but that bam 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 -na -na -na, like that whole thing is great and that's the and then it goes into this lurching and that lurching really slow thing that's another definitive element of their sound obviously not all their songs have that most of my favorite songs by this band are mid-tempo or slow rather than fast um or are a mix of 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 tempe and um uh so that thing i like i think that's great like this is like this cool kind of tech thrash um, the vocals are fine, but that little break in the color of, um, like, it, it, like that, the color of evil that comes in with that is terrific. So you start out with like the first song on their first album is top 25, maybe top 20 for them. Um, then you go to, and, and that I, I like, I, I believe I, I'm pretty sure that that's a Trey composition. Then you go to suffocation, which is, I think Trey and David Vincent and this is a little bit more like Cannibal Corpse in so far as you get a lot of different tempos um, and uh, the and, and like and, and it's a little bit more technical that like that that winding lick that's under the, the it's a dawn of the crucifier. And then it's like da, 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 and it's winding all over the place. Like this is a little bit some of the stuff that I think Cannibal Corpse does. And it's some of their sound of like 
we're going to change up the tempos a lot and and kind of get energy that way. Um, and uh, it's fine. Like I, I think I think that that song is 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 decent. I don't think it's special at all. Um, and then uh, you get visions from the dark side. I enjoy uh, a little bit better than the previous. And and actually, you get like at, at thir like thirty seconds in. There's like this tremolo melody that's like pretty overt. Like wouldn't be out of place on an Amon Marth album. So you're getting a lot of different colors, and they're showing all these different things that they can do. Which is one of the reasons why, like, if you're really copying the more dangerous, it's like copying Merciful Fate. There's so many different things happening in each song. You 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 really need to be adept at like five different like riffing styles and all these tempo changes and all these kinds of delivery. So um, I think that that song is pretty good, but not special. Uh, and then Maze of Torment happens, and that one is also really special. Like, that one to me is the first, uh, since the opener, that that's really special. And that that first that first lick, um, other than kind of the harmony of it, like, that could be a, on, a like, a Venom song. Um, like, with all the hammer-ons and stuff like that, like, that is in, like, a new wave of British heavy metal mode and the timing then, is too good for a venom song <laughs> what's up the timing yeah. is too good for a venom song yeah. for a venom song and then this song you get and and this is going to be an off and on complaint depending on the album and the song you get some actually like in sync blasting from sandoval and in that uh, i'm going to go all over like depending on what he's doing and then but that like kind of post that crazy grind up post chorus which um, it always sounds like that song, the the Arbach Mach Fleisch on uh, on Heartwork. To me, it always sounds like it's stealing that lick. Um, but uh, all of that stuff is 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 really good. And then like when I talk about like how much grew out of this band, like like I put it to you, sirs. Three minutes, ten seconds of this song was slam slamming death metal created when it goes into the bump. And it and it's a reprise of that of that first lick, really lurching, really slow. And I can't think of other like heavy metal or death metal instances where you're taking a lick and then slowing it down that dramatically for a breakdown. And like I hear, like that's what I hear, like in all these in all these slam bands. That is a lot more inventive of a riff. You're you're giving slam a lot of credit. <laughs> I mean, I, well, I mean, they're, they're, they're slam band, like abominable putridity. And I mean, the technicality of slam bands is great, but just that the feeling and the riff you're talking about I is mean, that riff is great. I'm not saying that slam bands are writing a bunch of riffs is good. The idea of taking an idea like that, and you have that, but then later, like, and, and just yeah. slowing it that, that much, like, I feel like that begat a genre. And that moment is great. Uh, so that song also in the top 25. Um, Lord of All Fevers and Plagues. I know that I've only had the CD of this, but maybe that's not on the record. Um, uh, that's fun. Like, it's an enjoyable when it gets it like that. That has like a little bit more the when it gets the ea, ea, sakata, whatever he's saying in there. Yeah, the chanting shit All in there. It's cool. Enjoyable. And then there's some kind of almost like gent like syncopation. Um, under the under the solos and stuff like that, so that's a cool tune. And then we get, um, uh, I think, the first of the the first of the the great songs by Morbid Angel with Chapel of Ghouls. This is, oh, such a good song! This song is this song is incredible. Uh, and uh, and even and 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 real locked in in terms of dum 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 bum, 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 like and all the catches that Sandoval is doing, and then the, you know the. Uh, my only chop on this song is the riff underneath Crush the Priest. The bum, bam, 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 like that little thing. It's a little bit happy for how for how great this song is. But uh the Vincent singing this like this is the this is like the first great David Vincent singing. Like I enjoy some of the stuff that he's doing, but like, you know, Maze of Torment, this is kind of he's just throwing Maze of Torment in the maze. Like it's okay. <laughs> but 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 this whole thing the Dead, your god is dead. Like that shit is great. <laughs> um, the blasting is really locked in on this song, and then I, I, so I was a catering chef for about eight, eight years or so. I remember I like I got I went out straight to a to a Morbid Angel show, like straight, like with all like my gear and like my knives and stuff, because I did catering. 
So we would go around. And I'm like in my chef regalia, and I saw it was Morbid Angel at the time. They had uh, Jared Anderson. Jared team. Anderson, rest in peace. Yep. Yeah, rest in peace, that guy. Uh, in turn, I, he was uh, in the band in Turnison. In, in, in Turnison, he in was Turnison, in there. Yeah. He was in Eternal as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, a super likable guy and, and and a talented person. So I went to the show, and then in Chapel of Ghouls, there you know, there's that that you know, there's that that break, the the bump 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 bump, and then it leads. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So the next day, I'm I'm at, I'm at work, and I'm like, oh my god, like I like I'm I'm left handed, so I'm like, why is my why am I so sore? Like trying to whatever I was doing, like cutting pineapple or stuff, and preparing for a buffet. I that that whole thing, the bump bump, but like I threw my arm out doing that so hard because that is that is a, that is one of the best moments in in death metal history. That transition, that you know those catches, and then into uh, the six eight. Uh, and I put it to you, sirs, and this is a, this is again in terms of their influence when those. Um, the ghoul choir comes in with that six eight. It, did that create like the whole second wave of, of black metal sound? Like, I, like I hear that, I'm like, is that where Emperor like got it? Like, in terms of that symphonic second wave black metal sound, does it just come from Chapel of Ghouls? Because there, I, Morbid, it, Morbid Angel is one of the few death metal bands that the the Norwegian scene still applauded, right? And Deicide. Deicide and Morbid Angel were the two. Yeah, I, and so like I hear that thing, that bump, 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 dun, 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 and then you hearing those, like, the choir keyboards, that shit is early Emperor. Like, that was their sound. So, I like, this is why I say, like, what band does more, like, the amount of innovation, just in this, like, first album, and it's, so it's in the, the uh, Brunel's guitar entrance, is two minutes, 47 seconds, incredible. Um, and then when you get like, and, and one of the things I love in, in really good death metal. So like, so I mentioned, obviously, Morbid Angel is one of my favorites. Um, Carcass, Necros Christos is, Bolt Thrower is. That's probably like the holy four for me. Like those are the four I, I rate above all. Of, uh, but something I really like is the, the sense of ritual, uh, which you really get in Necros Christos. Oh, yeah. But you get it in this when it goes into that four, it goes into the four, four. And then the, the demons attack with hate when it goes into that whole thing um you get the sense that you just went through a ritual and now all the creatures have been assembled to fucking storm the gates it's great like the 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 storytelling from uh from a musical standpoint is incredible uh and then uh, some of my favorite songs by this band don't end that well they just sort of stop or they repeat a part maybe one, one time too many or whatever the ending of this one with the Da, na, 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 na. like conclusive great ending so that's that's top 10 uh song song for me from the band uh uh then we leap into believe for the devil which which i wish was not on the album it's the only song i just don't like i think it's mediocre it's fast uh the vocals are like pellets like wait for the devil da, da, da. like it's just that throwing out thing the riffs aren't that interesting this is the i don't think it's bad but you've just come off like genre defining greatness and expansive, like in, incredible, incredible songwriting. And then believe for the devil, man, this is not, I don't think this is good. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's just an average song. Uh, Damnation is next. Um, and uh, you get some of that kind of like spitting out pellets vocals on this as well. There's some like fill the world with plague that there's no way anyone would be able to decipher that line if you didn't look at the lyrics. It's like, I mean, it's like Dave Mustaine, my ball bag smell from the heat. Like, you never <laughs> get my from the heat, from that. Like, it's just, it's just a, but like, cut out some of those words, man. Um, I enjoy that song. The blasting is locked in uh, pretty well. Uh, the, the chorus lick is a little bit up, down, up, down. It's a little seesaw, not great, but overall, I enjoy that song. Uh, and then we get to the other great song on this album, also top 10 in the history of the catalog of this band, Blasphemy. Um, the beginning of that song, the intro always puts me in the mood for popcorn. <laughs> Engine. It just, I, I suppose it's, I suppose it's gunfire. Are you, do you think it's supposed to be gunfire? gunfire. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 eventually I, I, I decided it was gunfire and not popcorn. <laughs> 
But um, I, yeah, whatever. Uh, the, um, I mean, this is, this is just, this is a ton of great stuff. Uh, they're moving around a lot of pieces, really, really ambitious. Um, and, uh, but there's the, there's, there's clearly the drop down breakdown moment where there's a riff that you could argue is the best moment in death metal history that, you know, like, duh, 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 duh. And that is, it's just evil in your face. Yeah. I guess you're spraying and you have no, like that, like that's, that's, a, that's a really good song um, in terms of their songs where they're jumping around with, with tempos a lot more. Um, and uh, all that, all that stuff is great to do with that wilt uh, singing part is, is really strong really really great um so uh, you know like uh, you know debut album two songs that i think are in the top 10 of the nine albums they've released uh and um and then the closer is really good uh evil spells i could do without and then evil spells like evil spells is a little that, that came off of abominations under a different name i think it was hellspawn maybe i don't remember no no hellspawn is a is a, is a mediocre tune well, they, they changed the name i think evil spells used to be something else anyway yeah and anyways but like that that um the, the you know they're doing that harmonic pinch thing which like again like if you're talking about like the groundbreaking this isn't like a carcass trick this wasn't a, a Chuck Schollinger trick. This was like a Morbid Angel thing. Like that, the harmonic pinches that have proliferated in the tens of millions, perhaps the quadrillions throughout the death metal world, like the way they're using the bong, rah, 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 evil spells, like that whole thing. Like I, I always associate that with coming from, from Morbid Angel. So like the amount of innovation and, and, the seed sown with this first album, I think, are, are pretty undeniable. And these, uh, the, the Symphonies of Sickness came out in '89 as well, so these bands were not in this. They're on the same label, but not in the same scene and working, you know, parallel to each other. And this is kind of how it was happening, I guess. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I like I um like listening to that that harmonic pinch, which is like you know the suffocations, and then all like that is such a staple. Um, I mean, sometimes it's the thing you do if you've written a mediocre riff, you'll just throw a couple of those in there and now it's death metal. Um, and this song is cool. I just, I wish there's something a little bit better than, uh, than evil spells. I, I this is like as a, as a phrase, it's just kind of, it's, it's a little bit happy for me. Um, the, uh, the outro riff is incredible. Like this is how you end it on like that like the sinister qualities there and this is why like um i mean you can go for different things in death metal obviously like i don't i like i like some death music but i like them far less than than most people who like all this stuff do and like that the sinister like i love this the quality really sinister like the end of this song like that's what all the great like necros christos stuff does like throughout their catalog it has that really kind of menacing sinister quality and again like you feel like a ritual has has happened so um really strong start uh that's my third favorite album by the band so i rate that as number three on the list all right well for me this album is huge and remains huge to this day this is my number one i'm not going to beat around the bush this is my number one morbid angel album I have a lot less problems with the tracks than Zoller does here and there. I think, you know, there might be some songs that are better than the others, but from start to finish, I really like the way they pace this record. There's a good mix of uh, feel and style going on here, but right off the bat, I think my favorite thing about this record is the production. Everything sounds real. The drums sound great. The way the drums sit and interact with the guitar sound the guitars are super sharp. There's this evil, sinister vibe to it. And again, you know, the little, like the chanting in Lord of All Fevers and Plague, you know, see, you know, eyes roll back in the head, someone being, you know, a medium being entered by a spirit saying these, this invocation. Uh, it's just, this is evil death metal to me. And where this got it right, a lot of bands coming up just didn't get it right. Um, I, I guess right now, modern times, a lot of people say blood incantation, you know, that band, I'm not going to, don't get me wrong here. They earned everything they get. They've been out, they've toured endlessly. They're doing it the right way. 
I hear a lot of Morbid Angel in their sound, but they just don't get it as right as Morbid Angel got it right. And but for me, this is the register. This is my favorite era of David Vincent. I, I really like it when he uh, in albums that follow this, he started to take his voice lower, more brutal, still very coherent. He's a very first off a very co- uh, charismatic front man. He's got a lot of power and um, yeah. style and uh, confidence in his vocals. And it really for being a uh, playing an instrument while you're singing and able to being able to separate the vocal uh cadence from the guitar riffs is huge and he does it he's just so effortless at it he and it's kind of funny i listened to the catalog this whole week on my jbl uh, bluetooth speaker because i've been working a lot and the 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 eq frequency response from that accentuates the bass tones i did not realize david vincent was that good of a bass player especially as we come up to some of the uh the albums after this he's got some killer bass lines he's singing over <laughs> i i just it's i mean you, you got a guitar player is uh innovative and vibrant as trey is i guess it rubs off i don't know what it is but he, he he's a very great bass player but this to me is morbid angel at their hungriest i think they got a lot more experimental after this i still love it i really love what they did after this too but this is them clinging to the old school they're emerging from the 80s um, 1989 this came out this is you know all their work leading up to this point it's savage it's very well written very memorable the riffs though trey got a lot more experimental and expansive in his playing the riffs here are just so extreme <laughs> too extreme um but never loses sight of writing memorable hooks and little interesting things and like craig, uh, craig was pointing out like the the synthesizer additions and just the weird slides and bends which you know he ended up doing more of as they went on it just gives this element an, an evil feel to it it just does it's an excellent well-written record and yeah i've got the og cd as well craig it's got lord of all fevers is a bonus track along with remixed versions of three other tracks but um yeah this is a great record. This is my number one. I love this record. And typically it's either this one or the first one. Well, it's changed a little bit over the years, but I love this record. It's great. Absolutely great. Snapshot in time. An awesome start. Awesome. Alan. Yeah. <clears throat> Both of y'all have described it very well. It's an album of songs that are great independently. They work well together there's enough variation among the songs that they all stand out they you know feel pretty unique from one another it's not the same song just cut and pasted or you know very samey uh the performances are all very good on it marty like what you pointed out about uh vincent you know sometimes you know you know pete and trey tend to get a lot of the attention in this band and understandably so but yeah vincent's an incredibly good vocalist in death metal and not only just, you know, having a good sound here and also when he gets lower on later albums, but she's also always decipherable. You know, if you're paying any attention, you can figure out what he's singing about. To some people, that's not a big deal. Personally, I like being able to, you know, uh, make out the words, at least most of them along the way. And with a lot of death metal bands, that's not something you can do. Um, but yeah, you know, he does, you know, a really great job here, too. Um, Craig, really like your description of Chapel of Ghouls. That's my favorite song on the album. Great song. Uh, yeah, just, you know, great song, great storytelling. It, all the little details in the song. Yeah, just, you know, all add into, you know, that story effect on it. Absolutely. It, yeah, I understand, you know, why for many people it's their favorite Morbid Angel album. In a way, like you say, Marty, they don't do another album exactly like this. They oh. move on right away by the next album and start doing some different things. But I do like a lot of what they do later, too. But there's really only, we said before, there's really only one Morbid Angel. And in Morbid Angel's discography, there's only one Altars of Madness. Uh, it's in a way, hey, I I'm going to beat you to the punch tonight, Marty. In a way, they're like Halloween. Because there's only one Walls of Jericho in the uh, <laughs> Halloween catalog before they moved on to something very different. Uh, Alters kind of feels like that, too. It's just like, you know, they could have done this one album and just, you know, disappeared and gone back to washing cars in Charlotte. And, you know, it would be a legendary release. Um, but uh, even though they didn't, 
the album still feels like, what if they had done a little bit more in this style? What if they had stayed here for at least one more release, you know, done one more batch of songs in this style? They kind of do. They kind of do. You get songs that could have been on this album because they do have some older tracks, you know, that they ended up for one reason or another, they got saved until later albums. So you do do have songs along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That do show up later that, and you can usually tell when you're listening to those albums, you'd be like, Oh, I bet that's an older song. And you check like, yeah, yeah, that one was written years earlier. But um, yeah, uh, you know, fantastic album, everything, you know, from the cover art on down. It, it just works. It's solid front to back, start to finish. And yes, Eric, what in God's name were you thinking? Messing with the cover art. <laughs> uh, we'll rant about that from time to time. Um, but yeah, to... Uh, Again, folks, I'm not going to ramble too not much tonight since my voice is still messed up. But for me, oh, let's see. Craig had this as third. Marty had it as first. I've got it as second. Um, and I could make a case for it being first. But for me, uh, second is where this one comes. It's an outstanding album start to finish. But there is one that I like a little bit more than this one. So All I right. believe that means we are ready to move on to album number two. So I'll pass it back to Craig. 1991's Blessed Are the Sick. Yeah. So as I said earlier, this was my first experience with the band. Uh, and um, uh, also over, over l- let's say, the last decade or so, my estimation of Alters has steadily gone up. And my estimation of this album has gone down. There is a, there is a point when I would have rated this um, near the top or, or, or possibly even the top. And um, so I, I guess the, the kind of the global thing that bugs me is this album feels like it was played to a click track. Now, all these albums, there is a click track, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But the first album feels like that was a band that had rehearsed and yeah. they're, they're playing uh, in that, in, you know, in that cassette I showed that I, you know, the, the Thy Kingdom Come or whatever, like feels locked in. And, um, and this album feels uh a little bit like there's the the click and trey is playing more specifically and more locked into that click than the drummer so the the i you know to, to be more specific so fall from grace so there's the intro where you get the distance yeah whatever it's not not worth getting into fall from grace um the accents just always feel off on that and the blast beat and i've done this as a drummer so I'm, I'm sure, so like, no need to point out that Pete Sandoval is a far better drummer than I am. He is. Um, that doesn't mean that when he plays a blast beat and it lags behind the beat. That I, remember, I remember you in the living room trying to keep up with the speed on something in oh, basically yeah. your underwear with your mouth dro- drooling because you're just oh, trying yeah. to relax to get through a blast beat. <laughs> sure. And I, I, like... My, I, like what, I, what I'll say, what I'll say in, in uh, not so much defense of, 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 my, of my struggling for those uh, for those blast beats uh, is, uh, but we were playing together and there was no click track. No, it has a click track, so someone is playing it perfectly. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I assume it has a click track. I suppose I could be wrong. I was not in the studio, but it just seems like Trey is much more in time than Pete. So you get that whole like the. The ba 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 na 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 snare snare ba ba and that, and those accents already seem sort of off. They seem rushed. It seems like he fills he finishes the fill too quick, and then it goes into that ba ma 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 na 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 na, and then the blasts come in, and it to me is if he's just playing as fast as he can, but he's not even listening to the music. Um, so this is a problem I have with this song, and actually with this album in general, is the blast beats. Um, really lag a lot of times. So in this song, like like that, so it gets into the, it gets into that, um, uh, it gets into that, and you get the blasting going underneath that. And then when it, it has that little harmonic kind of run and, and Pete Sandoval plays the polka, then he's locked in. The song all of a sudden has a ton of momentum. But to me, every time it goes to that blast beat part, it just seems like it is losing it's momentum. The blasts aren't locked in with the music at all. And um, Fall From Grace has a ton of great riffs. Um, and I and I think that's sort of like the quality of that song is like here is um, like here are a bunch of like good ideas. But like I, I feel when Sandoval does these fills, 
that are like locking into the runs that Trey is doing. They're not quite locked in or he's finishing too early or the blast beats lag. So this is what I say. Like some of this is also like, um, again, Pete Sandoval, much better drummer than I am, but I became a better drummer when I started playing with a click track. And the first time I played with a click track, it was a struggle. I'm like, man, this beat is moving all over the place. <laughs> no, you're moving all over the place. <laughs> I am screwing up. The yeah. click is not screwing up. And I feel like you listen to Fall From Grace. Like, I just wish there was some version where they recorded it live. Like, I, I've yeah. gone on record and would say it. Like, if they would remove the drum tracks from this and bring in, like, uh, Hellhammer or Derek Roddy or someone like that, I would pay, like, for several of these albums, I'd pay, like, a few hundred dollars for the re-recorded drum version of it. Um, uh, there are a lot of really good riffs. You get like this. They're, they're, this song is really like jumping all over the place. Like maybe the closest to something like what Carcass was doing in terms of the Necroticism songs of like tons of riffs and they're all good and they all fit together. I don't think it's as, as good as like a really good Carcass song from that period. Craig, um, I don't mean to interrupt you, but Mike's got a, Michael's got a really good. Pete would sometimes struggle a bit with the slower beats. And, and I got to say, I can see that because he he nailed the speed technique and that was what he excelled at pete the feet commando you know he was known as the blast guy i can see because pl playing slower it's a different feel a different mindset you have to pay more attention it's playing faster is it's easier to process where your changes are where the slow is like more concentration i, I think i thought that was a kind of a, a cool a cool uh, point to bring up you know, talking about about pointing out and the one thing i'll point out on top of that i agree I mean, that like the I feel like the first fill in the in the album that he does in that song is missed. But then, I but I think they 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 should have either slowed down some of those blastings, the, the tempo of the song, or some of those things, or he should have just gone to triplets instead of like trying to get the quarter notes. So r regardless, I, I will because Sandoval's also did some great drumming, and I think in terms of the slow stuff, I agree. Except when he's playing in six eight. That dude feels that groove, and there's yeah. incredible drumming when he's playing in like in, in the six eight grooves. It's a so, it's a comfort zone for him, then you know. Yeah, like I feel I feel like some like I feel all the fast stuff except for the blast beats and the six eight. He sounds really good. The 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 blasting lags in some of it, and then the super slow, like even some of these intro or interlude songs where he's doing like military things. I'm like, man, I feel like it's all off, but he might just, some of that stuff, he, I'll admit, he might just hear it differently than me. I'm just going to go off briefly and say that there are drummers who are great and, and, and certainly have their technique down. And I'm just going to hear it differently. Uh, a brief aside, there's one of my favorite jazz leaders of contemporary music is a guy named Vijay Iyer. He plays with the, he has a trio and he had this guy, Marcus Gilmore, who played drums with him. This guy, I, I like. I feel the entire time, and whenever I listen to him, the snare is always just like I don't know what it is, like a sixteenth note late, but he's consistently doing it there. So he's just hearing it differently. And some some of my criticisms here, I feel, are I'm hearing it differently. But it, no album is more impacted by this than "Blessed Are the Sick," and no song more than "Fall from Grace." So let me move on. Um, we get to brainstorm. The blast beat in this lags forty two seconds. It's just. It just starts going behind. And here you're getting a little bit. Um, that song is um, that song is 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 decent. Um, I feel it's a bunch of good riffs where the song is less uh, where, where the, the parts are better than the sum there. This is the album where I feel like they really ratcheted up the ambition. Um, like the ambition is a little bit closer to like symphonies of sickness in terms of how many different things they're doing. But I but I don't feel they're succeeding as well. And this is why I say like initially I was more impressed and then I but I don't think I don't think that song holds together very well. Brainstorm uh, Rebel Lands um, is solid. I enjoy that one. Um, it flows better than the previous two cuts. Uh, the the solo entrance at two minutes, five seconds, the Egyptian solo entrance is great. I'm not sure who that is. And then there's some really cool sync of patience of thrum, 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 where he's just doing all that stuff on the toms. That stuff is really enjoyable. Um, uh, Doomsday Celebration. Um, this, this is, you know, this is an inter interlude. It's fine. Um, uh, Day of Suffering. Uh, pretty good tune. Um, the, 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 um, in the early verses of this, I feel Pete Sandoval's blasting is locked in. And then in the last one, I feel he's getting tired. Um, it's pretty short. It's not significant. Um, the first song on this album that I can like completely stand behind is the title cut. 
uh, Blessed Are the Sick. We're dealing with more of the mid pace stuff, which again, mid pace and slow. Those are those are my two favorite. Those are my two favorite tempos from Morbid Angel. That and, that that the title track is a really a really good interesting song. It's yeah, cool... and, and you're getting a little bit more like this is kind of this like Morbid Angel specific lurch chord, um, and it's get like this. You're getting this like this de dissonant creeping uh, idea over rolling double bass, and again like who, I'm not sure who was doing that. Um, the idea of like you're getting like that kind of dissonant push, the rolling double bass, so you have the energy of it in an up, up tempo, but it's definitely down tempo. So that is also kind of a core conceit of the whole genre of death metal that I think of as rooted with them more than like carcass or certainly not death. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the chorus is good. The way oh, are sick. Like all that stuff is cool. Yeah, the, the way he's singing, that stretching out those... Yeah. lines over that that slow so crawling it's so fucking cool it's probably david vincent i don't really i i'll admit i like i like in the context of this band i'm not listening for bass lines very often but i think that the way do, do, like there's some moving around in there that i think is david vincent like making it more harmonically expansive i think that that is really really good um and then the outro i'm going to assume i don't know if your assumption is the same so this is Blessed Are the Six slash Leading the Rats. That Leading the Rats is the keyboard the thing. That happens it's the flute, the isn't it? Isn't the Leading the yeah. Rats the flute thing? Yeah, yeah. I, I assume that that's that because this does have like an outro hat, that, that whole thing when it moves into that, that like really slow lurching riff, which is kind of like, it's like we're going to take the ending of um, Evil Spells and make it more disgusting. And and it's massive, massive success with that. Really good stuff. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the first song on the album where I'm really genuinely excited about it. Uh, then uh, then we get Thy Kingdom Come, uh, which again that one I, I do prefer that original cassette version on the Thy Kingdom Come cassette. Um, the um, the upbeat the verse is a bit upbeat for me. Uh, the the singing for a lot of that feels a little bit more like the Cannibal Corpse were just jamming in a bunch of stuff. Uh, the yelling of the title is good. Like that, you know, and and then all the stuff that happens that like it's like a post chorus seizure, like I kingdom come, blah, 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 like all of that stuff. That weird, that weird line in the guitar, in the in the guitar, in the chorus is kind of a, even though that's an older song redone for this album, it's still very much a a, a characteristic that Trey yeah. uses moving forward. That's that's a very much a morbid angel characteristic. Oh yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like some of it is like. Like that's like there like there's a lot there are a lot of core original awesome ideas with this band, um, so that's cool. I enjoy I enjoy that song. Um, I don't think it's as good as the title cut, um, uh, and I'll get to. Um, I got it. To, Sorry. <laughs> the 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 pop stars wearing death metal shirts. I'm thinking this is what Nikki's getting at here. Funny. Anyway. Okay. Um, Unholy Blasphemy. So we said we talked about the influence of this band. I feel this song created Chrisune. Um, Chrisune has done many better Unholy Blasphemies than Unholy Blasphemies. Oh, I, I don't know about that, man. I don't think, <laughs> I think Unholy Blasphemies is pretty good. Um, I uh, that whole what the what the great execution that album. I think has some great stuff. The the Iconoclast or whatever or the Extremist, whatever. There's some great stuff on there. I. I I got into that band once they found their their groove, which is in that uh, kind of in the middle of their catalog. Um, but I feel like that attack, that straightforwardness, um, and uh, and David Vincent's delivery here is really good. So I think this song is, is is pretty good. Like there's nothing the special magic of all this other stuff that Morbid Angel does is wholly absent in this song. This could have been another band um, that was just doing like compared to carcass death um and, you know and bolt throw and some of their contemporaries this is more evil sounding so like morbid angel has that going for them but uh i, I feel like this is just like that that is it alex the singer for alex carmaggio the the main singer from chrissy and like like he listened to this song he's like i'm singing in that style forever like <laughs> that's me um I, I, and again i like chrissy and I, from, from a certain point forward um then we get uh, abominations which is which is quite good. That's the first song on this album that I'd actually put in like maybe the top 20, 25 Morbid Angel songs. 
the the they do a really cool thing with this stop start stompy verse of the the like it's it's there's zero flow to it and then the dump dun 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 bow down before the master like when they go into all of that then you get action and i feel like um motion and so this song i feel has a nice seesaw of like this that burst that is like anti-flow and then what it leaps to uh that whole the bow down before the master and all of that stuff that has like a like a, like a really uh like a, just a really nice push to it and then the the six eight break feels a little bit like a man or i did the, the rise up develops into that harmonic pinch uh heavy metal idea it's i mean this this basically this is like a really good thrash tune with fry vocals in there in their tuning uh and then i do like i i you know i i put it to you internet uh people in the chat so in that latter course there's a sound effect when uh you get when he goes back to bow down before the mat the the uh the uh master and i and I, is a hypertrace warp a toilet on an f-16 or a cosmic slurpee can't you know that that little <laughs> so really, I, almost really, got, I almost got an accident once and my butthole made that sound as i puckered as i <laughs> evaded the as i evaded the crash <laughs> yeah hey gore metal thank you so much for the thank you so much for that and we are also glad that the bands are all okay i know someone lost their life at that show but um it could have been so much worse holy crap in I'm oblivious, I'm oblivious of this what morbid angel crypta revocation uh played a show in uh where was it alan was it illinois yeah illinois all uh, april 1st so yeah, april 1st uh, a, a tornado came through and flattened the club while okay. uh, i think revocation was playing uh, a bunch of people injured and it the the roof caved in it killed somebody um crypta's rv was i've seen a picture of it, it was completely flattened thankfully they weren't in it maybe they were i don't know i don't know all the stories one person died but anyway gore metal thank you so much for the contribution we really appreciate it thank you yeah right. I'm, seeing, I'm, I'm actually going to that show uh on i think it's tuesday and it's you know revocation morbid angel and some some other crypto then maybe maybe somebody else <laughs> thanks tj thanks for that <laughs> <laughs> uh so that one is really cool. I also have a question, and this is another thing where it's like, was this a moment in death? Like, I feel the first album is mostly the character of David Vincent is like narrating about the monsters and the rituals and, you know, Christ come down off the cross, burn shit, the ghouls are coming, all that sort of stuff. But I feel there is a thing, and you get it all over that massacre uh, from Beyond album. Uh -huh. um, but I feel there's there like there's some deep growls going on from you don't like massacre. I'm not a fan of From Beyond. I think it's very average. Oh man, I think that that's a good album. And so it's for, average. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> um, the uh, but there in this song in Abominations, there's like the uh, like I feel there's an extended presentation of David Vincent not singing about the monsters, but he is the monster. <laughs> so, I, I like I don't like with Carcass. They're like, you know, they're like, like, I mean, it's nonstop medical terminology. Like they're the rotten surgeons or whatever. They are the, they are the pathologists. Yes. They're the pathologists. And, the and, morticians. And Dave, Dave Schuldinger is a, a little, to me, his stuff was always a bit too punky and happy in terms of his vocals. It's one of the reasons, like, I, I don't like Scream Bloody Gore. That's a whole other conversation. But it's like, I feel that there's an embracing <laughs> the monster voice. Um there where it's like we're not singing about the creatures we are the creatures so it's just I, like anyways abominations i really enjoy i'll put that in the top 25 um you get desolate ways which is a brunel like acoustic guitar thing it sounds like it could be on injustice for all whatever keys it on you could just slot it anywhere on that album between two songs it would work uh and then ancient ones which is the first song by this band i loved um I, I like it. I'll, I'll put it in the top 20 at this at this phase. There's It's a little too playful with the, come on, team at to the dance club. Like that whole, <laughs> that part is a little too, is a little too happy for me. But the, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the drum intro, the ba -da -ba -ba -da, and then leaping into all that wild careening, wailing, 
lead guitar over that over that six eight stuff. All that stuff is good. Pretty much when this band leaps into those six eights, especially if they put in a flange effect over the guitars, which they do all over the place, particularly in this song, you're in a good place. Like this song is this song is what like five and a half six minutes. This song could be twelve minutes if they just wanted to keep riding out that six eight. And this is where I think even at this even on this album, which I think is the most troubled of the Sandoval performances, um, he's coming up with good stuff because I just think he feels that six eight groove. Uh, and then you have the the harpsichord outro. Um, it's fine. Uh, so that album for me in their catalog rates um, rates as number five. So that was number and five. that when it rated higher. I think some of it is some of it is a little bit the unfortunate thing of becoming a better drummer and playing with a click track and being bugged more and more by that like sliding around chasing blast beats and, and some of that stuff. But some of it is also I just think some of this doesn't quite cohere as well as as their as their best stuff. It's ambitious. Like clearly this is a step forward in ambition in terms of how many riffs and tempos you're going to put in a song. But I enjoy the album. I enjoy by the for the record, like I like with the exception of the one album that everybody hates and I hate and and, and these guys are going to hate, with the exception that I enjoy their entire catalog. Like there's a reason they're that I that I that I rate them at the top of all time of death metal death metal bands is cuz this catalog is worth owning. With one exception. <laughs> a couple exceptions actually anyway um for me man the i remember getting this tape when it came out i was so psyched and it was probably three or four listens before i could wrap my head around probably the biggest sticking point initially for this album for me is the production it's weird it's wonky it's like there's distortion on the album but they tried to make it really clean it's just a very bizarre sound coming off of Altars of Madness, which everything was really, really kind of perfect to this. It seemed very <laughs> wonky. I don't know. I can't say someone mentioned in the chat earlier. It was a very swampy sound. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. It's a Florida swampy sound. But well, the, the, the one, one, one aside, like the, the snares to me are more definitively triggered on this. Yeah. I don't know, but listening to it again, I haven't spun it in a while, but man, when this album came out, I listened to it probably constantly for a good three months. Got to know all this, and I still remember all the words. Listening to it now, the, the intros, outros stuff bugs me a little bit nowadays, but um, for me, Thy Kingdom Come, I love, 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 love that song. I know it's a throwback to an older track. It's it's Vincent in that higher register. On this record, he starts to experiment with with deeper deeper tones. Although he contain he maintains a you can uh, very audible you can understand what he's saying all the time. I like his lower vocals, but I really like that higher register. And Thy Kingdom Come and the faster um, attack of that song and the catchiness and the wah, 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 da, 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 and the uh, that thing he does yeah. fucking love that it was a big influence for me back in the day when i was doing you know singing for a, a death metal band back in the day you did, but, you did a good one right there by the way yeah thanks <laughs> um but yeah i love this record uh the title track for slow i mean this that song blessed are the sick it beats out god of emptiness easily it's just a very cool chorus with you know pain drawn out uh words just the way he sings over the top of that it's just very pump your fist it's so good this band is so good and this is this is a very transitional record for them they're really starting to branch out from classic death metal they're getting a little bit more experimental i mean they're still clinging you know you got uh that kingdom come was it desolate ways there's they're clinging to the the old style but they're they're pushing the boundaries you know trey's strange take on writing death metal riffs is really starting to bubble to the surface here it's very cool the solos are great after i got accustomed to the way this record sounds it ended up i couldn't imagine it sounding any other way it's just kind of that this is the way morbid angel should sound and they they continue i mean the next album they refine it a little bit more make it a little more uh together but i love this record this is my number two um craig perfectly boiled down the whole thing i'm not going to go track by track but i will say blessed are the sick and uh, thy kingdom come are my two favorites on here i really do appreciate the fact that vincent is 
trying to move the ball forward by, you know, bringing a little more variety into his voice. I still like the higher register of his vocals. I always will. And, um, you know, it's kind of funny <laughs> as, as the years go on and David Vincent ages and, you know, becomes, a you know, old, an older gentleman <laughs> that is, uh, time. that I was, I'm like, where is this sentence going to land? <laughs> older gentleman, older gentleman was not where I thought it was going to go. Gentleman that, that appreciates some Stetson classic, you know, some, some uh, uh, accessories, uh, fashion accessories. I listen to Morbid Angel now, and all I can see is this fucking dyed fucking beard thing he's got going on there. It drives me so crazy. I mean, just let that shit go gray. Don't sit there and dye it in goofy shapes. Anyway, so I, I, I hear Blessed Are the Sick, him singing. All I can see is that goatee perfect dyed thing. I think it's the goatee that's doing it. Anyway, Alan. Sorry, sorry for that yeah, little aside. It just, uh, that that goatee shit he's got going on haunts my dreams nowadays. <laughs> it haunts all our dreams. Let's be honest. Um, yeah, y'all have you know covered the album really well. And you know, to Craig's points, you know it's an album with flaws. You know, it definitely you know there are little things here and there about the album that you know you know are maybe off a bit here or that are very odd there. But uh, for whatever reason, for me they all still work incredibly well in the context of the album. It's one of these albums that if you looked at it piece by piece, it shouldn't add up. You've got all these very odd, you know, short instrumental interludes. You have song lengths that are really all over the place. Some are less than two minutes. Some are over five minutes. Uh, there's a lot of different styles and influences mixed in. I mean, it feels like they're just, yeah, kind of pouring everything into the sink and not necessarily even mixing it up that well. It's just like, it's all just here. Blah. There you go. And I think you, know, in the hands of a lesser band, it would not work. It would have ended up being a fabulous disaster. But uh, and so I understand why some people are not that keen on this album. This is one that is a little divisive in their catalog. Some love it, some don't. Some are kind of eh. For me personally, I think all those little oddities make it a really enchanting album. Um, it it's does one that I come back to pretty regularly. Yeah, and. Just, you know, all these little nuances, it, oh, there's always something to pay attention to, something to notice, you know, something different that will stand out on different listens. You know, it, even for the, you know, the really, you know, short tracks, like, you know, Day of Suffering. So it's like, you know, it's still, you know, has, you know, this, you know, you know incredible heavy beat to it. Um, even, you know, the weird little instrumental parts, you know, something you said before, I think, Marty, that it gives it, you know, an air of class, which is not something you get in death metal very often, especially in that era. That era, everybody was still trying to be the fastest band, the most brutal band, the heaviest band. And here's a band that, you know, is not afraid. Like, what if we do this, you know, just clean little flute outro? That's not heavy. That's not brutal, but it's interesting. It's tasteful. It, it makes you stand out. It shows that you're going to try different things. And they may not all work perfectly, but they do work really well together. Um, Craig, yeah, I like your description. You, this is the album where they start into that lurch core kind of vibe. I like that phrase that you used, and and I like it when Morbid Angel you know, goes into that lurch gear. Uh, you know, they can play fine and blast, of course, with the best of them, but but when they really gear that thing down a little bit and they get that weird twisting lurch to them, that's you know when you know, the big you know evil demonic smile lights up my face with Morbid yeah. Angel. That's you know where I really like the band in that particular groove. Um, you know, folks have been discussing the cover art uh, a lot. You know, there's a lot of discussion about it online too. You know, it's a classic painting from a you know late 19th century Belgian painter with a uh, yeah Satan with octopus tentacles standing on a coral reef. Hell's underwater. 19th century impressionist paintings weird that way, I guess. Uh, also used on a Hexen House album. <clears throat> yes, very good, Marty. That's right. I forgot about that, but uh, yeah, this has been used before, and uh, this is another one that you know. Thank you, Earache, for doing this to the cover art on later editions. The, the, the color palette on these reissues literally makes me want to vomit. Uh, it's just pathetic. Uh, this, this is what the album looks like. This, this is what it looks like if your dog pisses on your CD <laughs> and uh, you just kind of roll with it and never replace it. Maybe that's like a, they put mood ring technology into the cover and you're just very angry when you look at it. So it turns that color. I, 
that's <laughs> no that that would have actually required thought and money from earache um neither of which are things they put into their cd reissues so good hypothesis marty and i tried i was stretching i was trying to grab at something that wasn't if there. it was on century media they might have gone that route but you know earache basically you know hired a colorblind hobo to handle the art design on the reissues and uh, that's what we got <laughs> um but anyway at the end of the day yes it's an album you know that you know Definitely has, you know, things that can nag and annoy people, and I completely get that. But for me, uh, the whole thing comes together. It's greater than the sum of its parts. And for me, it's still my favorite Morbid Angel album. I have this one listed at number one. There are other albums that are close. Uh, this isn't a runaway in a landslide kind of scenario. There are other albums I'll admit are really close to this and very, very good, too. And part of this is sentimental value, like um, you know, Craig and I said at the beginning. This was also my introduction to the band, so it's the one I've known the longest. And there, there is a nostalgia factor that this is, you know, the album that yeah, you know, you know James and Jennifer and me were you know geeking out over, you know, in English class when the you know, teacher wasn't looking. So like, have you guys seen this thing? He's like, what the fuck is that? I don't know. That's cool looking. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that that uh, it, it gets some points for that. I, I will readily admit, but I do enjoy the music. Um, we'll talk about what happens on some later albums where they're also doing these different interludes and stuff. It's not something that always works for the band, but on this album, the way they're spaced out, the way they fit in, I think it, uh, absolutely works. So that's my take on blessed are the sick. Still my favorite. I think <laughs> I forgot to mention that this was my number two. And, uh, also regarding the artwork that no one cares about or the tip of my finger here, that person, that, that girl right there in the, looks exactly like an old girlfriend of mine which really always freaked me out when i first bought this and i was looking at the cover looked just like her a lot holy shit you gotta be kidding me anyway number two for me which brings us to 1993's covenant craig i'm gonna let you start i'm gonna go use the little boys room i'll be right back cool so um uh for me this album is a step up uh the um the performances are are like are just much better in terms of tightness. The the production I think is much better. This is uh, Fleming Rasmussen, right? If that's how you say his name, produced this. Who produced some like uh, some some Metallica stuff? So uh, they feel it feels a lot more locked in. It feels richer. Um, I also feel there's this, and I don't know if this came from working with with the outside producer or reflecting on their catalog or reflecting on their lives or speaking to the devil or talking to Cthulhu. I, I don't know where it came in, but I think some of the, um, some of the experiments and riff collages of the previous album uh, are jettisoned here. Uh, overall, I think this album is, 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 is uh, more direct than uh, Blessed. Uh, well, it's definitely more direct than Blessed. I oh, think yeah. in some ways it's more direct than Alters. Um, and uh, oh, yeah, Craig, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Just I did want to make sure I uh, said thank you and shout out to Metal Neanderthal. Good to see you in the chat tonight. And uh, you're welcome for covering the band. And uh, thank you for uh, the uh, super chat. We really appreciate it. It's always uh, good to have you in the chat, man. So uh, sorry, Craig. Back to you. Oh, no sweat. No sweat. I uh, yeah. Uh, you know, if there's ever stuff on screen you want to address. Just stop me. Um, so, uh, so this album sounds good. The uh, the drums are much more full bodied. The snare is really snappy uh, and deep. The double bass is very wet and sounds really really good. So, like overall, I think this is like you went from an album that I thought like I think Blessed is a definite giant step down sonically from the first album, and also is a step down in terms of the performance is being locked in to hear something where uh, it's just a thicker, richer sound. And I can understand if someone's like, oh, it, it seems more professional. Um, and it, it does. Like, I think that that polish helped this band. And uh, so this album is this album is always hard because if I could take a pill that would allow me to enjoy tracks two, three, and four on this album, I would love this album. But I don't know that that pill exists. So this album is an uneven experience in an album that has maybe the most of my favorite songs by the band. Um, so this is a this is a really 
kind of uneven. Like I, I listen to it and every time I hope some songs are going to grow on me and they, they don't. Um, Rapture is good. Uh, this is of a straight moving, like it's like a tremolo, like it's a hornet's nest of like fast six, eight. You have a really odd syncopation. Um, the, the singing is a pretty straight, a little straighter than I'd like. But that one, you know, that song is is really cool. You get some cool flange effects. Uh, this, in terms of, there aren't that many songs in, let's say, the top the 20, 25 songs by Morbid Angel that are their straightforward songs. This is this is maybe the second best of them. Uh, and um, so I enjoy that song. Uh, Pain Divine is speedy. Uh, there's a higher melody in this song that I think is good. Um, and, uh, this is, this has a little bit the, like the hookups between the snare and the riff. It seems late, uh, when he's embellishing these, these fret runs, I'm talking about, there's something like two and a half minutes. Um, and I think I basically, I think this song is just like completely average material top to bottom. Um, and, um, oh, that's a cool, that's a cool, interesting stat. Um, I think that like I, I if it, I think that lick is cool, but I think the rest of this is totally average stuff, and uh, and it has one decent melodic lick. So this is like okay, like I I think it is a I think it is a just a mediocre song. Uh, World of shit, um, I, I, well named is harsh because I think it's not. I don't think it's shit. I just think like Pain Divine, uh, it's just completely average uh these are the songs like i can like i can do every drum fill and every gesture and know everything and sing out the riffs for the songs in this hour i know but like heart in these things pain divine world of shit and vengeance is mine these three mediocre songs like I, like every time i hear it it's almost like it's for the first time because none of it sticks they are the least sticking songs i feel in their whole catalog um, and they don't have something like the like the bleed for the devil. I think like that's an actively bad bleed for the devil. I think that's an actively bad. That bit, was it the pain divine? It's got the dunna 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 dunna. It's catchy riff. Is that the song I'm thinking of? Again, these three, <laughs> these these three are are like like they are the ones that don't stick. I don't know how many times I've heard this album like. You know, I've had this album for a really long time, and um, and the songs on it I adore. Like I think they're the high water marks in this band's catalog and in death metal history. But these three, like the so you get "Vengeance Is Mine," um, the tuning and the growl in that song are all that just keep that from being a straight up thrash song. Um, and then the uh, there's the like there's just not much mood with this. There's a part like there's a part where it goes to like. My sword shall take life or whatever. Like that's this, there's this post pause tremolo. Like there's some okay stuff in it. Again, like I don't have a ton to say about these three because they don't ever stick with me. Like I, I would need to like funnel them in, but man, I've, I've tried to get on board with these three songs and I do not believe it. Uh, like I just, I, they don't stick with me. So those three, very average, nothing bad on any of them. Then we get to Lion's Den one of the best songs in the history of death metal. This was co-written by uh, David Vincent. And you, this is you get you, like, this is where you get Pete Sandoval rocking the six, eight. And um, the, the uh, what, what is maybe the most dissonant moment in this band's career at, up to this point, where there's the point when uh, Vincent is like the centurions might be known. And then there's a chord that follows it. And man, like or chords, I don't know what's going on, but it's a total chaos soup of dissonance. Christian uh, standing breathless. Then gets, and then when it leaps, when it leaps into the 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 um the all of the stuff when it's like it's like they kill them all, kill them all for slander, and it, and and they're moving around the fretboard, but it gets into the lion roaring rift. Uh, bah, da, 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 da. <laughs> like I could listen to that for like 20 minutes. They rock it so well. Like this is a band that's actually rocking the pocket. And they are like and and Sandoval switches to like 
um, this like punchy, doom, to tattoo, doom, to tattoo. he starts doing this like jazz work under that stuff. And it's incredible. Like that, for a long time, I would have named that as my single favorite song by the band. That song is great. And uh, the thrashy skank beat on the Kill em All, like this song is, is, is Sandoval's finest moment at this point in their career. Uh, but that run, that that riff is a line roaring. That bam, run, 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 run. it's the line roaring. It's incredible stuff. So I love that. Um, Santa- Craig, before you go on, I just want to first of all, Alex, thank you for your contribution. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, Gore Metal Ag Noroth, thank you for all you've contributed tonight too. And sorry that shirt's probably not going to happen. Anyway. Thank you. I just wanted to publicly say it. Anyway, thank you. Nope. Go ahead, yeah, I, I, absolutely. So that song is great. Um, uh, and I'll say, like, that is the one that I would rate above Chapel of Ghouls and Blasphemy in their catalog. I think it is great. They have six songs that I rate above all others. That's one of them. Uh, Blood on My Hands, pretty good. Um, this is better than the three songs that I could never remember. Um, you get the Killer Bee, Tremolo Swarm. Um, and uh, there's some cool groove after the part, the blood on my hand that get that gets interesting uh, after that. So that one is pretty good. Angel of Disease. So man, I, this is there's a lot to say about this song. The first is it doesn't belong on this album. It does not have any place <laughs> on this album. It sounds like a tankard riff, and it's so happy. And to me, it has no play like. This song is is this is from the abominations thing, right? Like this is a this is a song from like the this is a song from before altars, and um, I don't dislike this song, um, but that whole like the like that lick not so good, um, and uh, this goes through a bunch of parts. The singing is all high, like that fry voice, I guess. Uh, it's all that higher stuff. Uh, it just doesn't, I think, it, 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 it almost, like, it sounds so different in terms of where the vocals are, how upper register, uh, maybe the tuning. That one song just doesn't fit on the album. I don't think it's bad, but it is a bit of a, it's so much of a mood change. And then that whole ending bit that when it's the... When it's doing this, like, back and forth, like... Like, like, you know, open this door, open that door, open this door, open. Like the ending of this song, I feel is comedy, uh, which is not what I want on this album uh, or from Morbid Angel. And like that super playful. Like, <laughs> OK, like you can change tempos and you can play these two riffs back to back. But I, I feel like the amount of switching on that feels jokey. Uh, I think there's some cool stuff, um, but uh, the 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 angel of disease, one who shuns the light. That's kind of a thrash, like that, that. That also isn't feeling in line with the stuff on the the rest of the album. So, um, although I enjoy the song better than two, three, and four, the the songs that I cannot remember, um, uh, I feel it is an odd song in terms of its mood and completely out of place on this album. Uh, and no, we go to no metal allowed on that high on the fretboard, <laughs> right? It, it, it is it is not good. And then we go to Swarm Black, incredible. Like this is the thing of this album. You have Lions Den, I could argue the best song they ever recorded, and then you have Swarm of Black, I could argue the best song they ever recorded. So here they're completely feeling the groove, uh, and uh, like the. And uh, and that's it's all rolling six eight. It's all the sweet spot for Pete Sandoval playing his heart out, changing up the beats, doing squishy hi hat stuff, punctuating on the ride, playing and enjoying it. Like this is you know like a lot you know like a lot of death metal and a lot of like morbid angel death metal is grim and dark and ominous and sinister. But there's a whole other category of death metal that I'll say like more a little bit more the bolt thrower style. Or behemoth and some of the cannibal corpse stuff that's like empowering and invigorating and man sworn to black like if someone's like you know pick 10 death metal songs to show what death metal can do i would pick sworn to black i, I don't think death metal has gotten better than that i think there are like some some instances 
from Carcass and this band that that match that. The even and the details of the production. There's like a backward swell of vocals in the course, like that lead into each line. Um, and then there's the the uh, the. It's like a shivering on the fretboard. The parts of the and then and they start they're moving from like tapping to toms to pulsing on the ride it's it's great like incredible stuff and then when they they return from the whole departure which is all great stuff it all flows it's just an all-time death metal classic they go back and then eventually the banana china crash the banana crash and i'll put that crash with the For Whom the Bell Tolls crashes and the Wrathchild crashes as one of the most important crashes in heavy metal history. It's <laughs> incredible. It is a very stupid and specific thing to point out, but like that China crash, if you saw them and no one played a China crash at that spot, you would need to rush the stage and tar start turning over the drum kit. Like <laughs> that is so essential. That is as essential as any lead vocal line or anything. So this song is great. Um, I, I love it. Um, uh, high point in their catalog. Then we get Na Mataru. It's a high synth interlude, uh, in, in, interlude or interlude. <laughs> There's a new product coming out on. Uh... <laughs> this is they're doing that. Like we get into chimes a lot of times in their interludes. Uh, <laughs> interlube. <laughs> I would hope so. There, anyway. Yeah, there, there's some there's some of these that are interludes, but this one is fine. <laughs> And then we get God of Emptiness, the third of the three six songs I would rate at the top of their catalog. So three of my favorite songs ever by the band are on this album that also has three songs I can't remember even if I listened to a hundred times, and I probably have. Uh, so God of Emptiness, I think, is incredible. So this is, the you know, the... Like, this is that lurchcore, gigantic cyclopean creature crawling and then that you know the the uh, the eyes uh, that whole entrance for david for, for david vincent is incredible um the and and the the sandoval's playing underneath there's like a lot of stop start doo -doo -doo -doo. It's like he's playing a beat stops playing a beat comes in again like you're not quite sure how it you're not quite sure how it will um like how it's going to progress, if it's moving, if the beast is going to die, if the beast is going to rise, what's going on? Um, and then, and this is probably stuff where I'll start dividing um, in terms of some of my favorites with this band. I love some of this other stuff that David Vincent does. Um, this, the, the, the whole, I mean, it's, it has that aquatic pro processing where it's like, and the children come to a day. I think those lines are good. I like the processing. And then the bow to me faithfully, yeah. bow to me splendidly. Awesome. I mean, it's, it's like this is magnificent stuff. And then um, the riff that breaks up all the bow to me is, is a, it's like a 12 8, like, you know, extra measures, da, 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 like incredible funeral doom riff. So this is, you know, this is one where I'm like, you know, like, there's some funeral doom that probably existed before that. I'm not sure where that Thurgathonathron or whatever that, I'm not sure when that one came out or that winter album, but in terms of the funeral doom that I love, like evoking or worship, like that's what I hear with this, but this predates the, the, the stuff I'm talking about, like evoking in particular, like I, I hear, like I hear this song in evoking and that hypnagogy is definitely my favorite funeral doom album ever. Uh, so this album is, so that's it. So this album, I, 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 you know, I just stick it at, I stick it at, um, number four on the list, but what a strange experience. Cause I just feel like I, I really like Rapture. And then there's just like four things to get through, uh, or three things to get through. And then it gets great, but then there's just sort of mood hurting angel of disease, dun, 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 like happening. <laughs> But you have, I think, I think you have three of the best songs in death metal history on this. Like it's, I think the highlights are so good. So this is the one where, again, like I, I, I'll try. I tried during the process of prepping for this thing to convince myself that those that tracks two, three, and four were good. I'm not able to do it. I don't dislike them. I just think they're average. Um. So, but I think the production is really solid. I think Sworn to Black, Lions Den, like um, 
God of Emptiness, three of the all-time great death metal songs and three of the six best songs they ever did all on this one album. All right. And Jack, half a prayer. Thank you for the $2. Really appreciate it, brother. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I will say with Covenant, this is my number three record. I'm going to get it out of the way real quick because I forgot to say number two was uh, blessed for me. But um, I agree with a lot of things Craig is saying. I would say that um, I like this album a little bit more than he did the songs that he said that were kind of sleep flyover songs for him that they, they, they there's a lot of good stuff in those for me they they dialed in the production on this one where blessed are is a little bit wonky and all over the place and it's strangely clean this album things sit together much better the production it, it takes the blueprint made by blessed and refines it puts a little more edge to it a little more aggression to it it's like a good compromise between the first two albums and the thing that really stands out for me other than the riffs is david vincent um he channels the power of his oddly sculpted and quaffed goatee and um his best vocal performance thus far i he's he's taken the lows and the highs and combined them again he's just a very charismatic front man he just is i've seen this band play shit i don't know how many times i've seen him play i saw them on this tour i saw them on the domination tour i saw them on altars of madness i saw them with jared anderson like zoller did i saw him on the same was it with uh today's the day in motorhead you saw him with jared yeah it was yeah it was with, it was with motorhead yeah yeah i saw him on that tour too I was with them. I saw them with with Vincent and i saw them with i've seen i saw them with all three guys i saw them with tucker yeah um but yeah yeah, it might have been this album or the one after it in Detroit. He was pandering to the Nazis in the crowd, which was kind of shitty. But um, anyway, uh, Vincent really, he's hes a great vocalist, a great front man. He play he, the way, you know, seeing them live, he just, he how he engages with the crowd, plays his bass, plays spot on, but, you know, still, you know, accentuates and, He's got so much flavor and color, and it really shows on this record in particular. It's where, you know, the the weird transition between the low vocals and the high vocals. He's getting a little more accustomed to the low vocals, which is even more so um, driven home on God of Emptiness. I would say that song, I think it's great they put it on the end of the album because in the middle or anywhere else, it would have been weird. You could tell they're... Yeah, they're, they they it was smart to put it there. And as a guitar player, I mean, it's obvious they're playing with seven string or eight string guitars. I don't know, Ibanez. You get you play in a lower tuning. Uh, if you like tune to an A, it dictates the way you play the guitar. It just it has a sound to it. If I'm tuned to an A, you know, a lot of the riffs I would write would sound like modern day, you know, old school death metal. You know, these kids chunking and crunching on the A. You, you grab a seven string guitar they wrote a morbid angel song that you could tell like "Ooh, we got this seven string guitar i'm going to write a song it sounds i mean he picked it up and started playing and this is the so- type of song that had to come out of it you know it's just a really well written song the the bow to me thing is you know it was accentuated by beavis and butthead <laughs> and they, they kind of picked on the part that is kind of cheesy in the song that uh, out of all the parts that bow to be free fully, it's kind of annoying, but the rest of the song, I really like the chorus or the verses, all that stuff. It's a really cool song, but for me, rapture. Yeah. He's just kind of, you know, spit firing the lyrics out there, but again, he finds charisma and character in the way he presents, you know, just a rapid fire vocal uh, attempt. Um, in rapture i'm um, reborn it's so good it just he's just so much the swell the 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 way he layers those uh words over that uh the, the speed riffs in there awesome 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 um uh pain divine uh, dun, 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 dun. good riff there's a lot of great riffs on this record it's a so- this is a solid three for me um Craig documented the entire album. I'm not going to go and do that, but yeah, I think that um, of the first four, yeah, three is a good spot for this for me. 
I'm just going to leave it at that. We're going to go circle back to Alan here. All right. Getting the uh, <clears throat> microphone off mute. Folks in the chat are having a lot of fun. Really lively discussion over there. I'm going off on weird sitcoms. Y'all are awesome. Thank you so much for joining us every week and blowing up the chat. It's great. It's great. Thank you. And thank you for not being dicks to each other. That's even better yet. It's awesome. Yeah, we have, you know, an active and lively chat, but it's not just, you know, people, you know, being trolls or jerks or anything. Yeah, like 101 that. shows, are... we've only banned one person ever. We're not going to Hopefully that stays that way. But that's anyway. a pretty crazy good. And folks are adding lots of, you know, good, you know, details and comments, you know, facts that, uh, yeah, none of us know about it. So uh, always cool to see. So my history with this album's a little different from a lot of people's. You know, for a lot of folks, you know, this is, you know, the ultimate death metal album of all time. Yeah. Um, and I get that. I was not really big on it at first, not because of anything about the album. It was simply that, you know, this came out summer of 93. I probably didn't hear it until fall of 93. Summer of 93, I, I was working graveyard shifts on, at uh, Burger in the middle of nowhere. So, yeah, you didn't have a whole lot of access, you know, to death metal. We were, you know, listening to, you know, Leonard Skinner and Charlie Daniels until 3 a.m. while scraping, you know, grease off a of fry vat. Um, so by the time I heard this, you know, in late 93, I was just getting very, very tired of you know, death metal. Um, you know, when I had relocated in 92, that local area, as I mentioned, you know, everything was saturated with death metal by that point. So it already been like a year and a half where most of what I was, you know, hearing what people were talking about and what was showing up at the record shops was just death metal, death metal, death metal, death metal, death metal. And, you know, I was finding, you know, some things here and there that I liked, but I was pretty burned out on it by that point. Just like, ah, fuck this. I want to listen to something else. So, yeah, by, you know, late 93, I was starting to dig back into, you know, 80s stuff that I had missed. I'm like, I don't care what Cannibal Corpse is doing right now. Let me see if I can find some more stuff by this Witchfinder General band. And that's where my head was at. And as such, I just wasn't that interested in the new Morbid Angel album. Um, but, you know, yeah, coming back to it later on, it was also always for a long time billed as like, you know, their most brutal, their most extreme. And again, that's usually not a selling point for me personally. Some folks, you know, that's what they're looking for in death metal. Eh, as I said earlier, I like Morbid Angel when they get slow and lurchy, not when they're just hyperspeed blasting all the time. Let's see, and oh, Gorm, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much again. Too kind. You're going of crazy, you. man. Save your money. You got groceries and gas and shit to buy. Don't don't. You're you got good. Records to buy. Yeah, you you records to buy. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Really, those I do so much. appreciate it. I mean, yeah. Just just to piggyback on one thing you said, Alan, that sure, the most brutal. I feel that that I feel that that is to the detriment. I feel that that. Whether that was a conscious decision or in in hindsight, but I think that's why you get those that those tracks two, three, four, and why they're so unremarkable. But the first one being good, and they have fast songs that I like, but I, I feel that that's yeah. there. There's a straightforwardness, that's certainly very different from the previous album. So that that makes mm -hmm. sense. I didn't know that. Like I didn't know this this band uh, at the time that this album came out, but that makes sense in retrospect why they would be they would they would be they would be showing you that they can whip some ass. With those yeah. things, just less artfully. Uh, so, <laughs> yep. Well said, Greg. And uh, yeah, you know, to your point earlier, you know, this is, I agree, you know, this is Morbid Angel at their tightest. This is kind of their most focused album. Um, you know, when I finally, you know, came around to it, you know, and, you know, paid more attention to it over the years, it's like, it's actually a very good album. I actually do like it quite a bit. And um, sometimes I will forget that if I don't play, hear it for a long time. I'll slip back into that mode of thinking, yeah, well, you know, that's the, that's the, the really heavy, brutal one. I'd rather listen to, you know, Blessed. You know, but then I play this and it's like, oh, no, no, no. Got to <clears throat> gotta re remember that it's not really like that at all. And I don't have a lot of the songs quite as high as Craig does, but I don't have any of the songs quite as low as Craig does either. You know, Craig's got them, you know, some you know, top songs and some bomb songs. For me, it's a little more even kilter throughout. Not perfect, of course. There's variation, but um, I'm still impressed you know, that you know, for you know, most of the album, you know, yeah, it delivers really strong stuff. Uh, yes, yeah, "Sworn to the Black" is you know one of their best tracks. Period. Um, "God of Emptiness." People have talked about in the chat. You know, as a closer, you know, it's a uh, interesting one. I like it. I do like "World of Shit." Out of those three, 
that you're not as uh, keen on Craig. That's you know the one that I do like. And again, it's the one where you know at least you know for parts of that song, you know maybe they're gearing it down a little bit. You know they're getting a little heavier, a little less uh, forceful. Um, but yeah, so for me, it's an album that sometimes you know I, I think you know I recoil from a little bit just because of the hype around the album, best-selling death metal album of all time, top of so many people's morbid angel list, top of so many people's death metal list. It, but to be fair to the album, it's still an extremely good album. Um, and the fact that, you know, it's a more tight and focused album with a little less variation or creativity than Blessed, that actually it's, doesn't hurt the album at all. Uh, I think it's maybe good that they did something different and uh, really dialed it in very tightly here. Ranking this one as such, you know, it's a little tough for me. This is an album, uh, it, it kind of varies between three, four, and five on the list. Um, it, it, today I've ended up with it ranked at number four. It could easily be a step higher or one step lower. The albums I have at three, four, and five are really, really close to each other in my mind. One and two kind of stay there. Altars and Blessed stay at one and two. Um, but yeah, these next three that will, uh, one, the ones that I rank three and four and five are really close. Today I've got Covenant at fourth, but, um, that's not to its detriment. It's still an extremely strong album. Uh, that has a ton of good stuff going for it. So there's still hey, three albums that are all a bit different from one another and um, <laughs> all are top notch stuff. There's a very good reason by, you know, this point, you know, Morbid Angel could have stopped here and their legacy as, you know, not just death metal pioneers, but legends is pretty much cemented by the time they're done with this album. I think. Yeah. So um, that is my take on Covenant. Now I'll get back to the chats and uh, make more bad, goofy sitcom references. <laughs> which brings us to 1995's domination mr zoller yes so well i got got the uh the hoodie nice and uh this is it's probably gonna be an unpopular opinion um this is my favorite album uh by them they have two that vibe for the top spot and i could argue each each one and they change uh, pretty pretty regularly. This is uh, uh, this is my third favorite death metal of all time, behind Necroticism, Discanting, the Insalubrious, and Heartwork. And I think it's great. Um, I, uh, I and I know people aren't fans of this and some of the more commercial aspects and some of the variety. I think that's all to their benefit. And I think lore, massively to their benefit is the addition of Eric Rattan. And on on my my favorite albums by them. Other songwriters figure a little bit more prominently. It's not quite as completely <laughs> triassic to. Um, Thanks, uh, Tom. Thank you, Tom. And um, so I, I love this album. And this this one definitely took it took some time for me to wrap my mind around some of it. And I think there's a ton of variety uh, going on. Um, the production, uh, maybe Covenant is the best one, but this would be number two. Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm not hearing like really any of the problems in terms of the blast beats lagging and all the hookups and stuff like that. So it feels really solid. There's a lot of variety. Um, I think I, I could be wrong. I mean, I'm going off of like a 20 year old memory, but I think I remember Maycock referring to this as like a, a death metal piece of shit in Maniac. <laughs> It was him like I, people hated this album and, and there are people who still do hate this album perhaps some of our listeners perhaps people are now cutting out or going to use the bathroom that i've named this divisive album as their as their best but it's it's my favorite again they're like for me there are two at the top and i could argue either one as the number one but i, I, I it's it's been this one for a while so in terms of straightforward songs i said rapture is their second best straightforward song i think their best straightforward song is dominate that -na 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 like there's a relentless attack with that like a like a hornet swarm and um really really good stuff uh um the the um the core the, you know the the chorus lick and uh like all, like it's really 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 good um so that one is just direct stuff oh uh, where the slime lives certainly a reason that people have problems with this album i i think this song is very good um, this is there, and, and what this song has, Marty was talked before about David Vincent as a personality. And, um, so David Vincent as a personality, um, 
uh, I'll, I'll say this about him. He is a commanding presence. I, you know, I saw them with him live and I was like, this guy is commanding in a way that Jared and um, Steve Tucker are not. I feel like David Vincent, I probably would not want to meet him and I would not want to introduce him to my family. Um, he has a different thing going on. It's a little bit rock star and certainly um, and certainly a little bit like maybe punchy in the jaw because he just feels like it. So that, like, again, like it's not like I look at all celebrities and like, oh, how likable, how approachable are they? Uh, and I've dealt, you know, very directly with with a bunch of very famous people during the course of my life. And it's not like the down to earth thing isn't the biggest thing. But I think when Marty was talking about his presence and stuff like that, it's here. And so a song like Where the Slime Live, uh, and I enjoy the, the evil laughing that probably turns a lot of people off. But like that song has there is a swagger going on with that song. The brana. Ma, 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 ma. there's like a, a, again like the, the, like these dudes don't give two shits if you care i really really hate tj just commented but i hit the whoa 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 part that fucking drives me crazy I, it's like so, god i hate this song i don't really like this song. It's, you're you're seeing a little bit of of the, <laughs> the david vincent to come and the David Vincent that we don't enjoy, like that was like his future goatee dye thing is like right. starting to really you're infect. Glimpses of that and that wo- and that moment you pointed out is the is this worst vocal moment in that song. But it's a song that I think is loaded with a lot of really good and more musical phrases. And and there's a, there's and they're doing interesting stuff with the production. They they have like that thing where they've scooped out. I think it's 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 maybe it's scooping out the highs and lows, but it sounds like it's processed through a radio. There's just real, there's real heft in it. And um, all of that, like all of that stuff, um, when it, like, when it like, when it just sort of gradually steps up the tempo and like, and it just starts to take off. And like, to me, these are dudes like more co- like cohesive as a band and feeling their material more uh, in the way that like, when I was talking about like Lion's Den and Sworn to Black, to me, I, I mean, those songs are better than this song. I'll, I'll put this somewhere in like the top 15 or so for them, but I really like this song. Uh, then we get um, uh, Eyes to See, Ears to Hear. So um, I feel that this thing, like, so Eric Rattan, like his his impact on this album is huge because this to me just sounds like straight up what Eric Rattan would be. So this is kind of like next level dissonance. The like it just sounds like totally out of tune i don't know what's going on we're, we're playing a guitar someone pulled it up from the bottom of the ocean plugged it in here it is um but it has that six eight push so it has a lot of momentum carrying it through that um the um the verse vocals are very well phrased um and then that kind of the evil the the eyes to see what the other things that is like that kind of dynamic stuff i feel that they're just thinking more music like the vocal aspect is getting more musically interesting and at some point like the whoa 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 thing that you mentioned which i do not like uh um, they're they're it's not like they're 100 percent successes but you're also i think getting an overall the most colorful and interesting vocal performance um the 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 solos in this. I'm going to assume the one that I really like. The section I really like the best is is Eric Rattan, and uh, and he's doing all the like the kind of the, like those sort of gestures and with the wah wah. The conclusion is really sharp. That's that I that's that's up there. That's definite top fifteen, maybe top ten. Really enjoy that thing. Um, then you get melting, uh, which is also this was written completely by Eric Rattan. Um, and that's fine. This is an interlude sort of thing. Uh, it's kind of cool. They brought a new guy into the band and let go, let loose some of the reins, you know? Yeah, no, I'm going to tell you, like my two favorite albums are albums where there's another guy who I think is like 30% responsible for why it's so good. Um, so nothing but fear. Um, this is a song where I'll say like, I think the sum is less than, um, or the whole is less than uh, the sum of the parts or whatever. This has a lot of good riffs. The arrangements never quite uh, made sense to me on this. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're getting a look. This is this is a rattan thing. Um, uh, aggressive tune. Uh, Dawn of the Angry. 
this is in the top six my favorite songs of the band ever like this this is like this is just an anthem like this is a definitive morbid angel song and they're not necessarily giving you it's not that often that you get this straightforward of an amazing tremolo lick from them I feel like Behemoth probably has like five or six songs trying to do this and once or twice getting close. But um, that it's just it just feels like this excellent evil march. It is an incredible song. And um, and then in the vocal phrases that like the, the no long can we wait, like the no longer can we wait stuff is great. The flow is really good. The post chorus, the sickly recapitulation. Um, with the really like sickening harmonies is uh, is is really really good, um, and then the bump 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 dun 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 dun, dun. like it just feels like a band that is that is is it, there's a synergy in this song like in Sworn of Black you know Lions Den in some of these great song like their best songs where you just really sense like. You can feel like I, I, you, you're sensing that swagger and the synergy of, of these musicians. And uh, the ending is really, really good. Um, uh, so that's top. That's that's one of the six the six great songs from them. Uh, this means war. Eric Rutan, another another song by him. I feel like the implacable like assault. Um, like I feel this is hate eternal. Like hate eternal is this means war. The band. Uh, and Hate Eternal has some songs that are better than this one, and I really like those first two Hate Eternal albums, and then the one, The Phoenix from the Ashes, uh, or whatever that one was called. I think those those three are real, uh, those three are really good. Particularly, A King of All Kings, I think, is the best. Um, but um, like the fast songs on Altars, but it's just better. It's just the flow is better, and I think him working with another uh, Trey Trey working with another guitarist of this caliber who's like just feeling the music this much. It's great. Um, the uh, the departure in it's really, really good. That's a top 20 song. Um, get to Caesar's Palace. So here we're getting a little bit more like the world building giant sort of stuff. The, 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 you get the, like the chimes at the beginning. And then the, this feels like you, you are, uh, you are like rousing the beast. It's an unhappy beast. It's a cranky beast, but that whole intro with the um uh with like the twin leads just a huge huge thing uh the only my only chop on this song um is the phrase that it's a typhoid celebration it's my least favorite vocal <laughs> phrase on it other than that woo woo thing it's just a little it's a typhoid celebration i uh, no thank you but i don't think it's bad uh, the whole thing holds together and it goes through a lot of it. Like it's like a two minute intro to this song of like of guitar ideas. Um, then, then you, then there's uh dreaming interlude thing uh, inquisition burn with me here. You're hearing like, I, I don't know if David Vincent has like said, like Rob zombie is an influence. Um, the singing is a bit dumb. Here. No, really? That <laughs> really? Yeah. We'll, we'll see more of that later. Won't we? Anyway, um, so um, it's I enjoy that song. It is it is it is a step down, um, and then we get uh, like another of my favorite songs by this band ever, written entirely by Eric Rutan, uh, "Hate Work." Uh, I mean, that is just, that's like that's, that that to me is 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 like a is like summoning in a death metal. Uh, really? In a, yeah. That that whole like the 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 uh, the military snare stuff and the way like the horns the bum, 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 like the way all of that stuff stuff comes in the singing is massive. Uh, if I've got to pick my favorite line in, in David Vincent's history, it's and the turmoil comes. It's that it's it's incredible. Like that aside, like that's like that's like Dio's looking over and saying, "Man, that was that was off the cuff and it was great." Um, <laughs> So that stuff is 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 terrific. Um, the and it's just it just feels like it just feels like a guitar orchestra. The like all of that stuff, and then the high synth development. Like this again. Like I, uh, Marty, you got me into summoning. It's it's uh, I I think they're great. They recorded 
several of my favorite black metal albums ever. This is this is the death metal equivalent. This song, um, and and my my favorite thing ever by Eric Rutan. Uh, and it's an excellent song, uh, you know, to end it out. A lot of variety. I like every song on the album. A couple I don't think are maximized, but uh, you know, hate work. Yeah, so there's a lot of really there's a lot of really good stuff on here. So um, uh, my favorite my favorite album by them. And really, uh, okay. Uh, oh, some written for uh, the band. Uh, okay, I could I could see that. Like it's it's huge. It's a gigantic thing. Like I don't know that they have many songs that approach that bigness. Maybe no songs that approach that bigness. I mean, what, like when the guitars come in, it sounds like it's like ten guitars. Uh, but really, really amazing stuff. The horns, the high synth developments, like use of synthesizers in this song is an apex. Uh, so it's a lot, you know, uh, again, like let's credit Trey for letting uh, letting Rutan shine this much on the album. He really wrote a wrote a bunch of great stuff and, and contributed well. So my, my favorite album by the band, uh, Domination, though, my second favorite is really close. All right. Well, a couple things. First of all, finally. We have a back cover where you can actually read the song titles. Uh, the two that led up to this album. You can yeah. kind of, but um, <laughs> I mean, really? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and also, you know, kudos to whoever let their 13-year-old sister make the cover for this one. You know, pink pentagrams and green little phallic images in the background. You know, great. Whatever. It isn't good. It's not a good cover. Um, no. The color scheme, all of it. The band photos, not, none of the design element of this. Oh, the, the bizarrely green CD. There's no attention to aesthetic on this here. It's just a train wreck of a, 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 a design. Um, again, this is my number five album. I like this album. I like it a lot. Um, where the Slime Live has always been, you know, they're trying to capitalize on the God of emptiness vibe and it's cool. It's a weird slithering kind of guitar riff, but you know, there's like a, a hint of Vincent to come the whoa, whoa, whoa bullshit. I hate that so much. It makes it ruins that song for me. Eyes to see is a good song. Um, nothing but fear is probably my favorite. Great song. Good, fast one. Dawn of the angry again, he's such a charismatic front man. He just, he's really settled into this very confident singing style that works so well. And there, and I think this is the album I was noticing today. The bass lines on here are great. They're just, he's a great bass player. He's a great singer. It's really, he's very much morbid angel at this point, as far as the outward appearance of it. Um, Trey is obviously the machine that writes these weird angular riffs. Um, I like this record a lot. I liked it a lot when it came out. I spun it a lot, but revisiting their catalog, I never grab it. This is never the first one I grab. It's the first three usually. Uh, oh, well, that's not true. Two after this one, I grab a lot too. But um, this is a great record, but it just doesn't. Um, it just doesn't have the impact. The Covenant does. They're starting to move into a, and the production is solid, but again, it's starting to get a weird, clean vibe. Morbid Angel in a in a um, a major label environment, left with a, a large recording budget. They get they do weird. They make weird choices, man. I mean, death metal is very a very distorted medium. You know, their debut, it's distorted but clear. Their second album, it's mostly clear and weird, and they're, 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 this is just an oddly produced record for me. It fits what they're doing. It sounds like Morbid Angel. It sounds really good, but it's bizarre. It's very bizarre. This is kind of a bizarre record for me. That's why it's number five. Um, I like it. It just hasn't held up over the years for me. What was that? There was a comment you put up about the slime edition. Do I do you, either of you know what that is? Yeah, the uh, there's a slime edition that came out where the the disc is like in this pack. It's like got like a, a green ooze in it. Oh, okay. And apparently the the ooze, the slime ended up being toxic, and so they had to pull them. So if you own one of those um, slime packet editions, they were recalled or whatever. Don't drink or 
don't touch the slime. It will probably make your dick fall off or something. The music is exactly <laughs> the same, right? There's no, there aren't any like hidden tracks or other, other, other little mm -hmm. gems from. The I don't think so. It was just a. I think it was a promo yeah. item. Maybe I could be wrong about that, but I think it was supposed to be like a. Yeah, like you know, one of those goofy early promo things to help, you know, like the blood packs for the Slayer. Um, they have Slimer from the Ghostbusters also promoting. <laughs> that that, that was, was kind of the idea, I think. Yeah. There was also a Necrophagia disc that came out in a blood pack, too, which who cares? Anyway, <laughs> um, Alan, your thoughts on domination? I'm going to go use the little boys room one more time. No, it will not be a shirt. I'll be back. Let's hope that's not slimy because if so, you're going to need to see a doctor. <laughs> It is. It's great. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, we're on the D. <clears throat> and this album, yeah, has kind of a weird reputation, like Marty said. And it is kind of a weird album. Um, it, it got a lot of, yeah, you know, kind of, you know, derision at the time because of the Slime song. Um, but personally, I like the album overall quite a bit. It. it, it focuses a little bit more again on that, that lurch core sound compared to covenant here they're gearing it down uh more often and that again is the sound i really dig jack thank you uh very much appreciate that <coughs> i'm glad to have you in the chat jack's always uh really really on par with all the uh <coughs> cool bits of extra knowledge that the rest of us don't know so thanks for all the uh all the insights tonight jack but yeah domination for me is a very good album in their catalog. I think I tend to like it more than a lot of folks seem to um, like the pacing overall dominate. I mean, comes out right away and is a pretty forceful track. Uh, and then you have where the slime live, which personally I like the track. I like that. It's got that sludgy sound. I like the lurching structures to it. Y yes. You know, the could be silly. They don't bother me for whatever reason. They, I understand why you know, for some folks like Marty and TJ, maybe they're, yeah, it's a turnoff, but it doesn't bother me at all. Um, yeah, they, I'm just, you know, it keeps going through, you know, interesting transitions in a way. It feels a little bit like blessed are the sick to me, where then you've got, you know, the kind of, you know, you know, dreamy instrumental, and then you go to, you know, nothing but fear and they're working through different styles. Only the songs all have their own identity, uh, identity, uh, agree with Craig. Yeah. Dawn of the angry. That's one of the big monster standouts, uh, for the album. I uh, like that one a ton. Caesar's Palace. Yeah, it's got, it's a very strange song. I like it, but it's got that very long, it shouldn't work. It's got this overly right. long introduction where it sounds like, I don't know, kids going up and down on a roller coaster or something. Yeah, so it's the sound yeah they're in there. Those, those ah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's very strange. Uh, it's the kind of thing that sh should turn me off of the song but it holds up very well um i feel like i skipped a song somewhere but uh thanks oh, jack. I, I used yeah. to see ears to hear yeah still you know a good song there. I, used to see. I don't know if folks mentioned yeah. inquisition burn with me but i like that one you know towards the end it's very good uh, the one place i have to diverge with craig is the closer hate work that song it yeah. doesn't come together for me. That I one, don't like that song either. That, that's the one time it feels like, yeah, that's the experiment where they're going just maybe a little too far out of the box for my comfort zone. It starts out okay. I, I do like, you know, they're starting with, like you said, Craig, with like, you know, the military snares and stuff. Like, okay, this is going to be a little different, a little interesting. But then it kind of just drifted in a direction I don't care for. So, um, yeah, it, can, I can skip the last song on this one. But be, other than that, uh, it's a very strong, consistent album. Dig most of the tracks on it quite a lot. Uh, I mentioned earlier that al the albums I've got ranked three, four, and five are pretty interchangeable. Um, on this particular date in history, I've got Domination ranked as third. So one step higher than Covenant. Those two could flip flop places real easy. So before you start typing in the chat, how can you have this ranked higher than Covenant? A, it's we're getting into coin flip territory here. Um, <laughs> albums three, four. I, and five. I would say that's your 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 uh, your you're a professor and you have ears. That's how you could have dominate. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you could have, you know. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it for me is you know again you know. Covenant, while you know it's very tight, very focused, in a lot of ways you could say there are things about it that are better. It is an album that focuses, you know, a little more on the aggressive side. Domination focuses a little more on the lurch core side. 
Uh, and for Morbid Angel, I, I, I'm always going to pick the Lurch Core over, you know, the Blast. So that's why I've got it third and Covenant fourth. But we're at a point, too. We're four albums deep in their catalog. And all of these albums are very good. We have not mentioned anything yet that is even average or above average. All of these are strong albums. Uh, a, a, B, C, and D in the band is absolutely still killing it. I think, though, for it to be fair, in a lot of people's estimation, this D may be about the point where some people started feeling uneasy or starting to lose some interest or worrying about the band's uh, consistency. But at least for me, they're still uh, absolutely on point here. And uh, yes, the answer, where, uh, where do the slime live? They live in my nose this week. <laughs> Stupid fucking angiosperms. Take your pollen and go evolve someplace else. Well, that's naughty. Uh, <laughs> with right. that, uh, yes, so we're through D. And um, well, there's technically E. Craig, do you want to say anything about E? We also skipped the Leibach remixes if anybody has them. Folks have been chatting about those. Um, Eric uh, Bauer and some folks were chatting about the lie box in uh, the chat earlier tonight. But yeah, yeah. Craig, if you've got uh, anything you'd like to say about it, I, no, I, I think it, I think it's fine. I've I've listened to this a couple of times. Uh, I don't think anything is better. They slow down the tempo nicely for the evil in your face with blasphemy. Uh, this is worth noting, I suppose. This is on like the domination tour. They played dominate. End of songs included from Domination. So that, to me, is kind of annoying. Um, uh, it's fine. Like, it's... it's what, what I, uh, An aside that I will say uh, in, in terms of this band as a live prospect, they're good live. And I've seen yeah. them with, 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 with three different vocalists. They were the last time I saw them, which was with Cannibal Corpse and Necrot. And this was like uh, 2019 or early 2020. It was like not long before the shutdown. And... and uh, and it was so the lineup of the new drummer uh, and uh, this this Van Dam. I forgot the guy's name. Something close to Van Dam, but not Van Dam. Uh, and um, and and Tucker and stuff like that. They were really disconnected in terms of like they could have been four guys in four different rooms playing to screens. Like just nothing. Like it's not. I'm not saying like oh they were sloppy. There's just no sense of these guys playing with each other are enjoying that. And sometimes I've seen them and I've sensed that more than other times. They're doing a job. Yeah. Like it's a doing a job. And, and um, uh, so like, this is, this is worth like, you know, I've seen Morbid Angel multiple times. I'm seeing them next week. Um, and uh, also worth noting, they played, uh, I don't, I maybe one song from the David Vincent era or maybe nothing. Like it was entirely so, and for me that that's like I like I like a bunch of the newer stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get we'll get there in moments. Whoa, but whoa, this, whoa. Is band, <laughs> this is a man that can pull it off live, like and and like in the conversation of Carcass or Morbid Angel is my two favorite death metal bands. That's a plus in the Morbid Angel column. I've seen them many times live, and I'm seeing them next week. Carcass I saw twice. Everything is worse live. Like the vocals are like fifty percent in general, maybe sixty percent. He should just sing, dedicate a dedicate, hire a guy to play bass and and sing, because all of his vocals come up. See, it's funny you say that because uh, Megadeth, Dave Mustaine should hire a, a guy to sing and play just play guitar. They're, I don't know where they're at now, but there's some there's some truth that I've seen them pull off things in like a higher percentile that like Carcass to me as as like a live band. Um, as I said, like I've seen them twice. That's it. I don't think I'm going to see them again. Uh, and, uh, and they're, they're, they're also playing in the city in, in the next couple weeks. Uh, it's just like, everything is worse. Like everything sounds weaker. And also because carcass outside of the first album has great production. So their stuff is not going to sound as good live. Whereas like morbid angel, I feel has some questionable production. So sometimes hearing it roaring from the speakers, particularly something on blessed, you know, on blessed, uh, can 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 be an improvement. So as an album, this is fine. Like it's, I think it's worth having. I put it on on occasion to kind of hear these songs in a different order. There's not a song on here. Where I'm like, oh wow, that's that, that's better than the studio version, or even as good. But it's really it's respectable. They are a solid live band and good to see live. Um, the way uh, the way uh, uh, like Cannibal Corpse, I think live pulls it off. And Chrisune. 
Christian actually can't occasionally would outperform stuff. I'm seeing them in uh, in Manhattan. I'm seeing them. It's I think it's 11th. I think it's like next Tuesday. Uh, so I'm going. I'm going to that show. Uh, but enjoy them in Albany. So um, 1998. Let's go to this thing. This puzzling cover. This <laughs> this Salvador Dali's brain jammed in a computer. Whatever this is. Um, I, for the most, I haven't commented much on these covers. I think the first one, if you got rid of some of the comedy faces, would be really good. Other than that, I don't really like their armor. I, I don't. If you just use like old artwork and just recycle it, eh, I, I'd rather some dude is doing a sketch. Frankly, like uh, that, that's not that's not my thing. Um, uh, I mean, you know, like how many dudes are just going to take Hieronymus Bosch and you know, like all that stuff works. Every Hieronymus Bosch painting can become a cover. Uh, so Formula is Fatal to the Flesh. This is a bit of a, corre a course correction, which I don't ever think is um, – I, I think it's rare that the album that I identify as a course correction is uh, is ever a favorite of mine. And there's that. Yes, I, don't, there. I don't get it. I, I just don't get it. <laughs> there, is, there is that. I mean, this album, I, I think – if you wondered, because David, so David Vincent is gone. This is the first Steve Tucker album. So I think whatever Dave Vincent had in terms of charisma and personality and part of like representing the band as a lead singer, an occasional songwriter, and um, uh, and, and, and longtime lyricist, now he's out of the way and you're getting, you're just, you, like Trey is like 200% crazy. Like it's just it's all of the crazy right now. Like I, I feel it's I feel I feel it's like there's nothing holding it back from from this from this cover to the to the four outros on the album. Like, <laughs> so um, I I enjoy this album. As I said, like with one exception, I like the entire uh, every album in the catalog. Some are kind of like above average. And some are some are good, and, and, and some are great. I, I'll put this in the um, uh, the good camp. I I, I like it. Um, I rate it sixth in the catalog. Um, this album I find a little bit harder to retain. The production seems super clogged. I've never quite understood this production. Um, there are uh, particularly like when Hellspawn comes in number eight. The volume, like it's like this might be the worst mastered album. It's the worst mastered album I've discussed on this show. But like the loudness jump when it goes to Hell Spawned, it's like it's gigantic. Like it, it is a huge jump. So to me, I've always felt like the mix and mastering on this album was messed up. This is something I'd love to see remixed. We see all these classic albums with great sounds remixed here. Um, you, you, here, I'll, I'll pay 25 bucks, 30 bucks, 40 bucks, special edition, remix this shit. Certainly you can remaster it so that there aren't like, so that it isn't like a spike of sound. Dude, this, this sounds like fucking Dark Side of the Moon compared to Kingdom's Disdain. Holy well, shit. We will, we will get there. We will get there. <laughs> so, um, uh, the first song is pretty good. I think, I think that it is, it's one of these things where, I feel you got a bunch of good parts. It's like, oh, it's not this riff. It's not this riff. I enjoy them all. It never feels cohesive. And like it's 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 turning into that entity as like a song. The way it like, you know, Sworn of Black, Lion's Den, Hate Work, God of Emptiness, um, Blasphemy, Chapel of Ghouls. Like Heaving Earth, it's like it's a bunch of enjoyable parts arranged in sequence. Hard to recall uh, for me outside of it. Like where I can sing these other riffs, air guitar, drums, stuff like that. This is a little bit that that sort of thing. Uh, second song, uh, Prayer of Hatred, one of the highlights on the album. A uh, really enjoyable song. Um, and uh, this has, this ha like at, at a minute and a half, it goes into this kind of lurch course where it's like, ch 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 and you get this wailing, like, like this held note um, that, that a bit, you know, like in, in some ways shows you a little bit where they're going on the next album. Um, so this tune is really strong. And I think um, uh, like shows them in that mid paced mode. Uh, and then it turns into something like I'll call cosmic watercolor, where it's like, and it's like all these little fills. 
and then these held open cords uh and uh it's it's pretty interesting that that stuff is awesome and um that 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 i'll probably put that tune in the top 25 for them really enjoy it um but sorry so a, a point that i meant to make earlier i feel there's this album is a little bit lopsided weighted towards aggression and i don't know if that is if that's the course correction from the previous album and certainly the divisive things like you know where the slime live and and hate work and some of the other stuff that that's courting you know someone could say selling out or mainstream or whatever i like the variety i, I don't i don't care um but i feel that th this is a little bit extra aggressive and to the point where some of it becomes a little bit less memorable but that prayer of hatred is really really good and um uh so it's like if they're having to prove themselves and prove that they're really like it's just like i didn't like when blind guardian was, was doing it so much uh with carcass i think like surgical steel that's a good album torn arteries i think is a very good album and Surgical Steel, I felt, was like, oh, they're proving that they still have it, that they're not just in the swan song mode. Um, and then the one after it, I thought they're exploring creatively what they want to explore. And I think that parallel holds with this band and formulas and gateways. Um, uh, so Bill Ursag, uh, decent. Uh, nothing is not. Um, giant volume jump on that one. That's the first time where you're assaulted with like what sounds like a mistake master uh but it's got some cool it's got some really good Dude, I, th I really bet that trey sent notes saying do this do that do this in the mastering because it's there's a lot of bonkers shit going on anyway go ahead there's a lot of bonkers shit going on but it's weird yeah. i mean that's something that's like a classic live band trick of like you know notching up notching up the, the you know notching up the volume on the mix board live yeah. so by the end of your show you're much louder than you were at the beginning yeah um and uh so but these are jumps nothing is not comes in and that thing feels like decibels louder than the previous one um this has a this has that cool lurch core swagger like a little bit where the slime live um you got something that's almost like a saint vitus lick with a harmonic pinch um the uh and then there this has a slowdown at the end that is again feels like slam before slam was a genre uh, that any that anyone knew anything about. I mean, I guess that Pyrexia sermon of mockery, which is awesome by the way, though the only album by that band I've ever got into, like that, you know, whatever, like that's in that's in that world, but not this deliberate um, in terms of stretching the riff. So that thing is really cool. Um, uh, Chamber of Dis. Um, yeah, this fe this feels like a little bit like we're going to give you an alters cut, and it could have been on alters, um, but it wouldn't have been one of the highlight cuts. It wouldn't have been you know Chapel of Ghouls or Blasphemy or Evil Spells. It wouldn't have been one of the ones that I could you know like you know kind of kind of take or leave. Uh, so that's fine, but that to me feels like designed for that purpose. Like we're going to show you that we can get heavy. Uh, disturbance uh, in the great slumber. It's, it sounds like winter sit, synth. In, in, in a way, it sounds a little bit like uh, like they're taking a stab at the mer merciful fate, um, like the merciful fate sound. Then we get to this next thing that I, pro I, I, I like. Who knows how to pronounce this? The Uma Lama Rahaba. Th this thing. Um, there's some really cool like lurch core stuff going on here. This feels a little bit like a patchwork tune. I just don't feel the flow here. And in general, this is a thing that differentiates it from the album that was before and the album that's after, where I, I think a lot of that flow isn't there. And I don't know how this album was written. Marty, I don't know if you know, like if it was like Trey had a ton of this stuff, he got Tucker. I don't know the the I have no the, idea. The behind the scenes. I just learned recently. That like Tucker left the band, came back, left the band. Came, like I didn't know that there were that he left before Heretic until recently, and then he. No, came I didn't back. know that. I didn't know. Right. Idea. So there's like a whole. There's like there are ins and outs of this band. I don't know. This song to me feels like there is a very good version of it, but it's not what we have. I get and, the impression that Trey is a difficult personality to deal with. Yeah. But that, anyway. that, well, the worst interview I ever did for Metal Maniacs was my interview with him. But I, I, let's put it this way. I asked some confrontational questions and, and, and was, was critical some of some of the stuff I've been critical of this evening. That's not the way to set a good interview. So I got, <laughs> no, I got, I got 
some shitty responses, but I asked some shitty questions and I am to blame for it. At the same time, some of these answers were completely like baffling comedy. Like I don't <laughs> know why. It's like, okay, he's just not going to take it seriously because I criticized that the, the drums are too triggered and they aren't in sync. Um, and that maybe there are too many intros and interludes. It's all stuff I believe. You just don't. Put, you just shouldn't put that in the outgoing questions to the artist. Oh yeah, you got to keep. You got to keep some of these comments to yourself, and just... Yeah, or just put it in the heading and not actually directly. <laughs> right. So right. it was like. I, I mean, I, I said, "What's your favorite H.P. Lovecraft uh, song in that interview, uh, or uh, your favorite H.P. Lovecraft story in that interview?" It's like I've never read H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> Which I find really hard to believe Trey Attic Toad has never read H.P. Lovecraft, considering his last name is an H.P. Lovecraft creature. I, I could just see the, the room. Hi, my name is S. Craig Zoller. You don't know me, but this is what I think of all the fuck-ups you've done in your music. And he's right. going to be like, so, fuck it, off. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was also, there's no context in that way, because it was, it was one of the few, like, email interviews I did, and it was oh. bad. It was, it was but, but again, like, he gave silly answers. I asked some aggressive questions. The fault is mine. That doesn't change the fact that I had an interaction with him where I'm agreeing with your assessment of he is probably a weird dude. And I had like a couple of these questions uh, early on that wasn't um, like that, like that, you know, that, that, that didn't land. Um, so, um, so this is just a question of like, well, I don't always know. remember with interviews, a little bit of sugar helps the medicine go down. That's all I got to say. Sure, sure. <laughs> And, you know, when I say this and I'm like, this is one of my two favorite death metal bands of all time. So it wasn't like, it's not like I'm, I'm there to assassinate him. But as I was trying to get Iron Maiden to get rid of Bruce Dickinson and have Dennis Stratton come in as the singer, <laughs> I was also hoping that Pete Sandoval would be replaced. Right. So uh, like, I, like I, I, I come as fans of both of those bands. <laughs> But also critical of, of some of their personality. Hey, Bruce, this is why I think Dennis, sweet Dennis Stratton should be oh, the fucking yeah. vocalist. Uh, what do you think of this comment? Or Paul Mario Day. <laughs> so, Bruce, I hear Samson's getting back together. You wanna, why don't you go hang out with those guys again? Yeah. Put yeah. yeah. on your sweet. leather thong, be Bruce Bruce again? Bruce yeah, Bruce. Bruce Bruce, get some sweet thunderstick action. <laughs> Oh man, his high hat. No, nobody is- should get sweet thunderstick action. Oh. In that, that, that's his that's, high hat. Their work on 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 head on is legendary. I'm really digressing. Did you so, have, did you you didn't happen to hit up Bruce Bruce about those lyrics on head on? Did you? That would have been interesting. Oh, take it like a man. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Vice versa. Vice versa. <laughs> yeah. Oh my like god. A man. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite Bruce Dickinson performance ever. His voice sounds great. Oh, he's man. great. He sounds great. He's great. He great. Um, anyway, back to Morbid Angel. Sorry. Really um, so, How Spawn the Rebirth. Um, back crazy. to a band with a different guy in rubber clothing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think the song is stupid. Like, it's just the, uh, it's over, it's way overproduced. And this is why I ask, like, if anybody knows the lore here. Because this sounds a little bit like someone's going insane in the studio with like all the crazy, like all that crazy overproduced vocal stuff um, is 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 really not good. Um, don't like that song. Um, uh, Covenant of Death. Um, you get a cool like tremolo, like evil speed thing um, in there. Uh, uh, there's a there's a nice like stumble riff departure, some happy stuff in there, um, and then it gets awesome. So this is why this is a puzzling thing. Like at about three minutes in, this song becomes incredible. Um, the you're getting, uh, and this is this, actually like for the part of my interview with with Trey that wasn't a disaster. He, <laughs> I was asking him about heretic stuff. And he just said, like, he has a goal as a songwriter, the idea of playing two songs at the same time, uh, which in the rock spectrum, I'd say, was probably best achieved in the remixed edition of Thrack by King Crimson. Um, but uh, Morbid Angel does it, where sometimes you're getting, you'll, you'll, in, you'll, in one speaker, it's a tremolo riff, and the other, it's, a, it's like all these bunched up triplets. And uh, so, like, three minutes in, the, you're getting, you start getting, like, these counterpoints, um, the, 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 it completely opens up and then it gets into this like clean section. The bass comes to the fore. 
the like the chasm opens up. This song is really good. Uh, the beginning is the beginning is kind of pretty good, but this one really ramps it up. And it's not the only time this happens on the album where something just starts out pretty good and then gets really really special. Um, then we get him to a gas giant, um, which uh, sounds a little bit like a like a Joey DeMaio squiggly like like squiggly bass guitar. So that's fine. It's moody enough. Um, and then we get, uh, depending on whether you read the back of the album or the inside of the album, invocation of the continual one or great invocation of the continual one. Maybe they thought that was too immodest. Um, uh, really like uh, nice, big, like mid paced riff, uh, dual lead vocals, which is okay. Like I prefer just the deeper stuff like Tucker, I'll say on this album, Tucker, I think in general, people are like, he's pretty good. And I don't have a different opinion on that. Like, I don't think anyone's listening to Tucker on this album saying, wow, this guy's great. Wow, this guy's special. But this is also the material. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm not faulting Steve Tucker for that. I think this material is pretty busy. And I don't know how much a hand he had in, 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 in really, like, conceiving the vocal lines and, uh, and and where it would go. So so that song has like dual lead vocals and then the drink, drink blood, the blood of the ancients, you get some, there's some really nice, like kind of revving up of the riffs. Uh, and then the song comes to like, it's, it's all like pretty good stuff, except for some random speed up at four minutes, 50 seconds. And then it comes to a dead stop. I don't know how many times I've heard this album. I've heard this album less than the other albums we've discussed, but I always think the song is over. And then this song becomes great uh, and is, is a harbinger of things to come. Uh, that Like the, the come centaur, the key change for the solo at like the, like the seven minute, 55 minute uh, mark. So maybe the longest song in the band's catalog. The solo is great. My, my favorite Trey solo ever. Uh, so this is probably like a top 20 soon for them. Um, and then we get like five minutes of synthesizer songs. Like, uh, th it's fine. Like S sent through the spheres. This is written by Sandoval. Um, this feels like what the club plays when they want to let you know the club is closed. Um, <laughs> don't really have Hymnos Rituals de Guerra. Um, this sounds a little bit like that thing that Mayhem uses with the toms. Uh, and, and this sounds like the intro, like Morbid Angel is about to start. So it's strange. You get the get out of the club and then the Morbid Angel is about to start. And then you get like the, the, the trooper thing, um, feels like the tame end outro on like a power electronics album. That's just assaulted you. And then wants to give you a little bit of place to clear your ears in that headspace. So it's not like the, it's an abomination that these three things happen, but it's five minutes of, of nothing good. Um, following the highlight cut that they just should have ended on, uh, and, and, and my favorite, uh, Trey solo ever. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's where this thing lands. And as I, I think I said at the beginning, this ranks number six on the list for me. All right. I think I'm just going to start this off by saying, um, Steve Tucker had big shoes to fill coming into this position. He just did. No one sounds like David Vincent. He's got a very charismatic uh, presentation, a very confident presentation, as I've stated numerous times. Steve Tucker is not going to be the same singer Dave Vincent is. Um, but he he fills two roles. He's, he, he fills the bass. He does the vocals. And he, he's got a good voice. It's a more on the brutal side of death metal. There's a little bit of character. He is... You can understand what he's saying most of the time. So he fits in the Morbid Angel aesthetic quite well. Um, yeah, I'm left wanting a little bit on this record with his vocal performance, but it's still good. It's still good. And uh, I think TJ mentioned earlier he never connected with this record. I didn't either. I got it when it came out. I never connected with this record and listening to it again this week. I listened to it. I like it. It's heavy. It sounds like Morbid Angel. It doesn't bother me. Um, but there's nothing on here that really, I mean, Craig really did the extra, the extra work on here that I did not, did not, would not do. What weird this come out? 98. 
98, I'm still in a black metal uh, frame of mind. I'm still listening to Morbid Angel on occasion. Of course, I'm interested to check out the album because Steve is a new singer. But um, this album, it sounds like Morbid Angel. It doesn't blow me away. It just seems kind of like a chaotic mess. Another transitional record, yes. Uh, you're coming off of a, a very success, a commercially successful record like Domination. You kick out your <laughs> your singer and you get a new singer. And what label? They go from uh, Giant Records to Back to Earache on this one. So it's an aggressive record. It sounds like Morbid Angel. It's not their best work. It's six for me as well. Um, I'm going to have to take Zoller's word for it on a lot of these songs. Like I said, I listened to it again this week. Again, I didn't really connect with it. So, yeah, that was formulas for me. <clears throat> All right. Um, it, it, one, also, one, just one heard. general thing about the lack of connection. It is, and, and again, I think this is a bit of a course correction from domination, which obviously I believe they need not make uh, and, and shouldn't have made. It is noticeably lacking in those giant memorable hooks in the vocal. Yep. Yeah. Very like, much so. They're, they're never there on this no. album. I don't think there's one. He's more of a brutal singer. He's a different type of singer. It, well, and I mean, and I mean, the, the music that he's singing over, to be fair, is more aggressive, less hooky. It's not a hooky record. Yeah, it's, no, it, it is definitely not. And it's hard to colorize something that's kind of more heads down, brutal attack, you know. Sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, Alan. Please. Please oh, no, no. Good point. Very good point. Yeah, when this came out, I didn't even hear it when it came out. You know, by 98, I was more than done with this style of death metal. I was still mining through a lot of older 80s stuff and also, you know, working my way more and more into black metal stuff. So, yeah, I, I had no interest in this when it came out. <laughs> uh <clears throat> Things to say here with formulas. I played I replayed it a couple of times this week. This was one I wanted to spend a little more time with, but I again have been sick. I haven't been getting a lot of sleep up coughing, so my sleep schedule and thus my whole routine has been way off this week. Didn't get to play this as much as I wanted to, but I did revisit it a couple of times. Um it's certainly not a bad album. It's not like you know, quality has fallen way off here or anything. Um but to your all's points, yeah, there's not a ton of memorable moments necessarily either. There aren't the big standout hooks or, you know, tracks that, you know, just you latch on to really fast. The production is kind of weird. It's not horrible, but um, it's a little different. Takes a little getting used to. I think the thing that throws me off the most about this album is the... the tr I don't like the track list, the way that it's put together. Because you've got all these instrumentals crammed into the last handful of songs. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at it right now, and let's see, you have like five songs in a row starting the disc off, just you know, normal, straightforward, more you know, aggressive leaning, morbid angel, you know, with a new singer. Oh, yeah, okay, he's not David Vincent, but he's certainly not bad. Um, there, I don't think anyone could listen to this, and well, people could, I think you'd have to be an a pretty hardcore, you know, Vincent fanboy to totally want to rip on Tucker here because he's, you know, he, he's stepping in and, you know, doing a serviceable job for sure. But yeah, you go through five regular songs, you know, then you've got, you know, one of these short, you know, uh, instrumentals. That's the, uh, the disturbance of the great slumber, which is fine. Then three more songs, but then you get to instrumental song, instrumental, instrumental, instrumental. Who the fuck organizes their album this way? I this is just really, really weird. And these instrumental pieces, they are very kind of you know flighty, which is okay. I mean, Morbid Angel has done you know very different types of you know short interlude instrumental pieces before. But when you just stack them one after the other, and each one's kind of different from the previous one, and they're not kind of functioning as bridges or breaks between songs. They become very random. They, they, they just kind of lose any meaning. It's like, why do you have these here? You could just have stopped the album, not put those on there, and nothing would have been lost. I, I, someday in the future, when I have time, I'm going to sit down 
I'm going to put all these songs, you know, you know, into a playlist, and I want to see if I can find a way to reorganize this track list, where I space these instrumentals out a bit, and try to make this album fit together better. Uh, maybe it can be done. Maybe it can't. I have no idea. But I just, I really hate the way it's organized. Um, maybe these little short pieces could have worked in the context if you had one up there, like around track three or four to break up, you know, those first few songs. If you had one there in the middle, I just don't know. It, it really bugs me the way they assembled the album. Um, it may be, you know, maybe it's a nitpicky thing. Cause again, I'm not really, you know, ragging on the quote unquote real songs here. But it just gives the album a really odd kind of uh, uneven feeling. Like you've got this big wad of you know, metal tracks at the beginning, and then you just kind of kept going at the end. It's like the Lord of the Rings movie at the Return of the King. You just won't end the movie. He's like, no, no, no. We've got <laughs> here's another, another sad ending. Here's another sad ending. Here's another sad ending. Or, you know, here, here's yeah. another little snippet of music that we had there. My God, we re-recorded it. We're going to put it on here. Um just tack it on the end. I have, a um, question, I have a question for you because a lot of those are Sandoval. So this is I, this is a, just a, a suspicion or, or a, it's a question. I don't know. So obviously Sandoval is the other constant at this point in this band. Yep. It's Trey and that guy. So I, I've, I've wondered if him writing so many of these like wholly forgettable and um, interloops as they were uh, <laughs> is a way for him to have songwriting credits to guarantee some royalties to ensure him being with the band. I this is just a question. I don't know if this is the case, but I could see like that I could see anyone working with with Trey having some wonder about like their future and him having multiple songwriting credits on multiple albums that are just these interludes. It could be because well, he likes to do them and Trey says, "Well, you're great at doing your own version of Box Moonlight Sonata or whatever." But I, I wonder I wonder if that has anything to do with it, like that he has multiple mm. songwriting credits uh, and the way they're kind of shoved all at the end certainly doesn't seem like really like inclusive of like it's not like no. you're seeing them throughout. So I wonder if at that point he's the only other man standing from from, the, you know, from from Morbid Angel Alters. If, if there's something there, it's just a question. I don't know that that's. The and case. he was a guy that was brought in by David. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's an interesting point, Craig. I hadn't thought of that before. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure the royalties. But yeah, uh, I don't know. At some time, I, having said it out loud, I really do want to sit down and see if I can make that work. Because you know, it also makes me think. You know, what if they had done the same thing on "Blessed Are the Sick"? What if you'd taken all those little, you know, short interlude pieces from "Blessed Are the Sick" and you just crammed them at the end of that album? Would that album? feel like this one where those instrumentals lose their charm and kind of you know, lose their uh you know their actual functionality if, if they were just tracks you know 9 10 11 12 whereas on blessed with them being spaced out and kind of you know strategically placed they become a big part of that album maybe these could do the same thing uh, right. maybe, maybe that'll be you know my uh my my thing, maybe I'll get you know the uh, the fast food jacket that says you know you know uh, you know formulas you know for life, and I'm taking it back. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna make these uh these instrumental tracks work someday in a in a completely you know remixed track order of the album. I don't know. <laughs> I'm full of Sudafed right now. I've got weird ideas in my head. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, so yeah, bottom line, I, I've also got it ranked six. So hey, we're six 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 on this album. Hey, yeah, strangely appropriate. Um, I, I don't I think, think it's a bad well. album overall. I replaying the couple of times I got to replay it this week. I'm like, you know, I, I think if I spent a lot of time with this album, it would probably grow on me. I, I don't dislike what I'm hearing. A lot of time with it for it to start to make like it's it's one of these things because of the complexity. I I, mm -hmm. I think that's the case, and I don't love it, but. Um, if I listened to it once and then didn't listen to it for a year, I put it on again. It's still bewildering. But listening it to a few mm -hmm. times, I mean, it's the same thing with with some of the you know some of the King Diamond albums and how complex those are. Like listening mm -hmm. to it a few times in a, in a, in a short succession, like that's how you wrap your, or at least for me, how I wrap my mind around Abigail was like, oh, just like listen to I listened to it yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and then the next day, and then it's starting to gel. That album does not turn into Abigail qualitatively, but <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, but um, two nine and eleven. Yeah, yeah. You know, at some point, it's you know, 
I, it's the first one we've talked about that I don't own. And I am going to, you know, whenever I stumble onto it cheap, you know, this is, not, I'm not going around and buy it new, but uh, when I find this, you know, for like, you know, six or seven bucks in the used bin, I'm going to pick it up and I will give it some time because I, I think, you know, it's still a worthwhile album, but I'm going to work on that track list. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's a decent, you know, Steve Tucker obviously is kind of, you know, the main story here and, you know, he steps in, you know, and does Yeoman's work. Um, the, the band hasn't fallen off that much. Uh, it, it's the thing that bothers me more than anything is yes, just that weird running order of the album. So that's why, yeah, this one, it's definitely in the bottom three, but I still don't think it's a bad album. Uh, I'd still say overall, you know, this is, it's still a decent album. It, I need more time with it and I just got to yeah get a little more used to it with more, uh, more spins. I got to say one thing that's kind of abundantly clear as you start looking, I mean, now they're down to a three piece. You got Steve on bass and vocals, Trey and Pete. Um, Trey has got amazing ideas, but he seems to work best with another guitar player. In my opinion, I mean, you got Richard Brunel, you've got, you know, um, Eric Rutan, and those albums are all very successful, well written, well structured. When Pete's left to his own devices, things get a little wonky here what the hell's going on the... <laughs> I, I just moved you up front again since you were oh, talking oh right on right on um yeah so anyway we're down to 2000 or the y2k album are you were you done alan i didn't mean to, to barge in oh no yeah i'm done absolutely okay yep okay 2000s gateways to annihilation so let's get the uh this thing on the shirt this thing uh, quite quite obviously, this is this is my second favorite album by the band, and my fourth favorite death metal album ever. Uh, I th I think this is I think this is great, and I go back and forth between this one and Domination. Uh, they both their the goals are different. Domination is a ton of variety, hooky, catchy, um, and uh, like what's up, Kellen? Amazing, a bunch of different things, really aggressive cuts, hooky cuts swaggering all the stuff that happens on domination this album to me when i think of morbid angel and something that i want from death metal the lurch core the hp lovecraft creature yawning yawning from the abyss all of that stuff like this is that album again and again and again and again and again it is so consistently good or excellent like again it's my fourth it's my fourth favorite death metal album of all time and um, uh, Eric Rutan is back. Uh, but I, I think that the other person to really be credited with why this album is great uh, is Steve Tucker. So this is his vocals. There's so many good vocal moments yeah. with him on this album. And he writes a song that I rank in the top in that top six of best Morbid Angel songs ever. So he is allowed to come to the fore the way I feel Eric Rutan was on Domination. That's why I say like my two favorite albums by this band are ones where Trey lets somebody else shine. And I don't know if it's like, I mean, Trey's coming up with his best stuff, but these other people are coming up with such great stuff. And, um, and he's letting, he's letting it go. He's let he's letting it shine. Um, uh, my biggest chop on this album, just on a macro thing is the kit to me almost sounds like it's just an electronic drum kit. Uh, the snare doesn't sound remotely real. Uh, particularly when he's doing um, like rolls, that just it doesn't sound at all like how a snare drum responds. It sounds like how an electronic uh, kit responds. So I don't know if it was recorded that way. Uh, we know that there are albums where there where people are trying to make stuff pass uh, and whatever. I think he does a lot of good playing on here, and I like his work on it. But it's a shame that this doesn't have the uh, the drum sound of Covenant. Or uh, or domination, uh, which were which were both you know re really good. I mean, I think the Covenant drum drum sound is the best one by by, by a good margin. But um, that's my that's my only big chop on it. So um, so uh, we we start out with um, with with cicadas doing their thing, this uh, Kawazu thing. So this is probably. What's uh, Alan? You know Lovecraft like I do. Is it the Mad Arab Abdul Al Hazred? Is that the is that the Lovecraft guy who listens to the insects speak? The Mad and, Arab? I, I don't know. I 
Oh, how's it? Sounds right, but I'm a little rusty, so I, I don't. Yeah, wanna, so, I can't. So, like, so that's where this album starts. It's like we're giving you, um, we are we are giving you the madness, and we are giving you the the Lovecraftian thing. And let me say, I've not commented much on the art. This is great. That's cool. They, they don't have to me. To me, this is so much better than every other cover they have. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, altars, I like. Wish, wish there was a little less howdy doody. Um, this is amazing, and this is also what the album is like in terms of we are visually showing you what you are about to hear. This, this, this is a one hundred percent accurate rep representation of what this album is. Uh, so, summoning redemption, the first proper song. Uh, you, this is the thing I was talking about that that Trey had mentioned in the interview was the idea of playing like multiple songs at the same time. So it's like. And then, so one 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 pillar is this triplet thing moving along slowly, and then the, the tremolo version, and together, uh, like you know, being more than the than the sum of the parts, uh, and moving into this open dissonance, like this crazy, like the some of the distance that came with um, with uh, with Rutan, uh, and this is just. This is a lurching patient. It's like six and a half minutes, this song. The thrum, 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 thrum. There's and a pulse to it, which is really kind of cool. It's like a heartbeat. It's yeah, cool. it is amazing. And then over those over those dissonant chords at like over six minutes in, you start getting this crazy like tapping stuff that's just that's just beautiful. And then uh and 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 a lot of times in this band, when you get like kind of the dual lead or the harmony vocal, you're getting an upper register one coming in with it, which I like less. Here, the I demand to know. You get a deeper harmony coming in and accenting and making it richer. Massive, uh, excellent opener. You know, top top fifteen, if not top ten, uh, song by by the band, and it sets the plate. Like I think my guess is there were people who were like, this shit is boring. And we're pissed, and, and and it's like if you think this shit is boring, you're gonna think this album is boring. This album, this song, I think so clearly indicates uh, what this is this the experience is gonna be. And I think, and this is why I say like torn arteries versus um, surgical steel. Like to me, this is what like Trey should be doing and most wants to do, or at least does the best. Um, is this? lurching mid paced gigantic cavernous thing but with these really well defined riffs and then the interplay of like triplet guitar lurching along and then the, the tremolo riff with it it's great so like we start out awesome and then ageless still i am um so steve tucker is probably his first like really great performance like a lot of really strong stuff for him he's yeah. come, he's come forward as a um He's come forward as a personality, I think, in a big, a big way. Yep. Um, agree. And, and 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 um uh a lot of like there's there's a lot of like the, the muted riff versus tremolo in like the schizo chorus. Um, and you get like mid-paced beast and blasting, and this is sort of like the um uh oh, I forgot the name of the tune, but this this idea where it's not like there's, I think they are embracing the inhumanity that has always been in their music, and uh, and this really, um, like this like this tune again, this like ageless still I am the outro solo by Rattan. I think it's I think it's Rattan. It sounds like him. Um, this is a top twenty song from them. Uh, there's a um, in the verse. There's a double buried high voice that adds another like just kind of layer the production there's there's a lot of kind of tasteful choices like this production seems other than I, like feeling like the drums sound electronic um this production feels very deliberate and uh and the guitars shine and uh so the but that the whole like that chorus it's like the the your father tried to slay me and then mm, yeah yeah still like all of that stuff i did not know rutan was on this record you, as soon as you said that i had to go look and that's a, yeah. maybe another reason why this album's a huge improvement anyway go ahead and um like that the way that chorus works is is it's great like who like there's a chorus that has like four different tempos uh great stuff um then we get to he who sleeps which is the sixth of the of my top six songs by this band this is written by tucker 
So to me, like Tucker wrote one of my six favorite Morbid Angel songs. He wrote the he wrote the music. Um, I feel this is like one of the best funeral doom songs ever. Um, and maybe the best funeral doom song by like a just straight up death metal band. Um, and um, when it gets into that that lurching part, and there's the dun, 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 and then oh. Mm, and that and it's like with the wailing into the abyss over that like steady pulse dun, 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 mm, it's it, it's fantastic like i don't think there's a better moment in their catalog than that than the conclusion of this song in terms of like how massive it seems yawning into the abyss really 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 great stuff and like that that like it's it's got like the pulse underneath is sort of like it's a ring like mm, mm, and then this dive bombing it's just just brilliant stuff uh one of my favorite songs uh death metal songs ever uh one of my six favorite songs by this band uh so that's the same like tucker's real like his his vocals are really good in this album uh and and he's contributing a song that i think ranks above almost all the other songs in this band's catalog um to the victor spoils uh, Trey and Tucker wrote this together. So this is you're feeling like the synergy, like you're seeing like, oh, it's all these shared credits. Um, and this has a little bit of like the Dawn of the Angry feel. Um, that's a good, straightforward death metal song. It's probably the most like, here we're going to give you something uh, like that. that is a little bit more the energy of typical death metal. Um that one with nothing, another song that's Trey and Tucker together. Um, lurch core, harmonic pinches. Uh, the solo is really aquatic in that one. Um, you get some singing that sounds like backwards echo stuff. is incredible. So that song is really, really strong. Uh, then uh, opening the gates. The triplets against the long um, tremolo melody. This is like a really, like it's a four measure of a really, really slow um six eight uh the only chop i have on this song which is one of my favorites ever by the band at the top 15 um is the with the vocal phrase the uh the, the like the ways of the sheep it's a little too melodic but the thing that happens after that when it turns into this machine like machine gun thing where uh there's a tremolo riff of like that chasing of the tremolo riff is it's just like a it's like an evil rampage and i and i love it like that's in, in, incredible again like this is that that's that's another highlight from the album uh, an album where i like every song and i think every song works um uh secure limitations probably my least favorite of the bunch still a good tune um this is you have a little bit more typical um like a rolling six eight with the band, uh, and then it gets to this like vast like cosmic wash. Um, it almost feels like the the solo feels a little bit like like Mahavishnu in this one, um, and uh, that that thing is that thing is cool. Uh, Awakening is a is a fine interlude. Uh, I which they performed the last time I saw them live, and great singing. The I I am the void of light. Like the, this is something that was really missing from the last. Like the yeah. immediately recognizable, you hear it once, cool, catchy, but not cloying catchy. Not like evil spells. Like, <laughs> really like a good idea that is that is catchy, and um, all of like the, his singing really pushes that forward. Um, it also feels a little bit more joined uh, than some of the other songs because. Both sides are doing both pillars. Like the guitars are, are all like doing triplet riffing as opposed to what's been happening a lot on this album, which is like triplets and tremolo and splitting. Um, the, there's a there's a really nice key shift. A lot of really good stuff. Top twenty song from the band. Like, but pretty much this whole thing is is landing towards that. Like, it's it's all in the top like twenty percent of this band's catalog. Uh, I just it's so consistently giving that Lovecraftian lurching creeping crawling um creature uh you know in, in the in the in the nameless abyss uh sort of vibe 
Um, God, God of the Forsaken. So Rattan wrote this one, and it is uh, me- like in terms of songs, it's like oh, this is this is like a progenitor for Hate Eternal. My guy, it feels like he wrote this song and then drove into the like studio next door and started recording. <laughs> this, is, this is an entirely abstract, dissonant, swirling Rattan thing. It's cool. The solo that comes in at two minutes forty seconds is is the best solo on the al- album. I'm going to assume uh, it's Rattan because I, I just tend to prefer. I like his solos. Um, I'm just I'm just a fan of that guy. So here we just have an album that that not that, like that just knocks it out of the park. Like so, like after the I, and and this is what I say in terms of artists who have something to prove versus artists who are doing what they most want to do and gratifying themselves first. I can say like my movies and my books and my comics and all the shit that I do, I'm doing the shit that I want to do a hundred percent of the time. And I hope that people will like it. And I feel like that's what this is. And formulas is obviously in like this, this period of like the new singer for the first time. And I don't know how the process went and stuff like that. But I feel like, like I, it is a disjoint, even if you love that album, it is a disjointed mess. Um, and I like the album, but I think it's a disjointed mess. This is a cohesive statement of like monolithic creatures and yawning abysses and my fourth favorite death metal album of all time. And uh, just, just a huge, a huge achievement. It's just without being like some 75 minute thing, it just feels colossal. So, you know, hats, hats off. And um, you know, there's a lot of talk about David Vincent and obviously his work on um, uh, domination in particular, I, I, I like, but uh, I don't think he. I don't think he ever did a vocal performance that's that's better than this. But probably my two favorite albums are the two my two favorite vocal performances. Like I think that that is connected. I think partially because they're feeling the songs and the songs are cohering a little bit more than sometimes the thrown together riff salad. But uh, uh, you know, gateways love it. It's this is this is serious uh, death metal art. I I really can't. I have to agree with everything Zoller said on this. And when this album came out, it was 2000 and I really wasn't in the mood or never didn't really care about morbid angel at the time. And I wrote this album off really quickly. I heard it and like, yeah, whatever. This was a grower for me. I came back to it with different ears, maybe a year or so later and was blown away by it. And I, and it remained, and this is my number four. This sits number four in their catalog for me. It's just, there's this pulsing, you know, summoning redemption. It starts there. This is this triplet pulsing thing, like a heartbeat. It's it's unique. It's heavy. It's squirrely. It's really great. Tucker sounds great on here. Like Zoller mentioned, he starts to get into pulling a little bit more charisma out of his vocals, a little more character, a little more power. Um, but again, the, the material lends that it, it it allows him to um there's a lot of there's a lot more space for him to operate whereas formulas was maybe a little quicker a little weirder a little more disjointed i don't know gateways there's room for a vocalist to populate the music with something more than just following a rhythm he does a great job comes into his own um the second song, probably my favorite. Well, third one too. I just like this record. It's a solid, well-written record. It's the production, even though the drums are pretty synthetic. Someone on here mentioned that they, for what was it? Um, one of the songs, they replaced it with a drum machine and it pissed off Pete. He must have really done a shitty job on it. I don't know. But synthetic drums aside, it's a great record. I like the production. I like the feel. I like the push of it. It's unique, but it still sounds like morbid angel. They've moved the ball forward. This is where, you know, they finally got their footing after Vincent being out of the band. And, um, yeah, which brings us to Alan's thoughts on this record. Yeah. Good points. Y'all have brought up. It's worth reiterating. Uh, once again, you how cool the art is yeah, you know, it's and it's funny because cool. you know you used to seeing the cover but the entire piece is really incredible um this is just the cd booklet unfolded and it's a funny one for seagrave because it doesn't really have a predominantly blue color scheme 
to it. We're so used to thinking of a lot of his, you know, more notable ones being blue or blue green. And yeah, the, you know, this one's a very brown gold kind of uh, color scheme. You know, I like the fact that it's got, you know, a little bit of the, uh, you know, cause of death uh, or bitch uh, artwork uh, with the eye there mixed into the whole thing. But yeah, uh, great cover art and yeah, an absolutely great album. It's yeah. I remember this is another one. Yeah. Now when this came out, I paid no attention to it. Uh, didn't hear it for years and years and years afterwards. Um, I remember the first time hearing this album, you know, I looked at the track list. It's like, okay, so it's got, you know, uh, an introduction track and then it's got oh, a seven minute song to begin the album. That's an interesting choice. I wonder how that's going to work. <laughs> and then, yeah, you play it. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And yeah, it starts off with this, you know, weird alien cicada thing going on and it kind of bleeds into the track itself. Uh, you know, and then the band's coming in and Sandoval's just flattening every, you know, with the drum beats. And I just remember getting to the end of that first song and thinking, oh, it's already over. I wish that song was longer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's Summoning Redemption. It's, it, it's really an opening statement that, yep. you know, this album is going to flat out kick ass. It's just going to demolish anything in the way and that it's, it is not going to, you know, fuck around. There's not going to be any, you know, weirdness, you know, hangover from, you know, the quirky little bits on formulas that, you know, didn't quite gel. Uh, and yeah, you know, it just goes on from there. You know, Craig and you know, aptly pointed out, he who sleeps is just, you know, a monstrous death doom type of dirge track. Uh, yeah, it's just jaw droppingly good. Um, you know, and then, you know, it fires right back up to something more aggressive after it with, you know, to the victor, the spoils and they, they shift gears that way from song to songs and it works you know, incredibly well. Uh, anything else I want to point out? Secured limitations. You know, some folks, I think Jeff mentioned in the chat, you know, he really likes Trey's vocals on that one. Uh, Craig mentioned it was one of his least favorites. It's probably my least favorite on the album too. I like that they did something different there and incorporated the different vocals. Um, I don't think it quite worked on that song at the end. It's not a bad song. It's kind of like points for trying. It was a neat attempt, but maybe you didn't quite hit the mark, for, at least for me personally. But, you know, if Jeff and other folks are into it, that's absolutely cool. Uh, and then, yeah, it, you know, it you know still wraps up, you know, with really good songs and I and God of the Forsaken. So, it, yeah, it's a crushing album start to finish. There's, you know, instrument interestingly only two interlude tracks on here they're really not dicking around there's no little experiments or flourishes for the most part they're just hammering it and hammering it really really strong um this one i've got ranked fifth tonight i could very easily have this ranked third um with no problem whatsoever as i've mentioned you know several times three four and five for me are really fluid so it, you can take these three albums and shuffle them in whatever order you want. And I'm not going to really nitpick or complain. Uh, th this could easily go up to number three and be like, yep, absolutely. It's a great album. You know, this can, I've got this number three tonight, a month from now, it might switch around. Um, it's a commanding album. Uh, yeah. Tucker is fully at home in the band by this point. Everyone's, you know, really, Again, feels you know pretty focused. They're you know firing on all cylinders. There's nothing really to complain about here. Excuse so, me. Uh, a great album, and uh, that may not be a phrase I get to say a whole lot more tonight. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, because yeah, we're at you know the end of you know we're at the you know dawn of the 21st century. You know, Morbid Angel's been around for a decade now. Have owned this decade. Let's be real honest. You know, throughout the 90s. Yeah, they, they are a tour de force of death metal. It's now 2023, and I think we've only got three more studio albums to talk about, which right away, the pacing here is going to get very different moving forward after G as we head into uh, the, two, the 21st century and moving towards letter H. So um, with that, I'll hand it back over to Craig. 2003. So this this is uh, this is the album where I where I interviewed uh, Trey and had that awkward exchange. Again, more uh, you know my, my fault. I, I learned a little bit of something about interviewing. <laughs> I uh, 
I, I'll point out on this. I, I, I always feel, well, first off, I feel this album cover looks like a screensaver. I don't feel it's an album. <laughs> it does. Second, the way the font for Heretic, you know, sometimes, sometimes you are, um, uh, you have like a computer error in some like totally primitive font from like 1982 appears on your screen. I feel that that is the heretic font. I just, I don't understand this at all. There's so much to not understand about this album. Um, as I said, I like other than the obvious album that is the boiling shit jacuzzi. Uh, I like all of their <laughs> albums. This is, but for me, this is kind of close. Like this is, this is, uh, you know, like this is like blue or cult mirrors. This is, um, this is Man of War, Gods of War. This is the thing where it's like I, I'm such a fan of the band, and there's some shining moments that I that I enjoy it. But but def I mean, we just came off of something like a la a thing that I'm regularly putting as um, you know like that, that lives in my top five death metal albums of all time, and uh, and and so then there's so then there's this um, coloring on this. Like visually, this is like we we got we finally got. The album cover this band has always sh should have always had, and then we get this. We get Chicken Lady, and with then this, feet. with this in the, in the back, what is this like? Infectious grooves? What is this? I, I don't. <laughs> so, um, hey, 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 now, Craig, let's not say anything we can't take back. You know, <laughs> let's, let's just put the IG thing away. Save that for when you really need to nuke something. <laughs> I'll be right back. So um, this album is 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 a bit of a mess uh, in in terms of its ideas. The thing that I learned recently, and it seems there are definitely people in the chat who know more more of an angel lore and and stuff than I do because I really don't know that much uh, about that stuff. Uh, I didn't know because I looked. I was like, man, this there's no Steve Tucker writing on this album. Here he's contributing one of the best songs in their catalog writing others co-writing others like he's so involved here here nothing he wrote nothing on this album musically and um and so i i was like why is that and i learned online he had left so he like it, it and and I, I could be wrong on this or whatever source i saw might be incorrect but i did not know that steve tucker had left the band after gateways before they recorded this because i'm really just going by the albums and then at this period in time i wasn't really online very very often uh, to know that, but uh, th so this is uh, Trey Attic Tote, the Madman, alone at the controls, um, and obviously his madness is what has brought us a ton of great music. Um, but as you know, pointing out the Eric Cretan factor for domination and the Steve Tucker factor and Eric Cretan for for gateways, like I think when he has that foil, you're, you're getting you're getting some of the best stuff. Uh, or actually, in, in these cases, the two very best things. So uh, this album, Cleanse and Pestilence, Blade of Elohim. Um, uh, I, you know, the, the vocals are really weirdly processed on this thing. Um, so it sounds like this weird kind of aquatic distortion. And I don't know if they're trying to hide something. I, I did see somewhere, again, like I'm going by an interview I saw posted online. I doubt anyone would fabricate this, but where Steve Tucker was complaining about the production on this album being terrible, but but Trey thinking it was great. So the, the vocals are particularly badly produced. Uh, there's some cool triplets. It's decent overall, not a special song. This is going to be, this album is a bit foggier for me, even though I've listened to it a lot. There's just a lot that doesn't quite stick. Um, uh, it's, it's enshrined by grace starts out with some de decent stuff. It's, um, and then it sort of loses momentums and lose its way, uh, beneath the hollows. I, I, um, I, I think is, is pretty decent. Uh, that has like the lurching gateways, um, the lurching gateways kind of thing. Like beneath the hollows, the first one, I'm like, okay, that one is, that one is really good. And it has that like lead tremolo line set against the triplet wall on the right. And so when Trey was talking about um, the idea of like the two different songs and stuff like that, like this is a good example. I, I enjoy that tune. Um, Curse the Flesh. Uh, there's um, the, the May You Fall and Never Again Arise. Like that's a cool refrain. There's a little bit too much of the Trey voice in that. I, I don't love it. Like him doing that Fry voice, black metal-ish sounding thing. 
Um, I, I, I don't dislike it, but I, I, I prefer Tucker and I prefer uh, David Vincent in terms of vocalist, vocalist. But there's some there's some nice licks. There's a cool lurching slow six eight thing in that one. Uh, so Curse the Flesh is pretty good. Praise the Strength. So this is to me the last song by this band that I think is in any discussion of the top songs by the band. That song is awesome. And um, you, the, the rhythms are really weird, uh, even though it's, like, it's over 4-4, but it has like these really cool things. Uh, and um, there's a really nice, the, there's a nice synergy. And this feels like a band more than some of this song, some of this album does, where it's like, raise the strength. Na, na, na. That none can conquer. Like that back and forth. Swagger, rocking, pushed, really good. That this is the last song that I th that this band made that I would put in a top twenty, um, uh, like conversation for this band. Um, it's 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 interesting. Like the 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 in the uh, departure, it starts going to all these like almost like junk chords, and um, the fills and accents all seem late. Like this just doesn't seem. Connected. This is like some of the stuff I was talking about on the earlier albums in terms of uh, Sandoval kind of like just being behind or ahead, but just not connected. But that whole praise the force that like went in, in, in a high point for for Steve Tucker's career. The Duncan Conquer, like the inflection he gets on Conquer is a real is a real high high watermark for him. Uh, and there's just really good melodic contour in that, uh, particularly for like you know whatever false chord death metal singing. It, it, it's good. Um, uh, Stricken Arise is um, it's pretty good. Um, it it's it seems like uh again this was a little bit a throwback to um, uh, alter stuff. Like there's just like we're just gonna get uh we're we're just gonna get really aggressive and and here it is. Um, place of a place of many deaths. Um. We haven't, I haven't spent a lot of time talking about the interludes. Um, this one is quite good. Um, for whatever reason, this place of many deaths, this is one of the best interludes um, that they've done. And maybe that maybe the best one. It feels a little bit like Caesar's Palace. Um, you, they're employing some kind of chime synthesizer for it. The, the kids sort of, you know, someone you mentioned like the roller coaster on the other app. Like, I always feel like this is a playground of kids. Like a kid recording, um, and it's probably not what it is. It's probably people yelling in the distance, but wh the, wherever they're pitched, it sounds like a bunch of kids running around in like a playground, which isn't uh, which isn't what I think of when I hear "place of many deaths." Um, but it's a it's a it's a good interlude. Like it, it stands out. Um, uh, Abyssos, we have another interlude, so we're getting pretty heavy on the interludes, and, and there's more and a worse amount to come. Uh, <laughs> reverse, it's like a reverse tape loop. Of like new age synth, a little bit like when you see King Crimson and like Trip is just sort of dicking around and coming up with some kind of pretty stuff that doesn't really go anywhere, but is a nice texture. It's that sort of stuff. Um, God of Our Own Divinity um, is 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 uh, is is a highlight. It's um, apparently the one that's got Carl Sanders on it from Nile. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. Yeah, that's what, what Melanie. That's what Melanie just said. Okay, that and, and that that song. That like the the opening lick and it's really good. Um, the uh, the 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 raise this being to life has a real nice like invocation quality. Um, there's some nice melody. The solo over like kind of the roaring beast at the four minute mark is, is really good. Like this tune seems like oh this is a continuation of some of the gateways type stuff and uh, and is and is a highlight. Um, it's not as good as really like any of the best songs on Gateways, but removing that from your mind, it's a it's a good tune in that style. Um, uh, within Thy Enemy, so uh, maybe this is a uh, maybe this is a question for um, for, for for the for the pr professor here. So in late Middle English, when you use the word "thy" and the next word begins with a vowel, shouldn't it be "thine"? And shouldn't the title of this be within thine enemy? Englishmen, I know I know some English people watch this show. In any case, this is a very stupid nitpick. Um, the, drums, 
the drums seem late throughout this song. Um, uh, there's a there's some cool stuff in the opening. Memories of the past. This is the one that feels like Beethoven's Moonlight Moonlight Sonata. As this shit is boring. Um, Victor, the what is this? Victorious. Uh, they've gone back to difficult to read. Victorious march of yeah. the reign of of the conqueror. Um, so this is kind of feels like classical. The 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 snare seems laid all the time. It sort of seems like a Graveland ish vibe. But the I mean, it's just it's like simple stuff. Like I, I like this just doesn't feel like the drums are locked in and something that's not difficult. Um, uh, then you get drum check. I mean, dude, I'm sorry. I don't care how good your drummer is or if you're trying to keep them, but if you have to put that crap on your album, it's not worth being on. The, it's not a, It's not an album thing. It's not. This is a joke. Like it's stupid. Considering this part of the album, which it is, we're not even going to go down the road of the labyrinth of all the hidden tracks that are horseshit and of no value or like of minor value. If you're just curious to hear a solo with no music underneath or a song that's less good because there's no singing. Um, but these songs are songs proper. You have to, like, for me, I've got to count them as the songs because they are listed it's, there. It's the second to last song. It, it's, like, not even a bonus track. It's, and like... There's a voice, like, hey, Pete, give me the peach. So you get a joke voice. This is some shit that, like, that, like Razor would do on the album, but it would be short and in the context of a playful thrash album. So this is awful that this is part of the album it's not even it's not like this is like musically good it's some of it is hard to play um and then you get this born again thing that's a uh flange pedal like kind of solo that's a total whatever uh so clearly this album I, I mean for me this album should have stopped with god of our own divinity on track nine but we go up to 14 and let's not count to invis <laughs> Track 35 and stuff like this. I, the first time I heard this album, I actually got the promo because I was the guy who was Which is right it. here. It's like broke up into like a million different segments to prevent. Right. And ripping. we listened to that on our way to the Milwaukee, Milwaukee Metal, Metal Fest. Fest. This is the same one. Yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah, you never, you never upgraded it. I never upgraded. Yeah. You, you probably don't need to, but, but th there are good tunes on here. Like I just named like, you know, four tunes that I enjoy. The ones that I think are less good aren't aren't bad. There's just really what brings this one down and makes it like not much better uh, than well, I mean it's obviously better than the the boiling shit jacuzzi, but it is <laughs> it is um, that that really makes it like not much better. I, I rate it as a seven. Um, uh, yeah, it, I give it the seventh. Like if they just got rid of all the dicking around and there's a there's a lot of it, and then the whole album ends on it. Uh, this this would be a like I feel a notch better, um, but as it is, there's a lot of dicking around. So I don't like this this album. I listen to on occasion, really for like like praise to strength. I, I love that song. Like they they there's that's that, I think of this album and I think of that. And back in the days, in the catering chef days, when I interviewed Trey and listened to this album a bunch to prepare for it, that was the only thing that stuck with me in a significant way back then. Um, but there's, yeah, there are good tunes on here. There are like three or four good tunes and one with Praise His Strength, one really good tune. Uh, but yeah, number seven on, uh, for me on the, on the list. All right. Well, oddly enough, it's my number seven as well. And oddly enough, the last time I spun this album was on that faithful trip to yeah. Milwaukee <laughs> Metal Fest. Wow, also, you never tried it out. You never I tried never tried it. it again because it's on this promo sleeve and once these don't sit in the regular collection they get forgotten they get put into a box and filed away um another thing we also listened to a lot on that trip that i was kind of so so down on was lost horizon awakening the world no it was flame to the ground beneath we were listening to i'm like these guys are just too happy this is sucks and um i end up loving it but anyway Smartened up. You smartened up. I smartened up. But this album I have not spun since that fateful day on in a vehicle hurling our way to a Milwaukee Metal Fest. But um I pulled it out of the pile this week to spin it, and it isn't as bad as I remember it, but it's still not great. It's not great Morbid Angel. It's got some good moments on it. Um again, what's the difference? 
you know, it's Trey left to his own devices. He doesn't have another guitar to bu- another guitarist to bounce ideas off of. That and, and seems he didn't have a singer, and that's yeah. a, and that, like from the way like I, that was what I discovered. It looks like, like like Tucker was out, like he was he had left the band before this. Well, one, he so was that- he's on Metal Archives. He's listed as the singer and bassist, but I don't know. I don't. No, no, I, he, he is he is on the album. What what I, what the discovery was. He after Gateways he left the band. Yeah. And then and, and unlike on Gateways, where he is writing a like a bunch of music, including that, you know, like some amazing stuff, he is not writing any of this. So I think like like to me, this is a bit gun for hire and whatever, you know, he was just like down with whatever direction or lack of commitment the band had. So he is on the album. I'm not saying he's not on the album. I'm just saying like he wasn't involved, like he's involved with gateways in a different way than the album before and after it. And it shows huge. Yep. So it's, it's, it's painfully obvious that Trey might be, you know, an innovator musically guitar playing wise. Um, he needs someone to bounce ideas off of someone to temper those ideas and help sculpt them into something a little more listenable. There's a handful of good songs on here. I listened to it this week. I didn't hate it as much as I did back when it came out. Um, but again, you're 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 putting shit uh, like drum check before the last song, shit like that. Just it fucks up the flow. Th- these guys have always struggled with having the right um, song, the track list. The track list has always been a problem when it's not another guitarist helping out Trey. And it, you know, like the last album or the album two albums ago, four instrumentals ending out the album. It's just too much and um left to his own devices he makes some poor choices even though there are some good songs on here it still sounds like morbid angel it's just not as concise and well considered as it could have been so yeah it's number seven for me alan Hmm. all right so heretic this is another one i wanted to spend some more time with this week but yeah, my head's been too full of snot to fit more morbid angel music into it. Uh, Where the slime live is in South Carolina, everybody, in case you're wondering. Right here. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll start. You know, ranking wise, I've got it eighth. Um, part of that, though, is right away unfamiliarity. It's I don't know if it's the one I've played the least, but it's never gotten a ton of spins. Um. Craig put it best that there's some good stuff on here, but there's way too much sticking around. Uh, that sums it up very nicely. The production's a problem. Is it the worst sounding album ever? No. <laughs> should a morbid angel at this point in this band's career, should they be having production issues? No, Jesus no. Christ. No, that it always irks me when you have a veteran band, you know, who's putting out, you know, their, you know, their fifth, sixth, tenth album or whatever. And it sounds like shit. It's like, no, you know better than this. You, you wouldn't have gotten this far into your career if you hadn't learned this by now. Why did this happen? How, how did this happen? There had to be multiple people that signed off on it somewhere along the line. So it, it always irks me when, yeah, you've got an established band who has an album that just ends up sounding kind of crappy. There's no excuse for that. Um. Yeah, you know, I mentioned before, like, you know, one day I will sit down on formulas and I'll find a way to make those interludes space themselves out and work in that album. I will not do that for Heretic. Fuck that shit. (laughs) There is no place for the drum check to go in this track listing. Um, There is way too much, way, way, way too many pointless instrumentals here. I hate it when CDs are structured where they you know, have like all these, you know, three second blank tracks and then like, Oh, Hey, by the way, track 53 is actually going to be a real song, except it's not a real song. It's three more minutes of us just, you know, farting around. And then you've got 20 more three second, you know, blank spots. And then we do another, you know, pointless, you know, bonus track. That was always annoying as shit. Um, on the CD format. I hated when bands started doing that. Um, yep. So yeah, it's a very annoying structure to the album here. So now with the bad points out of the way to the good points, 
there are some good songs on the first half of this album. The, among the real tracks, there's some decent stuff. Uh, yeah, Cleansed in Pestilence, Blade of Ithlam, not a bad song at all. Um, uh, Enshrined by Grace, don't mind that one. Beneath the Hollow, yeah, uh, that one's pretty cool. Curse the Flesh has you know good riffs to it. So there's cool stuff here. But between the you know production hampering it, and then you know as you get deeper into the album, you just kind of start wallowing in more and more of this stuff. By the time you get to the end of the album, it, you've almost forgotten that it started out really promising, and you're just like, oh god, I'm glad this mess is over. And then you have to go back and look, and it's like, no, well, you know, it had a chance. You know, it's not a total write off. There, there are songs here. It'd be really this is one again. You, just take the instrumentals completely out of it, clean the sound up a lot, and you it might hold together okay. Um, but yeah, you know, to your point, Marty, it's it, it does show that this is you know tree without support, and you see that you know people can be amazingly good musicians, but if they don't have somebody to help them write the song, sometimes you know the things can go astray. Um, I can write riffs all day long, but I. I really benefit from help mm -hmm. in structuring and, you know, yeah. a few little things that I struggle with. It's nice to have another person there to bounce ideas off of, to get to the, the end result. And yeah, and, I mean, it's, you know, for, you know, sports analogy, you know, mo most, you know, basketball teams that have, you know, one superstar, they don't win championships with one superstar. They, yeah. they win championships when they've got, you know, you know, the star power spread out across, you know, three guys or so, you know, and they've got, you know, solid backup behind, you know, you know, their ace player. Bands can end up being the same way too, just because you know you're you know some kind of virtuoso doesn't mean everything you write is going to turn out great if you're just sitting there smelling your own farts and nobody's. At this point out. in the career, you've written so many riffs and so many songs and so many riffs with high, highly elevated, you know, <coughs> stuff going on in them. By an album like this, you should either have a formula figured out or. I don't know. It just, it seems like it's a struggle at this point, you know, uh, you know, I don't, forcing, I don't, it, don't, forcing it, forcing uh, it is, yeah. Is it being forced is, you know, tree, is it just trading me like, yeah, well, I guess it's time to record another album. Let's tinker around a bit. Nobody else is helping. And yeah, just do a little of this, a little of that. Here you go. Give me some money. I don't, I don't know. Uh, Drum check. But, yeah. Great. They'll fill out the time. What the fuck? Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, That's one of the reasons why I wonder if it has something to do with giving him a credit in royalties. So things like, I, I, I don't know. It's just speculation. Don't know. But, um, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's a mess of an album and it's kind of a shame because I think there is some good music lurking in there for sure, but he, you, you got to, peel it out of the production and you gotta really clip away a lot of fat you know to notice the good parts on this album it's another one that yeah I'll, I'll you know give some more chances over time but you know this one's gonna have to be a little surgical on how i pick it apart and i'm not gonna be in a you know rush to revisit it and find it but there are good songs you know while it sounds like i'm shitting on the album a lot there there is good stuff on you know the first batch of real songs and like you said craig if it just ended after god of divinity um you know i think the only thing we'd be complaining about really overall is that you know the production was bad but otherwise we'd have you know a pretty solid scoop of songs so i've got it ranked eighth i i could push it to seven i don't know if i could push it much higher than seven in my personal list but uh and some folks in the chat have been saying that you know they think it's very underrated and uh stuff and that's cool it's actually really neat to see some folks you know that like this album and you uh rank it a bit higher because it's not an album that seems to be well loved in their catalog so it's good to see you getting some uh some votes and some love out there in the chat tonight all right we have wrapped up h <laughs> so what comes after h I'll dive in a man's anus for 2011. It's Aller. So, you know, I've talked about um, Carcass and Morbid Angels, my two favorite death metal bands. There's a reason that Carcass wins and is in the number one slot, and it is the existence of this album. Um, and uh, what? Elude Divinum Insanus. So, um, 
I remember hearing about this and like, oh, okay, it's it, they're going back with David Vincent. Let's let's see how that goes. Uh, this should have. This was a big deal. I was. On the hook for this, I was like, oh, no, I, I, anticipation I was, was over the fucking yeah. My, and and, and, and on, on top on top of that, I had I had I had for a long time I discussed this idea of like, man, how much would I pay for some of these albums, particularly, uh, you know, blessed are the blessed are the sick to just have like a re-recorded drum parts. So the fact that they were going to have a new drummer, it's Tim Young, I think, yep. um, who was I believe the drummer on the first Hate Eternal, that Conquering the Throne. Um, so I was really excited about that. I remember, I think it was Wagner told me, he said, this album's coming out. And I think the first thing I asked, even before the singer or what, I was just like, who's playing drums. And, and, and it was, and it's this guy who I think is a very tasty player. And He's super a good player. In. Yeah. Super locked in. And, um, did we see him with like vital remains or something at a metal fest? I thought he played with, what was Glenn Benton singing in at that? Wasn't it was vital him? remains. It was vital. He was reading off the fucking lyric sheet. He was reading yeah. the lyric sheets, but, I, but I think Tim <laughs> Young might've been playing drums on that. I, I could be wrong. I don't know. One gig. In any case, um, uh, I mean, this, this album, this album is terrible. And, um, I, uh, you know, like I don't hate saying anger. And I like Swan Song by Carcass. So, and I was a champion right out of the gates on Grand Declaration of War. So I'm open to interesting, different stuff. And the fact that they're going, that the industrial aspects are coming to the fore in this band, it's not like that is an immediate fail. It, I mean, it is, it is a total fail. But it isn't that, it isn't that that concept, um, it could never work. Uh, so I got it, I listened to it, and I just threw it in the Marty box. I'm like. Uh, you you probably got this once, and I didn't listen I to it. it. I bought it the day it came out, gave it away, and then it came back to me again. Yeah, so I got rid of that. Box, yeah. I never want to hear that again. And I still have it right here, you know. <laughs> yeah, that was the one I got rid of. But um, and, and partly because it isn't like something like, you know, like Creator. I don't need to go past Como of Souls. Rest of that catalog. I've checked out probably four or five. I don't need any of that stuff. There's a stopping point. So I thought maybe Heretic was going to be the stopping point for Morbid Angel. Um, I, I, like, I, I, I like Kingdom's Disdain. Not very much, but I do like it. And I'm hopeful that they're going to make more good music. So I'm not going to just have the one gap. It's completely... This is like that Blind Guardian classical thing. Clearly the Blind Guardian classical thing is still... is Even, even that thing is better than this. Um, though I guess this is better in the way that it is shorter, um, uh, shorter experience that I don't want to have. So, uh, so I've listened to this album maybe four times in my life because I, I listened to it again when I listened to it the second time, which is sometime during lockdown when I was having like a Morbid Angel parties and just ordering merchandise and having like private concerts and just listening to Morbid Angel. And I, um, uh, and I and I bought this again. I was like, okay, there's some moments and some riffs and a couple of tunes that I don't hate. The bad stuff is terrible. Um, the mood overall is awful. So like overall, this is like this isn't mediocre. It's way, 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 way below that. The boiling, <laughs> the way the boiling shit jacuzzi to which I've referred to. Um, uh, so going going through this, it's not music I know really well. As I said, I, I think I've listened to this thing four times. Uh, the oh wow, ooh, like straight away with <laughs> trouble. And let's say I, I, out of the gate, the big offender here is David Vincent. But you could say maybe the bigger offender is Trey that he let this happen. I've I've seen like, interviews where where Trey blames Dave, Dave blames Trey. I've seen both but, interviews. Like, but but it's a thing. It's like we know who owns this name. Like, who's making the decisions here? It's Trey. And so this came in like Tucker had left, uh, and I think that led to the reunion shows where I saw them with um, David Vincent. He was great. Like seeing that lineup, they were real locked in. That was a very good. That was a really good live show. Definitely one of the couple best times I'd seen uh, Morbid Angel live uh, was the reunion before before this thing came out, and. Um, uh, so that so that that first song is um, sort of bad, uh, and then you get too extreme. We <laughs> get the the thobbing, the, this thing, and the, and the industrial guitar, Dot Imes guard, the drilling sounds, um, and uh, the I mean the the 
I am a super tough guy. Like this shit. <laughs> like, if not seven dust, disturbed, rap, rappy toughness. And I said this as a fan of like actual real rap, but this is this is terrible. Like this, this without a doubt, like uh, up to this point, but we're gonna go further in this album, is certainly the worst music I've ever discussed on heavy metallurgy. And arguably the worst music that has ever been discussed on heavy metallurgy. This is awful. Um, it's just like non-riff strumming. It's just, just I mean, just swimming in a pile of manure. Awful. Um, uh, Existo Volgore, um, for whatever it's worth, it's interesting because I, I I hear Grand Declaration of War in this tune, and uh, David, <laughs> David David Vincent what David Vincent would go. Did, have, have you ever heard the Measure Schmidt album by Blasphemer? Yeah, you sent it's it really, to me. Yeah, yeah, it's it's I, I really enjoy that thing. It sounds like Grand Declaration of War type of right, but with more of an industrial flavor. Yeah. And, gonna say like when i when i say that in my time you're crazy like grand declaration of war one of my favorite albums of all time this the worst album ever made by a band i love without question it is the bottom there's not like 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 so like let's put this against risk this is worse yeah this is worse than risk easily i am i'm saying that because risk is mostly like kind of below average with some shit but this is like horrific in spots and so, but this song, I'm like, I remember hearing it. I was like, there's some Messerschmitt Schmidt Grand Declaration of War. And not for nothing, David Vincent went to work on this Ultimus project with Blasphemer of Mayhem. And it sounds like, I mean, it's, it has very bad to mediocre David Vincent vocals with a couple of good spots. But clearly, like, I think that that's in the mix. Like, I don't think it's just coincidence that I'm hearing that in this album. And, uh... Worse than Lulu? That is a good question, but the answer is yes. Lulu is just generally below average, kind of annoying, but trying something. Um, there's there, it, it doesn't have the terrible. Like in addition to terrible ideas, this also has like the most cloying, like shitty earworms alongside all that. Like Lulu is a failure. Uh, Lula, with, without question, this album is worse. This album is worse than Risk. Um, Lulu's also kind of a different thing since it was a collaboration with another thing, but but a good album to bring into the conversation. Um, but I guess also worse than that, it's longer. Um, so you get some of that um, uh, like industrial blasphemer sort of sort of stuff. And it's hard uh, to call this shit industrial, Craig. It's more EDM leaning at times. Yeah, it's, it's, it's bad in, EDM. Really, this, really bad. This song I think is okay. There aren't many songs on this I will say get a pass. I do not like this song, but uh, like say like a risk song or whatever. This just gets a mediocre from me. A uh, blades for bow. Uh there's some good riffs in this. It's a good the best song on the album, hands yeah, down. There's some good riffs in it. So then we get to are you, I am morbid. So <laughs> this is this Are you is, morbid, Craig? This is the 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 crowd chanting the the um here's the thing on this I do not hate this song. I feel that this song in a way is sort of like all that shit on the black album I don't want to listen to. So again, like a level of mediocre i don't want to hear it but there's a difference between mediocre and terrible we have heard some terrible the next song 10 more dead is terrible so i will differentiate i am morbid which sounds like kind of a bad black album b-side uh and i'm not a fan of the black album i like uh i think saint anger is decent and i like actually the last two metallica albums so i'm not just locked in the 80s with them but uh, so I am that has all that wah wah. It really feels like a black album song. Uh, not a good one, like one they discard. Um, but I think mediocre as opposed to terrible. Ten more dead is terrible. That's that's the kind of like catchy course. The ten more dead is just like these refrains are just numb. He's like, oh, he's doing his best, Peter Steele. Dead more dead vocals it's ridiculous it, it is this is just numbskull stuff it really is um awful uh and um 
you, you thought it couldn't get worse, but it immediately gets worse. <laughs> uh, Destructos versus the Earth. <laughs> Destructo, go, go, Destructo. The worst Rob Zombie. I don't like Rob Zombie music. This is the worst Rob Zombie song never recorded. Um, the the Destructos, Destructos. <laughs> So we now, like, that might be the nadir of the entire catalog. That might be the single worst idea ever put out by a band I love. It is so terrible. Yeah. It is so terrible. Destructos. Destructos. <laughs> and then there's, like, some Depeche Mode singing, at, 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 like, around it that's sort of okay, but it doesn't, like, you get to Destructos, and this, 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 this is awful. Um uh nevermore what's going on in this one it's so it's it's almost passable but the album is so shitty it makes that turd shine <laughs> the um the the nevermore war <laughs> that like that and this is like i'll 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 go back again to the like the 90s hetfield so there's clearly a point when david hetfield's like i used to be into thrash but now i'm into piracy and and he started singing like a pirate. He got the whoa, whoa, oh yeah, walk the plank. <laughs> <laughs> this never mo war like that shit is terrible. It is just awful. It's you just feel embarrassed for him. Dude, like, you, you skip the fucking Falcor song. Falcor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, did, uh, did I miss one? You missed the Falcor song. Which one was that? Um I can't remember which fucking name of the song is. Anyway. Oh. Um, Beauty then, makes be- meets. Oh my god, this song is so fucking terrible. Um, so there's some chugging here. It's got that that keep of callus and lots of chugging. But the give me your soul. Whoa, whoa. So <laughs> one of the more embarrassing. I, I am so happy that the Black Star album is not a Carcass album. Um, and I and I say this as someone who likes 65 percent of Swan Song. That's but, why hard work should have been called something other than Carcass in my book, and that's why people look at me when I say hard work is not a Carcass album. They look like at me like I just shit in their Wheaties. Anyway, go ahead. It's a, it's a fantastic album. I know your complaint. That album is incredible. Um, but yeah. Swan, Swan Song, Swan Song was like, okay, that's as far as they can go with this death and roll and stuff like that, and still kind of seem like it's at all in the in the ballpark. But I understand why that's the album, like that one and Rika Putrefaction are the controversial ones in this catalog. Um, but uh like it's it's that Black Star album came out. I'm like, oh my God, Jeff Walker singing here is a bit it's like a Krusty the Clown impersonation. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's so embarrassing. It's like fake kind of like death metal singing. Um, and, you know, like again, Jeff Walker, an architect behind some of my favorite albums of all time, the lead singer from my favorite death metal band of all time, uh, though I do like the Bill Steer deep vocals more. I wish there were a lot more of those. But he's he's great when he's on. He's great. He was great on Torn Arteries, on Heartwork, Necroticism, Symphonies, really good vocalist. And um, uh, and he, ha- he has his spots on all the albums. He also has some moments where he sings too regular. But uh, but that I'm so happy that that Black Star album is not part of the Carcass discography because I can just say I like all their albums and I do. But like that thing of like the death metal singer trying to um, trying to sing in like a rocking out way. <laughs> Give me a so whoa whoa, no, whoa, whoa. It's so he's like you brought the whoa 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 from uh, where the slime lived black back man. That's like a callback. Come on, you should yeah, be psyched well, about that. Again, it was one whoa, moment whoa, that I know whoa. this song before, but this is really embarrassing. So when I hear radical, I keep thinking of this song. Something about I don't know if it's, I don't know if it is um, the key or whatever, but I keep thinking it's gonna go freeze frame. You remember that hit, <laughs> Jay Giles? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Song, frame a radical, like it's it's the Jay Giles of Morbid Angel. It is, um, the thing is, I think this song is not a kind of music I ever want to listen to. This is a successful Rob Zombie song, like, I don't think this, I don't don't interrupt. Would would you say your Morbid Angel was a cover girl? So this 
just a Rob Zombie song. I, like, I don't like Rob Zombie songs. I don't think they're terrible. I just think they're like kind of fake edgy and whatever. And I think this is that. I don't think this is better or worse. Uh, what is worse? Much, 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 <laughs> much worse is this profundus mia, 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 copa. Like, this, <laughs> this is terrible. This is the worst song on the album. This is the worst thing that has ever been discussed on Heavy Metallurgy. This is the worst song in my collection of like 2,000 albums of all different types of genre. Like, here it is. This is <laughs> O'Toole's midlife crisis, a band swimming in boiling shit. It is awful. <laughs> so, um, uh, obviously, this so, so album Craig, is Craig, high. Where, where are you going to rank it? <laughs> 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 Obviously, um, this is this is number nine. This is truly embarrassing. Um, it is, uh, yeah, like yikes. Uh, and um, <sighs> that, that that was that was tough. And I listened to it. You know, I listened to it again for this sort of thing. And yeah, you know, there there are like a handful of songs that are mediocre or slightly bad. And then, and then you're dealing with some of that stuff that is really like, like legendarily terrible. Like there is no, um, there, there is, I, I've never heard anyone speak on, def, on behalf of this album. And I, again, I say this as someone who likes Swan Song, liked it when it came out, who, who says like St. Anger, I think is north of the equator. Like, I, like I, to me, there's enough cool synergy and groove and aggression that I can get around the flush it out, flush it out, terrible stuff that's on there. <laughs> um, I don't think that's a very good album or even a good album, but I think it's acceptable. Um, you know, Risk is 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 definitely down there. Like that's that's that is a bad album by by the, like Cold, Cold this Blake. Is, this is a different thing. This is I've never heard. I'm, I'm sure someone in the world likes this. I mean, maybe someone who just likes industrial music and doesn't want death dude, metal. Dude, this is giving industrial music a really shitty name. I mean, I, th I, this, I, to call this, a, to lump this in, I mean, this is more, I hear more EDM on this, electronic dance there's, music. There is I, EDM. I, I, I will also say, because I'm a completist, I actually have the terrible remix thing of this where you listen what to like, oh, Did you buy that? <laughs> bought it. I bought it. I bought it, which has like, this, I think there's like, like I think you get I am morbid like like ten versions of this. This is like this is like okay military waterboarding is is not like the Geneva Convention is not accepting that. Just just play them that like that industrial remix version of this album. You'll get anybody talking. You'll get the secrets of every nation out. It was it's it is it was a it was a chore. But I like like Man of War released. They had like um, an EP. And then the extra CD that came with it um, was like the song Father performed in like 20 languages. I'm like, I'm going to listen to this once. <laughs> this thing once. Because I have to listen to everything recorded by a band that's one of my favorites. And Man of War is, 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 is top five. I'm a huge Man of Warrior. Uh, but I'm like, I'm listening to this once. And I, I'm, that's not going to happen again. When when Man of War came to New York City, Craig was the first one lined up at the free candy van. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, sorry. <laughs> this is hey, wait, Marty, Marty, Marty. No, no, no. That's wrong. Man of War don't give shit away for free. That candy was like sixteen ninety nine for a fucking lollipop. And well, you were Logan came in a different bus, and it was it was half assed. It didn't even come with a stick, unless they were playing. Unless they were selling the candy at like a. It major came European with a festival. stick, all right. It came with a stick. <laughs> Only if you're at the major European festival, then you got the stick. Yes. Yeah, the jokes, the jokes are there. Anyways, so I, I've never heard anyone actually defend this album. No. Uh, that, that they that they like it. It is an it is an atrocity. Um, All right, I really it's hard to follow that up, but uh, to quote Tropic Thunder, you never go full Cold Lake, never go full Cold Lake, and every era of metal has its Cold Lake. You never go full Lake, Marty. You never, never go, go full Lake. Never go full Lake. And I was so David Vincent's coming back to Morbid Angel. Holy shit! What an event. This is. This is the event of the fucking 
2011s. This is it. I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait for this record to come out, to be completely honest. When I finally went to the store and bought it on the day it came out, I put it on. I'm like, I like industrial music. This is not industrial music. I like I like Skinny Puppy. I like Frontline Assembly. I like many industrial bands. This is not industrial music. I even like some White Zombie albums. I have a couple of them. I enjoy them for what they are. And this makes White Zombie look like atheist. It just does. It's um if it wasn't for the song Blades for Ball for Bal, Ball, Bal, whatever. That's a good song. That's a Morbid Angel song. It's fast, it's catchy, it sounds like Morbid Angel. You've got uh Existo Valgor which it sounds like Falcor, but it's Valgor. Um, it, that's hinting at trying to be a good song, but it's not a good song. You've got Nevermore, again, another song that's trying to hint to the old Morbid Angel, but it's a bad song. It's just not good. There's another one. Um, was it When Beauty Meets Beast? Another sort of pseudo death metal song, but Tick, Strip away all the garbage from this record. You've got one song, Blades for Val. That's it. That's the only song on here. It's the fourth song on the album. The rest of it is swimming in a, a in a cesspool of throwaway Rob Zombie riffs and songs and shitty. There's a thing, man. I've noticed, you know, I've 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 benefited from the fact that I've got friends that uh, that got me into industrial, that got me into noise, that got me into different things. People that come up in the industrial scene or the post punk scene or the punk scene, they do what they do really well. You put metalheads in the position of, I'm a metalhead, I'm going to make an industrial record. There's ideas in it that are good. But it's not great. You can tell they're interlopers. They're not supposed to be in this scene. There's, there, you know, I've heard metal guys doing noise stuff. They get the i, they get the general idea of what it's supposed to be, but they don't do it right. There's not a, a level of authenticity there. This is a prime example of that. This is this is interlopers trying to do shit. You know, David has been on tour with his wife at the time. In Jenna Tortures, I heard she used to fuck him in the ass on stage with dildos. Whatever. Great. Awesome. Evil D. You know, I'm a man of the world. More of that. If, you, if you're if you into it, more of it. Go for it. That's fine. There's a lot of Jenna Torture influence on here, but it's not even good Jenna Tortures. It's just lame-ass shit, dude. It's just lame. It's, it's weak to, to call this industrial is an insulted industrial music because it's not industrial to, to call this edm is an insult to edm because electronic dance music is typically more layered pulsing hard hitting than this this is metalheads trying to dabble into something and then you read the reviews afterwards you know dave's like oh morbid angels always been pushing the boundaries and blah, blah, blah. we revolutionized and, blah, 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 blah. and you know this is not a revolutionary album this is washed up fucking guys trying to sell an album that they know is a fucking flop and the thing that's really embarrassing about this i mean you get you get a band of this caliber you would think has a management team they do they've got one of the best management teams ever niles one of their bands gunther and whatever i can't remember the team you get david vincent back in this band this should be something exceptional this should be domination part two this should be whatever this should be you know pick the first four albums part two is what this should be if i was a management team or whoever's you know handling this band at this time and I'm hearing the demos for this shit. I'm like, listen, this is not where you, this is not what your fans want. I don't care what you think. If you think you're pushing boundaries here, you're not even in the same ballpark. You're, you're, you're doing a lame ass version of what you think is so groundbreaking. 
they're they're taking the lame ass version of it and 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 mixing it with the thing of it is the songs like you know destructo against man or whatever the fucking uh you know profundus mia culpa it's not even really mixed with good metal it's not even like they took morbid angel and mixed with electronic elements it's just shitty electronic shit like bottom feeder garbage i i've got an idea what this is like and i'm I'm gonna do a shitty version of it it's not even mixed if, if they took blades for bow and like tried to put it with uh radicult it's not there it's, it's like two or three leftover morbid angel songs from the last album session mixed in with this bullshit jenna tortures garbage this is i'm i've gone on way too long this is garbage number nine this is not a morbid angel album this is not a good album in any shape this makes cold lake look like fucking i don't know it makes cold lake this this Tom Warrior is smiling at the how shitty this album is because this makes fucking Cold Lake look good. It just does. This is garbage, garbage record. Anyway, how you doing, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> Laughing hurts when you have this much snot in your sinus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I went on a tangent there, and I don't even know where I was going with it. I'm just pissed. This album pisses me off. This is garbage. This is I, I the know, return to form. It, wherever you went, Marty, it was totally worth it when you made you know that pit stop for a uh, you know she used to fuck him <laughs> in the <laughs> sun stage, but whatever. I'm the man of the world. <laughs> <laughs> whatever gets you down the road, man. I don't care. How very I, continental I, I care. of you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, all good. Well, well, anyway, yeah, it's going to be number nine. And as Craig said, I mean, it, it really is one of the true disasters in heavy metal history. Sometime it might be fun to try to do a show, you know, and list those off and rank them somehow. I mean, it would just be an right. evening of crap, you know, low hanging fruit. But uh, we, we could probably have fun with that. You're trying to, you know, yeah, look at it somewhat straight faced. It really is bewildering how this was allowed to happen if there's a crew of management around this band and, and let this record get out the door they're yeah. either happy with the money they're making and are not going to say no to their, their 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 cash cow or they're just fucking stupid because this record and any <clears throat> if you're any sort of a metalhead this is not what metalheads that david vincent's returning to his fucking band no <clears throat> No, I, me, yeah. I, I'm going to say I'm going to say one thing just contrary to that. I think this is what David Vincent wanted to do. So I like I like and I, and I again I say this as a, as an artist who's not trying to appeal to the biggest group. So my guess is when they finished this, David Vincent probably thought it was something good. I oh, can't. we pushed the we pushed the boundaries on this one, Trey. <laughs> again, like he went into that genre, like he wants to do. Rob Zombie, Jenna Tortures, like that's the stuff that he wants to do. So my, I, I would feel that there's a good chance he believed in the album and that Trey was going along and that management was going along. And I would guess that there was some hope because obviously there are a couple songs on here that if they became hits, like the, the, the Rob Zombie stuff, like would have a potential for a bigger success level in a wider spread than anything they've ever done before. So obviously we think it's terrible and and it's and it is not for the metalheads it's not for us but I, like in terms of why management could be behind this and why the band was behind this my guess is David Vincent thought it was good uh I don't know what Trey thought uh the songwriting credits are mostly joined though I think Blades for Baal is just Trey um and and then a couple of the more offensive ones are just are, are just David Vincent it's kind of cloaked a little bit in, in the back but but I I do think um that management and people like they didn't like my guess is there was a little bit of we're pushing the boundaries, but there was a, a potential for there to be something a bit more breakout because it is such an obvious stab at the Rob Zombie things. And clearly, but Morbid it's Angel, bad not, Rob Zombie. Not, right, right. <laughs> but but Morbid Angel's not playing to a Rob Zombie sized crowd. And so my guess is even if the management thought this was terrible, it probably was some degree of this is terrible. But maybe a million idiotic Rob Zombie fans are going to eat this shit up. So that's a, this is total speculation. I have no idea. 
Hmm. But like how that could get through the gates, I could see uh, the the possibility of this being some juggernaut or breaking through in a way that death metal doesn't break through. I could see the management keeping quiet because of that. And I could see David Vincent thinking this album is awesome. The, thing, the management is probably thinking, well, if, if this hits, we're going to we're going to be rolling in the money. Because right. you know the death metal is, they're always going to have their core audience, and that's yeah, about it. On that, like, there's no, there's no death metal band that's playing to, to like Rob Zombie crowds. Yeah, in, in, at least in the states, maybe some somewhere in Europe or whatever. But um, so anyway, sorry, just just want to interject because I don't think <coughs> I think, I think there there is a bit of a my guess is there's some degree of dice rolling. I mean, Dave Mustaine couldn't have said it more clearly. The name of that shitty album is Risk, and that was the risk he was taking. Yep. It was like, let me just give it to you, dumb down, um, and let's see if I hit a uh, I hit a bigger level of success. Sorry, Alan. I I just I just no no. It. It's it's an it's an interesting thought. I don't know if I agree with it. Um, I'm trying to think about the timeline off the top of my head. Uh, trying to you know tap into the Rob Zombie audience. It feels like Rob's. I mean, no, I the white, yeah, but that's you know a very '90s kind of phenomenon. How popular was that stuff around that time? This this album was what 2011. I, I mean, the, I think Rob Zombie's still performing in an arena. Nine Inch Nails is ten times more layered and interesting than this. Oh, Nine Inch Nails! Is, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying, but I'm saying like in terms yeah. of their hoped for audience, I think Nine Inch Nails and 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 Rob Zombie, I think they're playing new arenas. I could be wrong on that. Um, but I, I, was, I, I don't know. I'm just saying, you know, you know, uh, White Zombie broke out, you know, in 1993, 1994, right. you know, and we're but even but, you know, their second album, you know, was already people were kind of burned out on it. I know the, you know, he's Rob Zombie's always going to have a fan base no matter, you know, what type of medium he's working in. Um, but, yeah, you know, with this coming out, you know, almost a decade later, um, maybe there maybe. Rob Zombie had some big comeback in 2009 I'm unaware of, and they were thinking, go with it. And I'm asking, honestly, because right around this time frame, 2009, 2010, 2011, I was paying very little attention to new metal releases. This was another one of those phases where I was mining through a lot of older stuff, 80s stuff and some 90s stuff I had missed. And as such, I don't really know what was very popular you know, in, you know, the mass consumption uh, area of heavy music around the turn of, you know, 2010. It, and so maybe if folks in the chat have a better feel for this, was there something that management could have been looking at and saying, yeah, we want to tap into that market. That it was probably Ramstein. I mean, Gavin. Kind I, of, I, you know, I, I mean, I think I got more human than human. I think that zombie was he was an arena guy. Um, but and he was an arena guy like six years earlier than he this. was that's an arena lifetime. guy in the nineties. Yeah, he's a, and that's a lifetime. For... Like he he is he's still performing at arenas now. Oh, but what was he? What was Zombie putting out in the mid to late two thousands that would have had record execs and stuff taking a legacy death metal band and saying, "Yeah, we really got to tap into you know that fresh new hip." Rob Zombie thing that came out 15 years ago. Oh, I, but to be clear, I don't think the executives told them to do it, but it is a question when Marty says, how could no one stop them from putting it out? I could see that that the, that management or or people who were concerned over its um, you know inherent shittiness might have said, well, there's a <laughs> there's a potential for this to break in a different way. But it, again, it, it, it's speculation. It's either like, going to be gold or it's going to be complete shit koozie. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, there, there could be something to that, Craig. I think we need a better benchmark um, than Rob Zombie for 2011 was, my, I guess, my point there, that there okay. had to be – maybe there was something Rob Zombie – maybe the next generation of Rob Zombie was a thing in 2010, and I just don't know it. Well, um, I was like, I don't know the Disturbed, Slipknot, Seven Dust. I don't know any of that stuff. Right, so yeah. I, maybe it, maybe probably, it's Disturbed. When the hell was Disturbed popular? I have no idea. I have no idea. That also feels like maybe it was too early, but that, that you, yeah. Now maybe there was something like that that they right. were thinking they could latch onto. It's like they were like trying to latch onto something they were too late to the game of, you know. May, yeah, maybe. I mean, sure. I think it's fair to say 
that you know a lot of the really shitty elements for this album are coming from you know vincent's direction you know that he's he's brought this you know baggage with him from the jenna tortures camp you know that he's the one pulling those elements in but even then trey's not exactly you know just you know the laid back easy going guy who lets anybody walk in the door and do anything with his sound you know um Trey had to go along with that stuff yes. and be on board with it to, for it ever to get near the album. The band had been, cause there's what an eight year gap between this and heretics. Um, so, I mean, the, the band had been, yeah, eight yeah. years. I mean, yep. the band had been cooling its jets for a long time. And in there, they were doing, I think the live shows with Dave Vincent. So probably like they're seeing like the reaction. <laughs> like you're seeing David, <laughs> At that point, he's not doing songs off of like formulas or gateways. It's like all oh, it's first four hours. That's just it. They're doing yeah. they're doing a victory lab. Dave's back in the band of old classic shit. The first four albums. Yeah. Why? 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 Yeah. That, and, and why? Even, yeah, even beyond that, you know, let's let's say you know they've done okay. Let's say they've done that victory lap. They've done those tours. They played the old hits. Folks have come out. It's gone over well. And so then they're talking to to Dave, and you know they say, hey. Why not get back in the fold and let's do another album? There's obviously a mark, you know, there's obviously still, we're going to get a reaction. There's a market for that. Then why does Dave say, sure, but I will insist on wrenching things into the direction of my, you know, former, you know, e EBM, you know, uh, porno grind, you know, BS kind of, you know, lame project like, you know, Ooh, look, you know, you know, she's wearing latex. I guess that appeals to 13-year-old incels or something. It has no interest to me. Right. Or, or it's not going to appeal to Morbid Angel's fan base. And if Dave does that, why does the rest of the band go along with it? Or if Dave, in a, a different parallel path, I, I'm trying to go through all the, you know, the different branches of the multiverse here. When Dave says that, for whatever reason, why is Trey so desperate to keep him and get him back in for a new album that he goes along with it? I mean, he's the only one. I mean, at this point, he's also the only one there. Like Tucker had left twice, and yeah. Andoval is retired or just gone. Yeah. There isn't another guitarist, so I, I, you, I don't know. Like he's going around with like, like, uh, you know, I, maybe like this, this rudderless ship. I mean, it's all, it's all speculation. I think to some yeah. degree, he had to, he had to believe in this. To some degree, I don't think that there's no way yeah. the album comes out and he thinks it's terrible when it's coming out. I mm -hmm. think that like, my, my my feeling is he thought that he thinks there's there's some good stuff there. I think probably David Vincent thinks there's more, and he's kind of hoping, you know, and that that I feel, you know, as like an artist that that's that can be an empty experience if you're having like your whole like whether it's successful or not. It depends on the reaction that other people have. Yeah. So yeah, it's just. It's really weird to find the pathway where this album came to be. That they had to, they had to be so dead set on Dave being back in the band that they would accept these weird ass ideas. That Dave had to be so into these ideas that he was convinced they were going to be a big thing, even when you know he'd been touring with them and seeing that folks were rabid for the old stuff and that was nothing like this. It's just, yeah, there, there are so many checkpoints that just don't make sense for how this ever came to exist. And yet it did. And we're stuck with it. Yep. Um, it keeps so, coming back to me. It's kind of like Gorefest's Gore uh, <laughs> uh, false album. That, yep. that I give it away and it comes back to me anyway. I, it's it's a hard you know it's it's out there it's funny you know like you know from time to time you know I'll just you know pull up you know all morbid angel stuff on discogs you know and just I, I tend to sort you because I'm a cheap bastard I always sort by the price lowest first <laughs> and you always start seeing copies of this album pop up you know ninety nine cents a dollar well they're selling it on the the season miss site for four bucks so uh, yeah. obviously season miss went all in on this and they got handed a fucking turd sandwich. and yeah yeah they they uh, yeah they got played hard on it. Now yeah, to, my, well, my guess is you could find something on Discogs where, where where you will make a profit by accepting it. Like if you provide <laughs> the dress and pay ten dollars to take this thing, right? Yeah, but, um, I don't think that's out of the question. Yeah, let's <laughs> uh, let's I, look at the songs here. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Yeah, let me look at the songs here for a minute. 
there are a couple of passable things here. You know, if you really wade through it, there's a few things. Um, yes, you know, you have, you know, we start off, you know, too extreme. The song title alone already tells you you're in for a real bad time here. <laughs> and it absolutely, yeah, absolutely is. No doubts about it. Um, you do after that, you get... There's, there's this little glimmer of hope with two songs that are at least kind of passable. You know, Existo Vulgari isn't great, but it's Foul. not wretched. And then you do have Blades of Ball, which, okay, that's a decent enough song. Yeah, yeah, for, the for, there's a moment there. there there's, a, there's a little moment right there between tracks four. Right, well, let me look at three and four. Tracks four and five, where you can think to yourself, before track five begins, you can think to yourself, maybe that was a fluke. It was a long intro. Maybe <laughs> I, intro is an intro, but you you might can think that you know too extreme is maybe 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 they just shit the bed on this one weird opening track and they're going to write the ship. But then track five begins and you realize that nah nah it wasn't a fluke. Um, and, but what else have we got here? Ten more dead. Yeah, as Craig said, you know, vocally it's an abomination. I feel like there's a decent, there's some decent riff or rhythm there underneath it. So there's some parts maybe that are just yeah used for a good song. But if, if David hadn't got a hold of it and started you know rapping the vocals over it, and then of course yes, there's Destructus. Um, dear God, Destructus, um, Destructus. <laughs> yes, and and uh, Craig Tim was you know, so stars, very very man. happy that uh, you he, he, you found your tagline for the morning. <laughs> <into episode. laughs> uh, absolutely, it, it is the Frankenstein of the evening. <laughs> um, Nevermore is not a great Morbid Angel song. It was as a uh, someone maybe Falafel pointed out in the chat that was the song they led with as a single. Which when you talk about misleading Woo! a bit, yeah, um, they knew but, they but knew. What, yeah, they they knew and they they rolled that one out there to try to yeah lessen the hurt, but yeah and then you know it just so you never more okay you know on any other album it'd be pretty nondescript here it gets a pass, but yeah then you've got you know radical and just to to clarify you know yeah all the jokes and stuff the ly- the lyrics that are published it says kill a killer cult. But yes, the way David sounds like kill a cop. It sounds like kill a cop. Kill a cop. The only reason I know this is because hearing him say that, I'm just like, I really doubt that's what he is saying. So let me go look it up. And yes, the the published lyrics are killer cult. But that's obviously not what it's pronounced as. Uh, And then, yes, the the Mia culpa abortion at the end, too, is just awful. So. If you wanted to be as generous as possible, you might could call an EP out of this album. If you took, uh, if you took, it's Blades a tough Ball, sell, man. It's a tough. Take, take Blades tough. of Ball, Nevermore, Existo Vulgari, and I'm, I'm a single with a B side, like it'll Blades of Ball, Existo. That's sort. I may, maybe a three track EP and, okay. and and put like a live track on it to add the fourth song or something. Okay. Um, you you might could call a lukewarm EP out of it. I'm not even saying it would be a good EP. Right. Uh, it it would just be like, well, okay, this is an EP of so so morbid angel ideas. Um, so I, I'm yeah, and that's as diplomatic as I can be. But as you said too, Craig, you know the 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 horrible stuff on here. It is as bad as it is. It's again. so overwhelmed with shit. Yeah, it's it just, so over. It's so on. It's so lopsided. Yeah, and, and again, you know, it just circles back. To, how did it happen? I mean, if it's an if it's some new band who's you know trying to you know, ape someone else's you know sound. Okay, bands do that all the time. If it's been, if it's a completely different lineup, you know, if it's you know David Vincent's Morbid Angel, he can do whatever he wants to with it. But Trey's still there. Yeah. I don't know how this album ever came to exist. I just don't get it. Um, it's a fucking farce, man. It's a fucking farce. This should have been. This should have been. This should have owned. <laughs> this should have reset the death metal climate. It should have. It there, this, there's yeah. a lot riding on this record, and it doesn't. It's a fucking. 
limp dick attempt at something stupid. It's so it, stupid. Th- this should have, you know, at the end of the day, the, if this, if they got to this point where they were all, you know, in a studio somewhere trying this out, they should have you know, done a couple of rough mixes of this, played it back. <clears throat> Multiple people in the chain of command should have heard it and been like, you know what? This this just ain't going to work. Rob Zombie, I would have been. Rob Zombie did it better. And if I was their, their management team, Ramstein, Rob Zombie, they're better than you in this style. Don't do it. Yeah, yeah, if, if, just... you, if you could come up with a Ramstein or Rob Zombie level song that competes, then fine. Throw your hat in the ring. But this isn't. This is fucking bullshit. It's bullshit. Yeah, it's not. I would have been fired, but I I would have said, "Look, bro, not good, not good." Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the the album it, it, people always, of course, you know, love to you know rant and shit on albums that they don't like. And to be honest, let's face it, a lot of times you know there, there, there's a lot of hyperbole that goes on. This is one of those rare cases where the hyperbole really is justified. Yeah, no, this is it. It, it, this is yeah this is scraping the bottom of the barrel um on a big macro scale among the heavy metal underground but uh i, th- I think we have uh i think we've torched this one enough we have, we have burnt it down and salted the earth so um jay or i yes jay craig what's yeah. jay 2017 uh k k no this k we don't want to stop on Jay. What's Jay? The Juvenilia thing? I guess so. I don't even own Jay. Uh, Jay is the, yeah, the live album, Juvenilia. The Juvenilia thing. Yeah, I have that paired up with, I listened to it once. It was okay. Um, <laughs> then right on to K we go. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I'm not, pre- uh, yeah, I wasn't prepared to, to, de- to deal with the Jay. I listened to it. I, I just wanted to give you the chance in case you did have anything you wanted. No, to I, I, I listened to it once. I, I thought it was. It's all uh, fine. Uh, I'd say like the Abominations is better than that. And then My Kingdom Come is actually good in terms of the not real albums. Um, uh, so um, we're at their most recent album. I actually, when, when I did my review of the full catalog, because I didn't want it to go this like this route, which is kind of depressing. It's like I, I was... I it was pretty depressing actually watching you and King Fally go through the Kiss catalog because there's just a certain <laughs> point. Have a little more Angel. Like they have one album I hate and I like the rest. Um, but when I did my like listen through to make notes for this, I started with Kingdoms so that I could get, and, and I just went in reverse order so that I could get um, <laughs> the shit heap over with early. Um, and uh, so Kingdoms disdained. Um, uh, so Scotty Fuller is playing drums. He's pretty, he's pretty locked in. Uh, it's a real, the drum, the bass drums sound like real, um, sound like real drums. It doesn't sound like it's tri- like the bass drums sound real. Um, the overall kind of macro on the album is, is I think it's decent. It's a little bit in the formulas fatal to the flesh sort of style of like, it really could have used some more definitively catchy moments and catchy in a good way, not in the 10 more dead, like not in that <laughs> art district. Those. Like it, it, it really <laughs> used some, some more hooks um, that, that are, that are that, but like, and this is why I say like, in terms of, of, of Trey and what he's doing and stuff like that, like this sounds like the album he wanted to make. This is pretty uncompromising. I would say this is absolutely the least joyful album in their career. Like this is a head down um, complex. At times you have like that that aesthetic of of really kind of two songs going on at the same time. He's going further along these lines. So it's something to wrap your mind around. Some of the arrangements to me don't cohere. Overall, I think it's decent. Um, like I said, like there's the, obviously the previous album is terrible. This album is decent. I went back and forth between is this one eight or is this one seven and heretic. Like I think ultimately heretic has more highlights. Uh, this one, uh, uh, obviously a course let's in, in a way, this album sounds like the last album didn't even have them like illu divinum, uh, whatever satanus or whatever it is. Sanus, this album could have just immediately followed heretic. Uh, and it seems it's explore. It, it's sort of that like, Trey lost in his thoughts exploring 
riffs warring against each other and um uh but like where i think that like praise the strength is sort of like the joyful moment on that in terms of like their swagger and and they're they're enjoying it like this album pretty much lacks that uh uh so piles piles of little arms the opener that's one of the two best songs on the album um i feel um uh, it just leaps immediately in. And this, I think the statement of intent and why I say this seems like a course correction, not so much like it's as if the previous album didn't happen, but a course correction from Heretic because they're like, it is going to be me. We're not going to give you tons of interludes, keyboards. This is going to be a four piece for the most part. The, the playing is going to sound live. Uh, they have a drummer who's quite capable. And I feel that this has that like this is the kind of stripped back to basics um old meat album and like that that uh that lord of steel man of war album in a way like that was a bit of a course correction from gods of war which has like loaded with like 30 minutes of interludes and reading poetry and stuff and then they give you the next album and it's like 10 songs and they're all songs uh and then i feel kingdoms disdained is a bit that course correction so positive little arms that's the first song i think it's good you leap immediately in with like this kind of skip pop 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 um and uh it's pretty cool uh the 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 tucker it's like i mean they peak i think this is the best song on the album but that like they come to bring us whatever that whole thing that chant i think is good um they come to bring us gifts they come to make us whole and then it gets into this really like kind of cool groove like bum 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 and so like the intricacy and the unique uh riff writing and 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 playing style of trey it's like you're immediately there like this first song your doubts are just like in case you think it's like all all destructo time or industrial uh stabs or edm stabs or whatever it is like that that's there i'll say like as a macro in addition to it sounding like a live band there's always a line for me. It's like, I don't want extremely dissonant death metal. Um, I think to some extent, Morbid Angel introduced dissonance into death metal. Um, you know, particularly some, some of that stuff I pointed out on the earlier albums. I was like, wow, I don't know. Like, I'm not hearing that on Death or Bolt Thrower or Carcass or these other bands. Like, they're like, here it is. And so this album is a little bit too dissonant for me. Um, and... Uh, like the like the at the two minute fifty five uh, mark of this song, man, it re it's really getting very very dissonant. But um, overall, I think this is a good song. It's got a little bit of swagger. That they come to bring us gifts. Uh, they come to uh, make us whole. Like all of those those chants are good. And then that bump 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 bump. Good stuff. Uh, then the next song, Dead or D E A D. Um, this is you get the diverging rhythms uh in terms of the, what the guitars are doing noise chords are happening the break it's really dissonant uh lurch core i don't think it's bad but it's it doesn't feel like a song it just feels like a bunch of parts um garden of disdain the third track um there's some swagger in this one this is like a lesser gateways cut and um the mood on this one is a little bit more consistent than the last, but, uh, you know, not, not really special. The Righteous Voice. Um, uh, some slow stuff into some fast stuff. Uh, the blasts are really, like, locked in when they happen in this. So this is, like, you know, with this guy, Scotty Fuller, and I don't know if he is still the drummer. Like, when I, when I see them on Tuesday, am I seeing, am I seeing them with Scotty Fuller or somebody else? I know there's another guitarist um, who, who maybe plays on one song on this album. It's Vadim Van... What is this guy's name? Do, do either of you know it? Um, he just kind of makes like a guest on this thing, but he is the other... Uh, Daniel... Daniel Van Vadim Vaughn. Yeah, so that guy... Um, Track 9. Yeah, so lead. he's on... He plays the lead guitar. Yeah, so... And I think that's the guy, like, I think that's who I saw them with. I think w when I saw them, that that sort of disconnected show with, with Cannibal Corpse and Necrot. Um, this is fine. Uh, so let me point out, three minutes, 28 seconds in the fourth song. The first time you get, like, 
an evil tremolo melody. You go through a lot of material of like chunky dissonant stuff, lurching stuff, all of this sort of stuff before you get something that would be kind of consistent, um, like or kind of consistent with like the altars, um, blessed, like traditional death metal. So it's really some time. You're like almost 20 minutes into this album, and um, before you get something that's like, oh, this is like evil, evil death metal. Um, before you get something along the lines of, the, of that classic sound. So like to me, they are exploring all these bunched up rhythms and all of this dissonance. So I think it's what they want to do. It's just not. It, it 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 it's I I enjoy it at a mild level while it's going on, but doesn't stick with me except for the fifth song, which to me is the other highlight, the architect and iconoclast, the um the 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 phrase that the, I have not forgotten. I am uh, the 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 you mock my name. Have you forgotten? And then banana nah, this re really weird uh, dissonant chord that sounds like it's some sort of in like some not Western mode. Um, and and then it gets into this really like kind of like like almost like post rock uh, rock out in the post chorus. So that tune I enjoy. Those are the, those are really the two pile of little arms and architect and iconoclast. I enjoy both of those. Paradigm warped, um, creeping, lurching um, stuff. A really dissonant, um, like really dissonant, really really dissonant stuff. Like this, like paradigms warp. I feel like here here we're stra This is like this is sludge. This is like, I, I feel like more an angel like crossed the line with that song. It's not bad. It's just not, I'm, I mean, I'm not a fan of sludge. Uh, Pillars crumbling. Um, the grooving of the vocals. I don't, I don't love there. Uh, Trey, I think Trey comes in with some of that stuff. Um, the, uh, the song like three and a half minutes starts to get some momentum and maybe the best moment on the album is the solo in this song that comes in at, at, at about four minutes. Uh, so that one has this really good solo. And whenever I hear it, it really lifts. Um, it really lifts the song uh, and the album. Cause it's like, it really is a grinding joyless experience. Uh, Ferno master is written by Tucker in this and in the drummer. Um, and it seems like the riff from King of All Kings by Eric Rutan. Like whenever I hear this, I'm like, oh, it's King of All Kings. Um, uh, the catchiness on this, the here I sing, not good. That's a little bit of leftover from the last album, even though written by two people who weren't on the last album. Uh, Declaring a New Law um, has some good vocals. Um the, the the torture any fool that does not submit is a pretty good refrain. The solo, which which I think this is the one Daniel Vadim Vaughn uh, in an Egyptian mode is really nice. Uh, it that one that's let's say that's the third behind the two highlights from the Hand of Kings. Um, it's okay. Um, you got a lot of squeak on the right hand. It's really noisy. The guitars, the guitars are noisy and dissonant and sludgy and like uh, it's it's it is an unpleasant sound. Uh, Fall of Idols is pretty fast, pretty straightforward, um, and uh, there's the 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 We Demand a Victor's Feast is a pretty good refrain. So Tucker has like a handful of good like memorable moments on this. Uh, and they should have ended the song with Praise No Man as Savior rather than the solos, but decent enough. Like, so this is an album of all, like, after the abomination of the previous one and all of the messing around on Heretic, this is an album that's giving you all meat, but it's really dissonant, noisy, cluttered, chunky, unpleasant, humorless, joyless stuff. So that's why I say, like, I don't, I, like, I think this is the album that, that he wanted to make at this time. It sounds pretty angry, and it sounds pretty un like and like like it doesn't seem very interested whether you enjoy it at all or not. Which, to some degrees, I think I think is is commendable. Like this seems like where his head was at, and um, there's there's some interesting stuff. Uh, that's that's the last album you know by by this band. I am I'm I I I, I wouldn't be surprised if they put out another album and it's really good. I think. Getting some synergy back with with Tucker is going to be key. Like I, I you know, like I, I adore Gateways, and I think that that he's a talented person and is a good songwriter. 
And if they, you know, if they're touring around and getting getting some of that synergy back, maybe we'll get something better. But you know, this this one is um, uh, a a an, an ugly and 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 pretty joyless experience, but decent. I think that's what they were going for. I don't think they have anything anywhere near as dissonant as some of it. The, like they have moments in songs, like the last song that Rattan wrote on Gateways is super dissonant, but like. There's a lot of dissonance on this album. What did you rank this at, Craig? Uh, so this is eight. Yep. This one, this one, and Heretic go back and forth. Like this is this is something like Heretic has so much filler, but I definitely like Praise the Strength more than any anything. And then the like that last proper cut, like that that has a little bit more variety and 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 joy, um, but. Um, yeah, like, the, like these two are like this is the these are the two where I say like these really are the same rating for me for different reasons. I'm really, sh I mean, I, it's my number eight as well, and it's kind of funny how we're all very similar on these this last half of their career. But um, uh, for me, sitting here while you're talking, I looked up and I'm shocked that Eric Rutan was the producer, the engineer, and the mixer of this record. This is the album. I mean, I bought this hoping for the best after the... I, I did a brief comment. I didn't know that, but that would explain their most dissonant... Like, he's interested in dissonance and that. I think it was the fourth Hate Eternal album, like Fury and Flames or whatever that one was. Like, Hate Eternal had Conquering the Throne is really good. King of Kings was their best. And then the third, I think, was I, Monarch, and that was getting pretty noisy. But then that fourth one is like a maelstrom of dissonance. And I think almost unlistenable so i didn't know what you just said uh, until like until now i probably knew it when it came out but that makes sense like he's very interested in exploring dissonance yeah and and really <sighs> this album to me sounds like they went to the the drummer scotty and said hey mix this <laughs> because it sounds like a drummer mix this record because it's all drums it's loud it is funny because you're you're talking about these specific riffs and stuff i've listened to this album multiple times when i bought it i listened to it multiple times this week trying to connect with it and it is produced so shitty and it isn't just i want to say it's the mix but then you get to like uh declaring new law secret hell that track where that you could hear the guitar by itself the guitar tone is bad it's really bad it's rounded off it's more like a blunt object and when this album first came out, me and TJ were talking about it during practice because I talked about, I was bitching about the productions, all drums. He said he read a recent -ish interview with Trey where Trey was saying when he was younger, he thought that guitars were drum. He treated guitars as a percussive instrument, more like a drum. He heard in his head that it just came off as guitars need to be more percussive. And that's kind of what this is. The whole thing is a very percussive sounding record. The, the drums are way in your face. It's all vocals and drums. And, um, the guitars are completely lost. There's it, my favorite, but it does not produce, you know, it, there's still a song that produces. It's good. It's, uh, the righteous voice, which is a Steve Tucker song. It's like every song is mixed a little bit differently. And that song, you can actually hear a little bit of what's going on in the music. Not much, but a little bit. And that song stood out to me as, as one of the better ones on here. But if you're going to write the ship after knowing you fucked up on the last album and you've got Eric Rutan, who's a great producer, he's great. He, you know, he knows what he needs to do to make an album sellable. And again, this is Morbid Angel. This is a legacy band at this point. These guys come in your door trying to save face after this last abomination they just invested time and money on. You mix this thing so the music stands out. You get Trey a good guitar tone. The guitar tone on here is not a good guitar tone. It's rounded off and crappy. It's uh, like I said, it's like you know, a monkey hitting with a rock trying to open up a shell is what the guitar tone sounds like to me. And it just doesn't, it doesn't, it, it completely makes this album completely alienating. I can't pick up on any of the music. I can't hear any of the riffs with any definitive. I can't get a definitive take on what I think of any of this. I, 
as an as a uh, presentation i like the overall presentation it, it's hammering the drummer is the scotty guy is right on his game 100 percent. but to me drums are great and you recognize a great drum performance but drums don't sell a song it, it's got to be the riffs the vocals interacting with the riffs the melodies the, the solos the drums are a timekeeper and in this case, putting the drums and the vocals at the forefront of your album is a fail. Otherwise, this would have been a, a potentially there's 11 fucking songs on this record. It's a long record. There's a lot going on, but all I can hear or all my brain goes to are the drum, how loud the drums are and how loud the vocals are. I think this album is a, a lost opportunity. Apparently, Trey put up on the Bandcamp page. He remixed the album. I don't know what that means. I haven't gone on Morbid Angel's Bandcamp page to check it out because ultimately at this point in their career, I don't care. I hate to say that because it sucks. It sucks because this band is so great. And left to his own devices, Trey time and time again has made bad decisions with an otherwise amazing legacy. It's it's sad. It really is sad to me. And um, yeah, this is number eight because there was already something dominating owning the ninth spot <laughs> yes <laughs> if if it wasn't for i mean this could have been so much better if it was mixed differently and recorded differently but it wasn't and i'm getting to the point where i'm really tired of paying money for albums for a hope and and and, and morbid angel at this point really hasn't had a good payoff in a long time alan your thoughts <clears throat> okay. Uh, so yeah, thoughts on this one. I'll start where I'm ranking it. I'm ranking this one seventh, and I'm on the same page as Craig. It, this and Heretic could flip flop. I had Heretic at eighth, but those two could flip, and it, it, it wouldn't make a huge difference to me. Uh, this album, um, not as harsh on it as you were, Marty. I. Craig's description is kind of close to my own. It's you know them saying, "We done fucked up. Here, here's what you wanted. Here's a great big slab of death metal. Uh, Eleven tracks, forty-seven minutes. No instrumentals, no interludes, no quirky space things with gas giants or any of that. It just you know, Steve, come come, come help us out and uh, let's all put our heads down and just you know absolutely bore through this. Um, and yeah, hope that people will let let it. To, <clears throat> we, we can all just forget what happened last time. Um, yeah, you know, a couple of songs you know that stand out for me. Uh, some of the same uh, ones that Craig mentioned, like uh, Gardens. Was it Gardens? Sorry, I'm losing my track list here. Yeah, Gardens of Sustain. Uh, it's probably my favorite on here. Architect and Iconoclast, pretty yeah. good. Um, Paradigms Warped, I kind of like, too. It didn't quite bog down as much for me. This isn't an album, though, I've played a lot either. Um, this is another one that I did need to spend some more th uh, this week and just haven't been able to with, uh, <clears throat> with the hay fever messing up my schedule. But yeah, I, I mean, it's a you know pummeling album. But overall, it's definitely focusing on the heavy side of things for sure gore metal thank you very much you've been way too generous way tonight, too kind tonight I'm really glad that you got to check us out uh live this time around um yeah that's really uh really great you've contributed a lot not just in money but also in comments in the chat too so thank you so much um so yeah i overall you know <clears throat> while this, there's not necessarily a ton of standout moments on it it does what it needs to it you know corrects course puts the band back on track um production yeah it, it is not a great production i don't know if i've heard maybe the version i've been listening to marty is like the tray remix or something the oh, guitars are definitely this. low in the yeah. mix that i'm hearing but it doesn't strike me as you know really badly mixed as you know what you've described but so maybe i'm hearing the other version i don't know i've, I've, I've just listened to it online so it's not always clear, like, you know, which version, you know, somebody's... Yeah, my, my rea I mean, I have the same version that Marty is. My reaction to the mix isn't as, isn't as extreme. I, I just think the lack of, of 
some of the hooks and uh, the, the mm -hmm. overwhelming dissonance is more the thing. So I have the same okay. version he does. I'm not hearing it the way he is. It's not. It's not like I don't think the production is good by any stretch. But it, it isn't like if these songs were amazing, I would still be able to love this album. So what we're saying, Marty, is you're wrong. <laughs> I could be wrong, but I listen to this record. All I can hear are drums and vocals. I can't hear riffs. No, I, the I, riffs I are completely wrong. Headphones, by the way, so that might that might help. Like it this might help. One, this Some might other folks in the chat have said that they they played it on headphones and they thought it sounded okay that way. So it, maybe that's part of it. I don't could know. Could be. Oh, and a quick aside in terms of uh, joking. Also, Darren in the chat, what, whatever I did to you, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Darren has suggested I listen to Iliud and Chameleon back to back as a way to clear up my sinuses. <laughs> then it would clear up my sinuses because I'd have to put a gun to my head and blow everything out. Chame and... Chameleon crushes Iliud, by the way. Yeah. Dude, Chameleon is rust in peace compared to Iliud. <laughs> 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 that, is, that is not a. a like, oh, Legitimately oh, enjoyable yeah. stuff, I feel on Chameleon. And There's a Craig, couple songs Craig, down there that the are good. In the rib cage, at, uh, <laughs> easy. La laughing hurts. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think the album it did. While it's known not going to ever rank among their greats, I think it did what it needed to do in terms of trying to put the band maybe back on track. The question is, where does that track go from here? I mean, something else that's worth noting about this album. You know, before this, of course, you know, the band, you know, had been, you know, back in the day, you know, Giant had distributed their stuff, you know, you know, on mass production, you know, they had earache behind them. You know, even, you know, with, you know, Iliad, you know, the Season of Mist, you know, is a you know, pretty big label with good distribution in the underground. <clears throat> and this album is on something called Silver Lining, which, while y'all have been talking, I got curious and pulled up their roster Silver Lining, it looks like they're stationed in London. Uh, let me read off a few of uh, the notable acts here. And there are notable acts, but you think you're going to notice a pattern. Silver Lining is home to things like Alcatraz, <laughs> Annihilator, some of the last couple of Motorhead albums, recent Saxon releases. What are we noticing here? Washed up bands. All old bands that are generally considered past their prime. Not just not legacy bands that are still knocking it dead. The, this is like the retirement home for metal <laughs> bands. Kind of like. Silver lining. And, <laughs> Sounds and, like a, a retirement home. Come on down to silver lining. <laughs> yes. We'll sponge um, your balls real good. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can hope for a, a Graham Bonnet guest guest vocal appearance on the next cover. <laughs> Voice of golden denim. <laughs> Laughing hurts. <laughs> and not knocking into those bands. I still like you know albums that some of those bands are doing. But yeah, there, there's a pattern. This is a label where older bands are going to get signed because the newer labels that are you know picking up the cutting edge bands, the leading bands, the bands that are blowing up, aren't signing them. That says a lot that a band with Morbid Angel's legacy ended up on Silver Lining. And it speaks to something you said a minute ago, Marty, that, you know, I think it, this while well, this album maybe gets them back on track, is it too little too late? Oh, totally. Because another problem here is, and we've hinted at this earlier, Morbid Angel has been a, a very non-prolific in the 21st century. I mean, they're at like man of war levels of not putting shit out in the 21st century. You, you, we covered all the way through a through G and by the year 2000. And so in the 23 years since gateways came out and let that sink in for a minute, that gateways is 23 years old, a quarter of a century old. God, that makes me sad in that time. Thanks they've released last. three studio albums. They've released Heretic, which was three years later. And then they released Iliud, which, yeah, we we spent enough time on that. And this, that's all they have to show for new material in the last 23 years. That's a band that is barely registering a pulse. I mean, yes, maybe they're playing live a ton, but that's, you're going out and playing the hits, you know? Uh, kind of thing you're, you're not torn to support new albums you don't have any new albums you're barely putting out one per decade at that rate 
Uh, and as such, you know, Morbid Angel, I think at this point, you've just got to consider them. They are, yes, you know, no one's going to challenge their legacy as, you know, pillars, titans, you know, the legendary forefathers and all of that. Vlad, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Sorry, I'm and and laps. Chat. You guys are, and you guys are yes, crazy tonight. Thank you so much. You. Laps. Thank you, too. Uh, really, really kind of y'all to do the Super Chats tonight. We do appreciate it a lot. But yeah, I mean, at this point, I mean, you just kind of have to think of Morbid Angel was a 90s band. And while they're still technically active, what have, what have they done for anybody in the past 20 years? I, it sounds kind of harsh, but there's just not that much there. Even for you know, like the folks that like Heretic, that's cool. Okay, Heretic's 20 years old. You have two decades with two albums to show for it. One of them, which literally was a car crash, you know, uh, you know, etched into plastic discs with a laser. And one of them is this album that's, you know, trying to just, you know, say like, no, nah, sorry, we, uh, here, here, we're, we'll put out, you know, a, a good, but kind of, you know, straightforward death metal album. Y you don't lead the scene anymore doing that. You, you're not an innovator in any genre if that's your output. So, I, you know, does Train Company have another album? Are they going to come roaring back with something? Uh, impressive? I don't know. It's already been, what, six years since Kingdoms came out. Some folks in the chat mentioned they didn't even know Kingdoms ever came out. That they, they completely <laughs> lost track after Iliad. The only thing I'm seeing on Morbid Angel's radar for 2023 right now is a cassette box set of the first four albums that Eric is putting out. So, um, you know, if we're lucky, it'll be packaged in a Ziploc bag with a couple of Xerox uh, copies of J cards in it. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's kind of sad in a way. It's just, it's one of those, you know, you know, bands who were, you know, top of their game, you know, through the 1990s. And since then, they just, you know, kind of, uh, while nobody was looking, they just kind of ground to a halt. And, and again, I, I hadn't thought of it before. It's a little bit like Man of War's catalog. Man of War gets to a certain point, and they just don't put out new stuff. They go back and <laughs> here's another two CD live album, and um, we'll re-record our 1983 album with a new lineup and uh, try to sell you that. Right. Thanks, well, guys. I, yeah. What one thing I'll say, sort of in defense of Trey. I'll save the man award offense for a whole for a whole other thing, but uh, sure. <laughs> like like I I, I one of the few people on the planet that like Gods of War. Yeah, I'm, 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 I, I Craig. Other bands play man of war shills. No, um, <laughs> uh, I I, th I I mean I think no matter what Trey is um, Trey Atticode is a, is a super interesting artist who created. Um, you know, two of my top five death metal, albums, three of my top 10 favorite death metal albums of all time. So there's that. And um, when I when I listen to Kingdoms Disdained, uh, again, like there's all the joylessness and um, uh, dissonance and, you know, kind of muted production and, and, all, and all that sort of stuff going on. But to me, that like that it is an autopilot. And I feel like. This is someone in, in, and I just say this like sort of from, um, uh, yeah, Man of Warrior. Um, this is it. This is it. I, I think Trey is a serious artist, and I think he's. Uh, there's some struggling with sure. what the fans want and what and what he wants to do. And in terms of like, would I be shocked if there's no other Ma Morbid Angel album um, ever released? No. Would I be shocked if the next Morbid Angel album? is no more satisfying than Kingdom's Disdain or Heretic. No. Would I be shocked if they made a straight-up really good album? No. And this is a way, like, I, and I'll say, like, this is uh, this is sort of my belief, like, let's say with Dave Mustaine, who I think is riff-writing royalty, I think one of the one of the all-time greats. Mm -hmm. uh, and, like, you can count them out, and, but then, um, like, the song Soldiers On in the, in the most recent Megadeth album, like, the song is great. And, uh, I, I think there is a there's an artist there in with Trey um, that works best when when there's someone partnered with him. Eric Rattan on Domination and, and Steve Tucker on 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 Gateways in terms of some songwriting stuff. But I wouldn't be surprised if we get something really good, if we get something kind of like Kingdoms and Heretic, or if we don't get anything. 
But I, I think you listen to Kingdom's Disdain, and I, 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 I'll, I'll sort of, uh, and I think Alan, you said something like it's like kind of straight ahead death metal, and he, and I don't think it is at all. Like I think this is the death metal that only um, Morbid Angel plays in terms of like <coughs> at the same time setting against this triplet lurching with rolling double bass and then a tremolo set against it. Like there's a singular vision there and the space between releases is colossal. And clearly these last three releases for all three of us are, are the bottom three. So it's hard to be that, that hopeful, but um, I, I think it's someone with a unique riff writing and songwriting voice and um, I, I, I'll continue to maintain hope. Like I, it's the same thing with Dave Mustaine or a Bath. And I think a Bath. I liked his first solo album. And I think the next two. I think the second one was was kind of bad. And I thought the third one was mediocre. So that was someone like I think he's he's riff writing royalty as well. And like I'm gonna keep giving him the benefit of the doubt. And then my, he may never come back. I mean, there's there's a point like there may be like seven, eight a Bath albums, and none of them compared to that first one or any of the good immortal albums. And it could be the same with Trey, but I, 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 I suppose what I'm saying is someone who's created domination and, uh, and alters alters of madness and uh, gateways to annihilation in the sound and the harmonic pinches throughout death metal. And, uh, and maybe the second wave of, of black metal with chapel of ghouls and the way that that thing works someone who's created that much like as long as he's putting out music i'm just going to give him the better for the doubt and i'm always going to have hope because this is someone who's just defined the genre so many ways i don't think in terms of an innovator i don't know that we'll ever get that again and one thing i'll say uh that might have led to the illu disaster um is that's probably some of it i could see someone who is that innovative wanting to really be innovative and do something new and although the three of us hate the shit out of that that second to last album that was something new so he is trying something new and that's like the only marginal defense i could ever come up with for that album was he's trying something because um maybe writing another gateways although i would love that or writing another domination or alters that would be amazing for me that might not satisfy him as an artist. He's a weird dude. Even when you see him read, like read his interviews, my experience interviewing him, stuff like that. Like it's hard to know. He's pretty inscrutable, and I don't even get a sense that when he answers the questions, you're really getting the truth. I think it's just sort of a, you know, here, like here's what he's going to say in his interview. Um, but but I, like the legacy for me, like with him, uh, you know, like with this band and with Carcass and like certain bands, it's like. Yeah, as long as they're putting out album, he could put out five shitty albums. I'm buying the six shitty album. Like the legacy is too strong. No, that's fair, Craig. And yeah, and uh, if I came off, you know, harsh on Kingdoms, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think it's a bad album. Right. Um, it's one that yeah, I'll, I'll spend more uh, as I get time for it. But um, yeah, I don't like yeah, it. Much do, you, do you think? Um, just listening to what you said there, do you think it would have uh, quote unquote helped? You know. Did Trey need like a side project at some point? Did he you know he need, have some ideas that he just needed to get out, and a different vehicle would have been you know been maybe a better place for some of the stuff that you know went in. He's not. Is, is it a case where he just was never wanted to step out from behind the name Tony? Yeah, Allen, like, putting out Seventh Star under you know the Black Sabbath banner all over again. Right, like if he did that, like Carl Sanders put out like his Egyptian thing on just under his name, that would mm -hmm. make sense. If you were a whole lot more prolific, well, he did mm -hmm. that magma magma thing. That wasn't that they attached that to a, a Morbid Angel CD. It's like him just riffing on solos and stuff. Oh yeah, that that whole lava melt. Lava, lava, lava. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know what you're talking. Yeah, I mean that's just him experimenting. Like there's a side of him clearly, like his his solos. It's a lot of like it's just crazy improvisation and. Um, uh, and he, he's interested in that. And you see that, like, it's not like when you see them live, he's dialing in the solos exactly as he played them. Like it's, 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 it's pretty alive. And it, that is some element of what, what makes them a good live band. Um, but, uh, yeah, like I, the side project thing, it's, it's hard to say because like, it, like he's delivered. So like you pointed out, like he's delivered so little more of an angel that it isn't like, I'm not sensing like it's a cornucopia of, of like, 
of ideas that he has. Like he yeah. might be, mm -hmm. he might be tapped dry, but I could say like the kind of person he is. One thing I'm going to assume is to some extent he's going to want to innovate each album. And as terrible as Elude is, it's different. Like he's exploring shit he never explored before. And the new album, that level of like dissonance and sludge and multiple songs happening at the same time, like that to me still feels like innovation. It's innovating into material that is like not, you know, not to my taste, even, in, you know, in, in Kingdom's Disdain. But to me, it still seems like an artist exploring. And I imagine that's got to be some of the satisfaction for him is innovation and trying to do something new. And because um, like, you know, you said at the beginning, like, oh, he never made Alters again. Well, he never made Blessed of the Sick again. He never made Covenant again. Like he never mm -hmm. made any of those albums twice. Like none of like there there's there aren't there aren't two albums that similar in in that like I think in their in their whole catalog like I feel like symphonies and necroticism are more similar than any two albums in the Morbid Angel catalog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that that might be the one you know justification we were looking for earlier. That may be the one angle that did get you know um, you know Vincent to sell him on some of the weird ideas for Iliad. It's just like you know that yeah, this is going to be different we haven't tried this before right. uh, and you know he may have figured that was you know the angle to to get it worked like, into the band so like, that, that like, is a, that is a real possibility that's a, that's yeah, the first like, good trey explanation never, i've heard for that greg yeah like trey never before did you have you have you like in one gulp had an entire shit shake <laughs> what if you what, what if instead of just licking the you know the, the, the turd yes just sniffing it instead of actually licking it yeah so uh, i'm just bit. gonna be hopeful there's just too much good music and the fact that like one thing to say about this band like in their core catalog my my favorite albums are the fourth album the 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 sixth album and then the first album like that, there are many bands. Like usually, it's like oh, the two Diano albums with Iron Maiden, which is of course the answer and the only answer any reasonable person could ever have. Yeah. And um, like so, like the, the 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 fact that it's like album album four and six are warring for number one, and then you know, and then the first mm -hmm. album, like that's that's commendable. And that's why <laughs> I won't count them out. But uh, yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to be really optimistic. But when I get the new album, like. You know, I'll, I I I will I will look forward to it. And as long as he puts out albums, I'm going to get them. I so I got I got to be with you and and hold out hope, Craig. But I'm looking back in hindsight on their catalog, and it's the first four albums where they're he's in a cohesive unit band where the band is a band. You got Richard Brunel, Richard Brunel leaves. You got Eric Rutan. You've got good songwriters and guitar players helping you nurture these songs along is the best results for morbid angel where you know there's like a revolving door of artists that are coming in and out of the band where it's just trey held to his own he's got great ideas he's an artist i'm not going to say that he's not because he's a very talented guy is he a good songwriter at the end of the day the, the jury is out on that the jury's out for me. I, I think, I think he needs help. And some of the best songwriters need a little help. They just do. And that's fine. And I'm not saying it as a negative thing. I'm just saying I'm looking at the last half of their catalog and I'm seeing a pattern and it's not a great pattern. Yeah. It's not yeah. a good pattern. A lot of great ideas, a lot of creativity, but not great albums. They're just, yeah. Not. Well, the, the filter is always with tons of artists. It's like, like how much are you filtering? And I mean, you, you know, you guys pointed it out like uh, David Vincent was a producer. So even if it even if it isn't his name top, like he is like those first four albums where he's there, like there's a member of the band who clearly just thinks in that way of bringing up of, of like the macro of like these sounds and how this works. And that's something that like you won't really know if like, you know, they're doing the transition in. A chapel of ghouls or you know or, or blasphemy or one of these things like oh we should circle back that riff is really good and even if the credit is elsewhere um uh like you yeah it's impossible to know exactly how much the synergy of the band is there though you do get a little bit of clue like roger glover in uh in deep purple and rainbow is sort of this is like he's the basis but he's also like producing these things and you get a sense that there's a member of the band um 
who might just have like a little bit more stand back, look at how things are coming together sonically and arrangements rather than like, oh, let me get my songs through or I want to do this cool thing with the bass or the drums or something where someone is looking at it that way. And David Vincent might have really been that guy in those first albums in a way that we don't really know, even though they're bringing in other producers with Fleming Rasmussen and, and uh, that, that Kennedy guy. Um, that he might have still, even when they're just shaping the songs in rehearsals, see that in a different way. Because yeah. yeah, like what you're saying, like in terms of riff writer, songwriter, and shaping it, like yeah, I mean, I, I listen to these albums, and you know, and particularly Kingdoms and Heretic, I'm like, yeah, there's a way to maximize that material that they're not maximizing. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they lost the producer in their band, and they haven't been great since Annihilations or Gateways. They just haven't been great since Gateways. They just haven't been. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're all in agreement there. And that's not, and that's not, you know, a shitty thing to say. It's real. <laughs> and I want them to be better because they have a great sound, a great guitar player, unique voice and playing guitar, unique approach. And I don't know. Yeah, I, some, I don't some know. Some of that too. I mean, it, it sounds bad saying they haven't been good since Gateways, but at the same time, there hasn't been a ton of stuff since gateways which in this case plays in their favor so it's not right. like they've been it's not like they've put out you know those six shitty albums yet right. you know that it's craig mentioned like yet post tome of souls creator it's not like there's an mm -hmm. ocean of stuff i don't want to hear yeah. yeah there's not and yeah and uh yeah to make <clears throat> to be clear you know their legacy is undeniable they've got you know one of the best discographies of any death metal band out there even with you know Iliud stinking things up you know a little bit um, and so, yeah, in a way, again, there's a man of war parallel for me though, too, e even though they haven't done a lot, you know, in the past couple of decades, and even though they have one album that I genuinely, genuinely hate in each case, they have a ton of albums that are great. And yeah, they're, you know, still at the top. If you're looking at, you know, just best bands of all time in their genres, they're both way, way up there. It's just that those two bands aren't doing anything new, uh, anymore, that's you new know, kind of kept them you know, at the front of things. Um, sure. But yeah, there's never nothing that doesn't take away from what they've done over the years. Their, their legacies are impeccable for both of those bands. And uh, gore metal that is, I just typed on here. It's a great idea. I will get patches going. That's a great idea. They're cheap and <coughs> um, would be cool. Uh, we have new shirt designs coming to uh, drawn by uh, Mark Riddick, which are killer. I just haven't had time. Hopefully, after next week, I'll start to have a little more time. So, good deal. Coming okay, soon. so on to letter L. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have, have to wait. We'll have to on reconvene that. on that one at a later date. But uh, we made it through. Does anybody have anything to add at the end to this? I mean, I think we uh, kind of say thanks to Craig for uh, for joining us. Uh, as always, always a pleasure. <laughs> knowledge, you know, is encyclopedic and very detailed. Very uh, great to <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, to go thing you know through things you know bit by bit with you. Sorry that uh, yeah I haven't been able to contribute more tonight, but uh, it's been a ton of fun listening to you go through the albums and uh, chiming in where I've been able to. Yeah, I, uh, I I you know I have a great a great time on here. This is when when we talked about you know bands uh, very early on that I wanted to do. Yeah, the, I mean ideally I want to deal with my favorite bands, and um, there's just a lot to say about this band. They're really interesting and uh, obviously I'm a fan of your show and uh, we, you know, look forward to getting into this. <laughs> Although it might seem ridiculous that I'm surprised it went like this many hours with how many albums there are. <laughs> it probably was just like an hour of us ripping on Illid that just... <laughs> we, 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 we did kind of shipwreck there for a while, but I think we all needed to get that out of our system. Yeah, there had to be a lot of hostility uh, you know, toward, towards that album, but uh, mm -hmm. you, know, thank, you know, thank you, thank you for having, having me on and uh, I, I enjoyed it. We... Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> we will, uh, you know, do, I, I plan on coming again, uh, onto your show. I know, uh, Marty and Marty, you and I, and, and Kellen are going to be doing the mega, megaton sword, megaton sword, the new album on, uh, April 25th. I believe it's a Tuesday. And a Tuesday. Uh, yep. yeah, I, I think so. So th thanks for having me. I've not eaten in, uh, I, I think it is now, uh, 21 hours. So I'm pretty hungry. 
and uh, we'd love to go have some food. Well, everybody, we we will get uh, Mr. Zoller back on again. We'll we'll get him on more frequently here and there when he's available and we have something that he wants to uh, uh, chew on. But um, yeah, yeah, I enjoyed the comments. I learned stuff from you know stuff that that popped up there, and I'll probably check out the show piecemeal just to see that because I'm. I'm a bad multitasker, so and I don't actually even have the comments coming up on my screen because I just don't want to be distracted by that stuff. So I miss some of that stuff. It's interesting to see, uh, but but I appreciate the comments. And this is yeah, a, you know, a, like if you're into death metal, chances are high you rank this band really really highly, and that that they're 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 important to you. And I think with good reason. I think this is uh, like their the you know the, the artistic uh, products of this band are. Are, are some of the best that's been put out in death metal and in music period. Yep. Um, yeah. So really, really enjoyed uh, going through this with you guys and, you know, some, some similar opinions though, the tops um, I wasn't expecting someone else to have domination and gateways, but I was glad that you both enjoyed those albums because oh, yeah. they've, you know, mm -hmm. get, gateways, it seems to have like gotten caught on with, with people. Like I, like I was at a metal show the other day and saw someone wearing that shirt. I'm like, you know, it's great. Um, but domination was divisive in its day, and it, I'm, I'm yeah. glad that people just kind of accept the different um, the different things that are happening in that one. So that that was cool. But uh, thank you very much for having me. I I, uh, I had a great time. Anytime, and people, time. please go check out uh, on Netflix right now. Um, Dragged Across Concrete, uh, Mr. Zoller's third full length uh, movie is on there for you to stream. Go check that out. It's got features um, Vince Vaughn and Mel Gibson. Uh, Don Johnson, a whole bunch of other people. Great video, great video, great show. Check that out. He's got a bunch of books on. Go look him up on. Look up uh, the author's name on Amazon and start buying shit. He's a very prolific writer, creator. We love him to death. He's been a friend of mine since I met him back in '98. I want to say '99, maybe. Um, and everybody in the chat that has contributed, a coming to the show every friday is and being such a vibrant part of the chat we really appreciate it all of you that uh threw down cash this week for super chats again we appreciate it thank you so much yeah that was really cool of y'all uh monday melanie has a review coming out i can't remember what the band is i have to edit that on sunday wednesday the 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 heavy metallurgy album club will be talking about the second ring of power by unholy huh. next friday oh. we don't have a plan not we'll yet figure, we'll figure it out yeah but we, uh, we've had the calendar booked up for like two two and a half months straight and so now we've uh yeah we finally have hit some open water and uh so we'll just have to start filling the calendar back up and the next time we get Zoller on, we will have a and A. I know there's a lot of you that want to ask him questions. We fuck up. We we have a lot to say. We talk. We get going on hours later. Yeah. It's like, um, yeah. Well, yeah. We'll, we'll we'll dedicate that at at some point, but probably not. Whatever, five hours, twenty minutes into our morbid angel discovery. <laughs> yeah. Next time. Yeah, that's a good point. Mark. That's, we'll just do a dedicated Q and A and like what's spinning kind yeah. of evening something. Yeah. I'm gonna like, say that. that like I, I think your your vitriol towards Illude, I think that that had a there was a healing process for you because you seem a little bit healthier now than you do at the beginning, and I've got to think it's because your body temperature was raised and the metabolism of your cells sped. Um, the by oxygen kind of worked through a little faster as you hyperventilated. I remember getting this record and listening to it a bunch and thinking it's not really that bad. I'm just going to keep listening to it. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. And it doesn't, it doesn't. Denial is the first phase you have to get. And then listening to it again this week, it reminds me of how stupid. And these are all older men at this point, <laughs> all older creative men. They should fucking know better. <coughs> they know the metal community. They're, they're pandering to does not put up with this. Let's, bullshit. let's, end, more, let's end more positively than, than speaking of that. <laughs> Bow down before the master. <laughs> oh, the turmoil. The turmoil. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, everybody, y'all rule. S. Craig Zoller, we love you. It's so good to have you on. We'll have you on again very soon, I hope. And um, that's it. Alan, do you have anything to say before we close? <coughs> I Indeed. sound like the first. I sound like paranoid. Uh, I'm bounce no, the I sound like sweet leaf. I need to eat. <laughs> right on, Let's everybody. Cheers. Food. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. Adios, guys.